Welcome to Data Engineering with Python and AWS Lambda Live Lesson. My name is Noah Gift and I'll be your instructor for this course along with Robert and Kennedy. I'm a machine learning instructor at Northwestern, UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and USF, and I've held business roles including CTO, general manager, and chief architect. I'm the founder of Pragmatic AI Labs and I consult with startups on machine learning, AI, and cloud architecture. I'm also a Python Software Foundation Fellow, a subject matter expert for AWS on machine learning, and a cloud ambassador. I work closely with Google Education, and I'm a part of the Google Cloud Architect Certified Community. I also wrote Pragmatic AI, an introduction to cloud-based machine learning, and many technical articles and videos from Pearson. My name is Kennedy Behrman, and I am a consultant specializing in architecting and implementing cloud solutions for early stage startups. Uh, I have a background in engineering, data science, AWS, and G Cloud solutions, as well as acting as an O'Reilly author and instructor for Pearson. Hi, my name is Robert Jordan. I'm a systems architect specializing in infrastructure as code and solutions for entertainment and media companies for the last 20 years. Currently, I hold certifications from AWS and GCP. Let's get started. In lesson one, we get started with AWS Lambda. This includes creating an AWS Lambda function, learning basic Lambda patterns, learning Lambda management console, and then finally uploading external code to AWS Lambda. In lesson two, we use Cloud9 to develop Python Lambda functions. This includes setting up Cloud9, developing with Cloud9, launching Cloud9 and workspace configuration, importing Lambda functions, invoking Lambda functions, and invoking those same Lambda functions inside of API Gateway, and then finally deploying those Lambda functions. In lesson three, we cover creating timed Lambda functions. This includes AWS Lambda with CloudWatch events, using Lambda to populate AWS SQS, using CloudWatch logging with AWS. In lesson four, we create event-driven Lambdas. We create a producer Lambda function, we enable SQS triggers, we also have serverless data engineering architecture explained. In lesson five, we cover learning SAM local. This includes SAM local inside of a function and also SAM local with packaging and deployment and then SAM local with IAM and also environmental variables. In lesson six, we cover how to use AWS Glue. This includes what is AWS Glue and also how to use it in the context of a data engineering project. In lesson seven, we create state machines with step functions. We learn step functions, then we cover the state language. We also do a demo of step functions. In lesson eight, we cover step functions with AWS services. This includes how to integrate those step functions with AWS products, how to use DynamoDB with step functions, how to use AWS ECS Fargate with step functions, and then finally, how to use an AWS callback pattern. In lesson nine, we cover serverless relational databases. This is uh, how to use AWS Aurora serverless, how to use a data API for Aurora serverless, how to actually use stored procedures to invoke a Lambda inside of Aurora. In lesson 10, we cover how to build an API using API Gateway. This includes using API Gateway, integrating Lambda and API Gateway best practices. In lesson 11, we cover how to authenticate APIs with AWS Cognito. We begin with Cognito authentication, we cover Cognito user pools, and we also talk about Cognito authentication with API Gateway and federated identity. In lesson 12, we use serverless data stores. This includes DynamoDB for data engineering, using Amazon Athena for data engineering, using Amazon EMR for data engineering, using Amazon EFS for data engineering. In lesson 13, we create serverless business intelligence and AutoML learning solutions. This includes Amazon QuickSight, Lambda with AI APIs, integrating Lambda with SageMaker. In lesson 14, we create serverless data streaming. This includes Kinesis streams and also computer vision streams. In lesson 15, we cover case studies. This includes comparing AWS Lambda with Google Cloud Functions, using GCP Cloud Functions with PubSub and Cloud Scheduler, using the Chalice Framework, 
pushing versus pulling architecture, the principles of DevOps, the principles of cloud computing, a summary of serverless computing, managing packages in AWS Lambda, and finally, multi-cloud solutions. In lesson 16, we cover the course summary, and we go over in detail how all of these lessons tie together. All right, I'm glad we're ready to start creating a console uh, Lambda function. To do that, we'll first go through and uh, type in Lambda, and that brings us this option of run code without thinking about servers. The Lambda console comes forward, and you can see from the left here, there's a dashboard, there's applications, there's functions, and there's layers. And really, the takeaway here is that you can decide what level of abstraction you want to do. To just get started, it's best to start with functions because you can just create a Lambda function and experiment with it without having to get into like a layer or an application or something more involved. So we're going to create this function here. Uh, and once I click that create function, there's a few different options. So one, I can uh, basically start from scratch and build a Lambda function. Option two is I could go through here and I could use a blueprint. Let's go ahead and look at that real quick. So if I go to blueprint, you can see that it actually toggles by the runtime. So that's one way to do it. So if, let's say I want to look at all Python 3.7 blueprints. You can see there's options here where I can uh, piggyback on some source code that someone else wrote, like getting an object from S3 uh, or uh, DynamoDB process a stream, um, you know, do a microservice or have a CloudWatch alarm to Slack. So we have actually some examples here that are great that really bootstrap you and let you get started with creating Lambdas. Uh, another thing that's interesting is you can also browse the serverless app repository. And if you go through here and you look at some of these options, they're much more sophisticated. So, you know, have an Alexa skill or um, go through and do something with uh, MySQL. And these are community uh, projects and you can look through those community projects, deploy that project. And that's also a great way to learn the Lambda ecosystem. We're gonna again go back to author from scratch. And if I scroll through here, I can say hello world, say hello world. And now I have the option of choosing which runtime. The Lambda runtime supports many different languages. Here's an example, this is Node uh, version 10, uh, or Python 3.7, uh, Java 8, uh, Go, also .NET. Uh, these are all options to do Lambda functions. We're gonna choose Python 3.7. Uh, and then the only other thing you'd need to do is choose or create an execution role. We're not going to do anything with permissions, so I'm going to leave that alone. Go ahead and create a function. And now to go through and say hello world and build something very trivial, uh, it'll open us up into the console, and that's actually a full development environment that allows us to write Python code that is executed in the Lambda environment. So here we go. I'm ready to begin. And what's been created for me is a layer. Uh, in, inside there's a hello world function and also there's a uh, CloudWatch logs interface. And this allows me to look at my logs in real time. So I'm gonna scroll down here to where the function code is uh, sorted. And I can actually say edit code in line. And I can also toggle the runtime here. Uh, so I'm gonna go through here and edit this uh, template that they gave me. So you can see at the very beginning, the JSON library is imported. JSON is used for processing uh, JSON data structures. In this example, if I wanted to add something, I could uh, replace this with a string that does something uh, useful in Python. So I'm gonna say, um, let's go ahead and print uh, an F string here that says, this is my hello. And then I can actually capture the event that's processed. Uh, all Lambda function, this is important to know, have both an event and a context. The context is metadata about where that, that Lambda function was executed, so that's a great way to inspect that. And the event is whoever has called that Lambda function, they'll pass in an event. So depending on what the service is, if it's, let's say, SQS or SNS or uh, some other um, service in AWS, that event will be, the payload will be a little different. In the case of the console like this, it, it's whatever event we decide, and we're gonna basically give it a really simple payload, which is a JSON payload, uh, and that, payload is actually gonna be printed out when we call the Lambda function. So uh, here we go, you can see there's a, a print statement. 
uh, I'm going to say save, and then that actually saves my Lambda inside of AWS. Next, I'm going to select test, and if I click test here, uh, I can go through and I can say, um, here's my hello test uh, payload, and you can see they give you some key values to play around with. I'm going to change this and say uh, hello, and then I'm going to say wor world here for the payload, and then I can get rid of those other keys. I don't need them. And so now you can see that I have a uh, very basic JSON data structure that has hello uh, as a key and world as a value. And if I save that, now I can reuse that test payload over and over again. So uh, again, this is where the event is going to get uh, put into my function, and then it's going to print out the statement. If I click on test, uh, it then goes through and it calls my Lambda function, and I can look at the execution results. So you can see that the response that was returned back was what we expect. It's a status code of 200. And then in the logs, you can see that uh, this is my uh, print statement, and actually it was able to capture that event and actually print that out. And what's really powerful about this Hello World concept, and again, this is really the, the piece of work we did, it's one line, is I can also scroll and look at my log files. So if I click on this icon here, uh, I can go into Amazon uh, CloudWatch logs, uh, and actually it will allow me to view all of those different uh, payloads as well. So I'm going to go to monitoring, view in CloudWatch logs, and then that same print statement that showed up in the console, it now shows up in the CloudWatch logs, and I can verify that, yes, here's my Lambda function, and I'm able to actually print out a Hello World. Let's go into the Lambda console and look at some patterns that are available when you start writing Lambda functions. So we go through here and we uh, create a function again, and we say author from scratch. Uh, and I uh, say, uh, we'll call this one hello patterns. And I will select the runtime to be Python 3.7. And I'll again, we'll, won't set up any execution role yet. Uh, what happens, again, when you first create this Lambda uh, function here is that in addition to editing the source code, another thing that you'll want to look at is how do you want this Lambda to be called? Uh, one way is that you can call a Lambda function by uh, calling it inside of the console itself and just testing it. You also could have Python code via, let's say, the Bodo SDK call a Lambda function. Or what's more common is that you'll actually have a pattern where you have an event-based Lambda. And really, this is the future of serverless engineering and why it's so powerful is that in the old days, what you would do is you would uh, go through and have a web server, and the web server would be running, and a, a user would request something, and, and it, would, it would return back the results because the server is always running. In the case of a Lambda, uh, the servers aren't running. They only respond to an event when you, you ask it to respond to an event. And so a trigger uh, could be, if we go through here, an API gateway, so that could be a web service. And again, uh, the, the instance behind the scenes would wake up when you needed it to serve out a, a, a web-based request. Uh, also, you could do the same thing with an IoT device as well. You could have a trigger here where you have a, um, uh, let's say, uh, a Raspberry Pi or some kind of a, uh, a small edge-based device and it sends a payload and that wakes up a Lambda. Alexa, you could also have Alexa set up where you ask Alexa to do something and then it goes through and it calls a Lambda behind the scenes. Uh, application load balancing is another example. CloudFront, so you could hook up uh, your, your CDN to Lambda functions. Uh, CloudWatch events, we're going to get into this later, but this is a really powerful way to schedule Lambdas to run. So again, instead of having a server that's constantly running, you're paying for it. Uh, what will happen is uh, if you set up, let's say, a daily uh, event, it'll trigger the Lambda to do something, it does its work, and then it goes back to sleep again. So this is a very uh, you know, powerful pattern for data engineering. Also logs, so you can respond to logging events. Uh, code commit, so you can go through and actually uh, trigger a Lambda when you've actually committed some code to a repository, just like uh, often you'll do with GitHub where you'll have a, an event where you write a payload to a Git repository, and then that'll fire off an event. You also have Cognito Sync Trigger, so you could, uh, using their authentication system, also trigger Lambdas. Uh, DynamoDB, 
So with DynamoDB, you can go through and uh, respond to events that are persistent in the database by firing off a lambda. Let's say you want to aggregate and do some kind of a, a descriptive statistic uh, every time a new bit of information was in a certain table. Well, you could do that with DynamoDB and a lambda. Kinesis, which manages streams, you can go through and schedule an event where uh, when new data is put into a, a streaming pipeline, the Lambda will be triggered and it'll filter that data uh, on the fly. And so that's a really powerful pattern as well where uh, you don't manage the infrastructure for streaming, you just wait for something to appear, and then when it does appear, the Lambda will then be triggered and it'll process that stream. Uh, S3 is probably one of the more common and powerful event-based approaches to Lambda as well. Uh, a really good example is you could put a file, let's say an image file in S3, you could tell a Lambda function to listen to that bucket, and as soon as an image is placed in that bucket, the Lambda would fire it, let's say it could reprocess uh, and make the image a smaller image, or maybe you could um, change a color scheme on the image, or transform it in some way, or do some kind of machine learning operation. Those are all event-based operations, again, that in the old days you would have a server running and it would be very expensive to you know, constantly be you know, using those resources, but in the case of Lambda, you don't do anything until someone puts that event into your bucket. Uh, SNS is also a great uh, pattern to use with uh, Lambda, and what happens is that you send a simple uh, notification service message uh, and Lambda can be fired off. And, so again, with SNS, what you can do is you can create a massively parallel pipeline where you can have thousands of simultaneous messages that populate through. Uh, with SQS, we're going to go through a, a really powerful pattern there. Uh, SQS is a queue service that is basically infinitely scalable, so you, you cannot send more information than it can accept, or theoretically infinite. And you can have a Lambda function waiting uh, on that queue, doing nothing, asleep, you're not getting charged for it, and as soon as a message comes in, the Lambda then gets fired, pulls the messages off of the queue, and then processes things. So really, this is the big, uh, powerful thing that Lambda does, is it, is it, it can be triggered to respond to an event. Uh, finally, a newer service as well is um, EventBridge, and there's some examples where you could wire into uh, analytics monitoring like Datadog, or a login service, or PagerDuty, or Segment. There's all these other third-party uh, systems that also can wire in via this uh, uh, event bridge as well. So th the serverless ecosystem has many different patterns uh, and many different approaches to it, but probably the most predominant pattern is this trigger-based pattern where it responds to an event. Let's go through and look at some of the key features of the Lambda console. Uh, if we go back to Hello World, uh, there's a few things to point out. Uh, first, there's a configuration menu. And what the configuration menu does is it allows you to decide what the inputs and the outputs are that are associated with your Lambda function. So in this case, we can see the Hello World is in the middle, and there are no triggers associated. And every time this Lambda function is called, uh, it can actually go and uh, send its messages to CloudWatch logs. So that's the output. Uh, if I wanted to add a trigger, though, what I could do is I could select a trigger, let's say uh, CloudWatch events. Uh, here we go. And uh, that could go through and, let's say, run this function at you know some interval like this. And once I set up that uh, trigger, now I've actually, I have a, a um, trigger associated as well. So basically, uh, I have the output here, I have the lambda function, and I have the input. And again, you can have many triggers. So you can have one trigger would be a time, uh, another trigger would be some kind of service, uh, another uh, trigger could be an API. So it's, let's say conceivably you could have, let's say, three triggers uh, to a lambda function. That could be you know pretty straightforward. Another thing to be aware of as well is uh, you can scroll through here and look at this monitoring section. Uh, and it will show you all of the different invocations that have occurred. So this is a great dashboard. It's almost like the dashboard on your car where you would have the, sp the speed and maybe how much oil you have and how much gas you have. You can see that I can tell how many times it's been invoked. It's only been invoked one time so far. I can see what the duration uh, was, and this shows up in um, uh, milliseconds. Uh, here we go. I can, I can see that it's a very short 
uh, duration. Uh, and also, I can see the error or success. There's only been one, and it's, it's got a success rate of 100%. Uh, and I can toggle through here as well to see different time intervals. So this is a great way to look through here and see what's happening with your lambda function. And really, the error count and success rate percentage is, is probably one of the first areas to look at if you're going to have, you know, if you have some kind of a problem with execution, that's one area. Also, duration could be one as well. So you, let's say you have a lambda function and um, it actually exceeds the timeout. You'll, you'll see that it'll be very long uh, and you can see all the lambda functions are, you know, basically exceeding that uh, default 200 millisecond timeout. Uh, there's a, a few other ones as well. You can see, for example, if your lamb doesn't have been throttled, if you have set up some kind of concurrency throttling as well. So uh, the monitoring section, again, is a great way to, um, you know, go through and, and look at uh, really the visibility of what's happening in your lambda function. Another thing to be aware of in terms of this console is that if you go back here to uh, the configuration uh, section, is that you also can, can edit uh, the source code, again, by clicking on this lambda. And then you can always edit it. And it's got a reasonably sophisticated IDE. We're going to go through actually a, a more comprehensive one in a bit. But it, it is worth pointing out that you, you, it will do syntax highlighting. And you have the ability to edit your source code in line. Uh, another thing that you can do with this as well is you can set up uh, more configuration about your application. So here's an example of if I wanted to set up environmental variables, let's say uh, the environmental variables could be uh, what environment I'm in, for example, let's say the, the production environment or the staging environment, or you know maybe some kind of metadata about my project, it would live inside of here. Uh, I also can tag it, and I could say uh, for cost uh, purposes, I could have the data science uh, lambdas, I could have the data engineering lambdas, and I could have the, the sales or marketing lambdas, and, and this is a good practice to get into. Uh, and then in terms of execution role, this is the part that is really important to be aware of is that if your Lambda needs to talk to another resource, let's say it's DynamoDB or it's uh, uh, S3, something like that, you're going to need to specifically uh, add a role. So you're going to need to go through and uh, add inside of the IAM uh, policy that you want this Lambda to be able to access a particular resource. Uh, and so this is a common problem point for people getting used to Lambda is that they forget that they have to add the ability for that Lambda function to talk to some service that they're uh, associated with. Uh, a second uh, item to be aware of is this basic settings section here. So uh, by default, you get a timeout of three seconds, and it's really easy to um, exceed that if you have a more complicated Lambda. And so this might be something where you toggle through and you decide that maybe you want to have a 10-second timeout instead. Now, keep in mind that lambdas, they're, they're, they work the best when they're uh, really short. And so if you're doing something where it starts to get, you know, let's say 30 seconds or it starts to get into a longer time period, you know, maybe there's a different approach other than just lambda that you could think about like AWS batch or, you know, some other kind of long range uh, process. Um, if I go to memory as well, it has a very small amount of memory, but I can toggle and add more memory to my Lambda. Let's say I'm doing you know, image processing or something like that, and I, and I get out of memory uh, sections. Uh, I can actually go through here and toggle that up. And then you would probably want to go through and, and add like, you know, um, high memory, you know, g whatever, whatever it is you want to add for your custom uh, settings here, and then they'll remember those settings on every execution. Another thing to be aware of inside of the console is this network section. So by default, uh, you won't have a VPC. And depending on what you're doing, you, maybe you don't ever need to talk to the VPC because you can handle it all as, let's say, API requests. But if you are doing something more complicated, like talking to a relational database, you're going to have to hook it up to a VPC. And that does uh, definitely increase the complexity uh, of your Lambda function because you're going to have to make sure you have the right subnet you're going to have to make sure you've set up the right security group so you can talk to that uh, AWS resource. So in general, you know, it's, it's probably easier to not use VPCs, but you do have that option, and you, and you would have to configure that, though, uh, through the console. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Lambdas are highly concurrent, so you can, by default, 
use uh, an unreserved uh, account uh, concurrency of a thousand, or you could reserve a very specific number. Let's say you want, you know, uh, some other uh, specific level of concurrency. You can actually set that right here. Uh, and then in terms of uh, auditing and compliance, those all show up in CloudWatch logs. So if if you go to um, Cloud, not only CloudWatch logs, but also CloudTrail itself, you can you can see who is actually executed each one of these Lambda functions. And again, that's all configured within the console. So that's really the, the highlight of the different aspects of this Lambda console. We also went through this earlier, but if you want to test things right here, this is the test mechanism. And it, from a nutshell, this is really the, the eyes and ears of how you initially would want to play around with the AWS console. And if you do even more sophisticated operations where you're using a cloud-based IDE, you still will want to go in here and make sure you tune things. So uh, be aware of all those services inside of the console. And uh, if you're able to uh, toggle those features, uh, you really will have full control over your development environment. Let's go into Lambda now and use a different approach to modify the source code. One of the more powerful features of Lambda is uh, the ability to upload a zip file that has all of your source code uh, incorporated and then deploy that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, by default here, start with a author from scratch template. I'll scroll, scroll through here and say, um, uh, hello add. I'm going to change the runtime to Python 3.7. I'm going to leave the permissions alone. And then I'm going to go through here and set up the basic scaffolding. So last time what I did is I went to the editor in line and wrote up a Lambda function. This time what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Visual Studio Code and a terminal to actually upload the source code. So if you see here again, uh, you can say edit code in line or you can say upload a zip from uh, your desktop or upload from Amazon S3. And what's really powerful about this is that in the case of, let's say, S3, you could have code pipeline uh, process your Lambda from, let's say, a commit that happened to GitHub. Uh, it could make sure that it passed unit tests. It could then go through and bundle that into S3 and then trigger a deployment process automatically. Or in the case of uh, local development, you could create a zip file here, uh, upload that zip file, and then uh, inside of the Lambda ecosystem, you can go through and test it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to select upload a zip file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to my development environment and, and go ahead and create one from scratch. Okay, now that we're inside of uh, a terminal, what I can do here is uh, I can go through and, and uh, create a, a basic Lambda function. So I can go and say touch. Uh, and then I can say uh, lambda function, like that. And now, once that's created, uh, I can go into Visual Studio Code here, and I can take a look at what I could build. So here we go. Here's a, uh, uh, some source code, but I'm going to go to uh, this lambda function code here. Uh, here we go. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paste in this logic. So what it does is it has the the right contract so the lambda function itself by default unless you change it uh, it needs to say lambda handler so that's really one requirement the file itself needs to be called lambda function again you can change this but just to make it easy if you keep those two things the same it'll be a lot simpler to upload your zip file and now uh, i add a doc string here that says add two numbers and then i accept a x payload and a y payload and I add in the X and Y together, and then I print out that the X was passed in, the Y that was passed in, and then also the X and Y value that's summed together. And then uh, I go through here and I return back that total. So really simple function that just adds two numbers together, but also logs each step along the way. So now that that's created and it's called Lambda function, I can go back to my terminal here uh, and I can uh, prepare this for uh, deployment. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to run a zip operation. So if I do uh, zip here, you can see I can zip lambda function uh, dot py and then and create a, a 
basically a bundle here. Uh, there we go. That's been uh, created. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to CP that Lambda function to my desktop so that uh, I can easily find it when I upload it from the console. So we'll go to desktop and I will take that Lambda function zip and put it there. CP, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll, we'll CP this Lambda function to Lambda function desktop. There we go. Okay, now that that's been created, I'm gonna go back to my console. Now that I've got that console uh, ready to go, I can go to upload zip, and I will click this button, function package upload. Notice that the file has to be 10 megabytes or smaller, or you can use S3 and you can load a larger Lambda. Uh, I'll go ahead and say upload. Uh, I see now Lambda function zip is there, it's waiting for me. Uh, once that's actually been selected, I say save, and this is all I need to do to actually load in this Lambda function inside of my editor. Now that it's there, you can see again, this is the same code we had earlier. Uh, I can create a test function to test this out. So I go through here and I say, um, we'll say add hello. Uh, I can go and I know it needs to take an X and it needs to take a Y. And we'll make that uh, a one and we'll make that a two. We'll, th these are important to make sure that they're um, integers because our code is expecting an integer. So we'll make that uh, two. There we go. And now if I save this, I can say test, look at the output, and the output should say that the response is return three. So really this is, and also the, the log message here as well. A uh, total of X1 and X2 is three. So this is really the power of the next level up uh, of development with Lambdas, not just you know, toying around with, uh, a, you know, maybe like a hello world function, but actually going through and giving it packages that can be part of a continuous delivery process. And really DevOps has uh, made a lot of strides in terms of uh, its adoption in companies and a core principle of DevOps is microservices. And when you're building a microservice and you're using the DevOps approach, it should be built from a continuous uh, deployment pipeline. So really way, the way that would work is that uh, the continuous deployment pipeline would compress this file together, you know, um, take it, put it directly into the Lambda ecosystem and then uh, register it with some kind of event, again, that you could trigger uh, on the left here as well. So really that's the power of the Lambda ecosystem is not just you know, playing around with it in the console, but also bundling together a package. Uh, another follow-up step, which we won't do right now, is you also could add in third-party libraries as well, package all those third-party libraries inside of the zip file, and then you have a complete, um, you know, repeatable process to deploy your package. One of the really powerful new features of AWS is something called Cloud9. And if you search for Cloud9 on the console, uh, it'll actually give you the ability to select it. And then uh, what you can do is you can open up a new development environment uh, in, in Cloud9. So what we're gonna do uh, is we're gonna create a new environment. So what is this and why do I care about it for serverless? Well. One of the really powerful things about a cloud-based development environment is that it solves many problems that typically come up. So one of them is you need to have proper access via API keys when you're developing locally. And often that can be a huge vulnerability in terms of security. So if you accidentally check in your source code, into your source code, your API keys, you can get your uh, account compromised. Uh, likewise, it's also you know, very um, trouble prone to go back and forth between your local environment and the cloud. Maybe you have to copy files back and forth, but in, in the cloud environment, uh, such as Cloud9, you're automatically in the environment that you're going to be deploying against. So when you're copying data back and forth between different nodes in AWS, the copies are very qu quick. Likewise, if you test a service, it's also uh, from somewhere inside of AWS instead of your own laptop. So it solves a really particular problem and uh, it, it appears that the future is really gonna involve these cloud-based development environments, especially for things like serverless. So that's really the, the main takeaway here. So 
we're going to go through and create a Cloud9 based uh, environment. Uh, I'm going to say uh, hello Cloud9. And then uh, a lot of times it's a good idea to uh, put some kind of descriptive information for other people on your team. So we can say this is a sandbox. Uh, and now when I go to the next step, it gives me a few options here that we'll discuss. So one of them is that uh, you can either select an existing server. Let's say you have, um, let's say a Kubernetes server running and there's a particular instance that you want to connect to there. You could reuse that. Likewise, you can create a new instance. And I think this is probably the typical way to, to get started is create a new instance. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, and then in terms of instance type, you have uh, a micro instance, which is uh, one gig of RAM and one CPU. Uh, you also can choose between, let's say, an M4 large would be a couple CPUs and eight gigs of RAM, uh, or also you can you can select um, uh, you know maybe really large instances like uh, you know in the case of this one, um, 32 gigs of RAM, or you know even a larger you can have a 40 you know virtual CPU instance with 160 gigs of RAM. So you have actually a lot of choices here to use in terms of you know the task you're you're selecting. Uh, in our case, we're going to just select uh, micro. We'll, we'll use the free tier. Uh, and then the other thing to discuss is that you have two different platforms you can choose from. So you have Amazon Linux, which is I, my recommendation for most uh, things you're going to do. It's probably a good idea to uh, use the operating system that all, everything else in AWS is going to run on. Uh, but another option as well is Ubuntu. And Ubuntu server, you can select this. And, and you could also provision a, an Ubuntu environment as well. So this is actually a really powerful feature that uh, really takes away this, this problem of, you know, needing to provision servers with EC2 or, you know, pick which, you know, um, configuration you want. There's a, a very simple dialogue here that allows us to get a cloud-based development environment. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the cost-saving settings. And this might be the killer feature of the Cloud9 development environment is that automatically after 30 minutes, it'll stop. And so you don't have to worry about getting charged with really expensive um, configurations, uh, you know, or, you know, spinning something up and forgetting about it. It's designed for you to, as a developer, develop on it, and then it'll automatically uh, shut down afterwards. So uh, you can change that if you wanted to, and you could say, you know, maybe only shut down after four hours. But in my experience, this setting has never really uh, had a problem, and it takes you know, let's say 30 seconds to wake it back up again. So I think this is a great default setting. Uh, additionally, you could go through here and um, configure roles for Cloud9, and you could configure specifically what kind of environment you'd like Cloud9 to have access to. And then also you can change what VPC. In, in my case, I'm going to leave all these default uh, because I don't need to configure those. And then the next step is uh, once you've done that, uh, you're, you're able to actually go through, get a uh, preview section here, uh, and then it'll allow you to create the environment. And now I'm provisioning uh, an instance that I can use and um, develop with. Now that we've provisioned this environment, uh, it gives us a JavaScript-based IDE. Uh, so again, what's so powerful about this is that I have access to all of the AWS um, APIs and command line tools. So if I go to this terminal that's built in here uh, and I type in AWS uh, S3 LS, I don't have to give it API keys. I don't have to change anything. I immediately get access to uh, control S3 and let's say copy data from S3 to my local Cloud9 environment. So from a development standpoint, this is incredible. Also, if you're doing data science or machine learning, this is an incredible environment as well because of the ability to copy data back and forth uh, very easily. Uh, another thing we can look at is the different configuration options of this environment. So when you're first starting out, one thing to be aware of is to you know, make sure you understand what version of Python you're using. So if we type in Python 3, and I type in version, you can see it already has a very new version of Python. In this case, it's Python 3.6.8. Uh, I also can go through here and look at this um, different file browser here. And on the left, you can see it says Hello Cloud 9. And, and if I type in print working um, directory, you can see that uh, this is my path. And it's actually in a directory called environment. 
and if I do an LS, this is basically the location. You can see the README there. Now, if I wanted to edit that README, uh, I could double click on it, and then right inside of here, it, it opens up a full IDE. So uh, I could type in, uh, you know, more information here. Uh, you know, I change this, uh, and again, it'll it'll completely understand um, different languages like Python, Bash, uh, JavaScript. Uh, so what we're going to do next here is uh, I'm going to go through and show you how to toggle the settings you know, in this gear icon here. So one of the things you may want to change immediately is if you go to Python support, uh, tell it that you want the default version to be Python 3. And this way, uh, when you're doing things like f-strings or using newer features of Python, uh, they'll actually automatically be uh, triggered uh, inside of the code editor. So now that that's done, uh, what I can do is I can close this, and I can actually uh, create a new Python file. So let's go through and uh, create a hello world. So I'll say hello. Now you can see it shows up on the left here. Uh, and from here, I can go in and I can write some basic Python. Um, and we'll call this hello. And you can see that it immediately goes through and recognizes when there's incorrect uh, syntax as well. So uh, I can get autocomplete. There we go. And, and now I also can run it right from inside of this uh, environment as well. There we go. And you can see that the process exited with um, uh, a zero status, so it was successful. Uh, additionally, what I can do is I can run that from inside my terminal as well. So I can say Python 3, hello. So again, you, you can see how powerful this is uh, from a, a prototyping standpoint. I have access to S3. Uh, I have access to the uh, all of the different SDKs, command line tools are all pre-installed for me. I can write Python code, uh, immediately uh, interact with things. Um, and another thing to be aware of as well is if something, uh, for example, like IPython isn't installed, uh, I also can do uh, an installation, say pip3, install IPython. There we go. Pip install IPython. Uh, and that would install it for um, Python 2, but if I want to, uh, if I want to install it for Python 3, what I could do is I could use a virtual environment setup. Uh, and so in order to do that, I can type virtual environment. So I say virtual env, uh, and then I type in um, the version of Python. So if we want to install something for our local version of Python 3, we can use the virtual environment command. Here it is, virtual env. Uh, and I can do dash p for the version of Python. I'll tell it Python 3, and then I'll, I'll create something called venv. Uh, it's able to uh, create that locally, and then if I want to source that virtual environment, I type in source venv bin activate, and that gives me access to my local virtual environment. To verify I'm in there, I can type in um, pip uh, or which pip, and it'll show me that that's actually located in my virtual environment. If I type in which Python, um, it'll also show me Python 2 is outside and Python 3 is inside of here. So uh, from here, I can do a pip install of, let's say, IPython. And now I also can get a full uh, interactive uh, interpreter inside of this environment as well. And this can come in really handy depending on what kind of operations you're, you're using. So if I type in IPython now, uh, that's in my Python 3.6 environment. And I can, let's say I want to find out how many CPUs uh, I have on this machine. I can type in import uh, multiprocessing. And then I can do multiprocessing dot CPU, CPU count. And you can see that this only has one um, uh, processor associated with it. So again, I have this uh, interactive environment as well. So that's really the the, the key features of just regular Python code. Uh, another thing you can do though, uh, you also can uh, look at these tabs here and there are more advanced features as well. So one advanced feature is that if you go to collaborate, you can actually create a pair programming environment. So you can invite uh, another programmer in your organization and you can together uh, share a screen and, uh, and write code together. So if you're uh, working on a Lambda function, for example, this could be an incredibly powerful environment to, uh, to use, and I've, I've used it, and it's a really great feature. Another thing is there's this Outline tab. If you click on Outline, there's a great way to just search for things. 
if you go to um, AWS resources here, what this does is it allows you to create Lambda functions locally or import Lambda functions like the Lambda function that we uh, created earlier, I can import it instead of here. Uh, to create it, you go to this Lambda icon, you can see here it says create new Lambda function. Finally, uh, in terms of a, a debugger, um, you also can set up breakpoints, you can walk through your stack, and finally also um, uh, install Lambdas locally, test those Lambdas locally, uh, and, and essentially you have a full serverless development environment. That's really the, the main takeaway for Cloud9. One final thing that I'll note as well is that you also can upload and download files locally and also have access to source control inside of your environment. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say file, and if I say upload local files, uh, I can actually click on this and it'll allow me uh, to uh, select a file off of my desktop. Uh, in this case, let's just say I want to grab uh, a Python script. I upload it uh, into my environment, and you can see I immediately uh, can, can go through here and start editing my uh, application. So a really incredible environment to get started with, and we've gone through all the main features. Uh, and the main thing I'd like to, to close with is that if you are doing serverless development, make sure you uh, go through and, and try out Cloud9 because I think what you'll find is that it is the, the best environment for developing serverless applications uh, for AWS. Now that we've got the initial Cloud9 environment configured, the next step is to show the true power of how it would work in developing a Lambda function or even working on an existing Lambda function. Uh, earlier we had gone through and we created a Hello World inside of the AWS console. What we can do now is import that Hello World function into our local development environment and then edit it. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to toggle this section on the right here where it says AWS resources. And you can see it says remote functions. If I uh, highlight that and I drop down the menu, uh, we can see all of these different remote Lambda functions that I can actually import. Uh, so if I go through here and, and I grab, let's say, hello add, which is one of the functions we created earlier, uh, I can double click on this, and what it will do is it'll import that into my local environment. Once that's done, it's very quick. Uh, you can see here that um, it puts this Lambda function right in my immediate development environment, and if I wanted to, I could make changes to it and modify it. So let's just let's say add um, you know, a, an additional comment to this doc string here. If I say adds to numbers uh, and returns um, uh, value, right? you can see I'm able to easily edit that. And now if I want to run it and verify that the code works, uh, the next thing that I would do is I would go through and invoke it. We'll do that in a second, but th the main takeaway here is that it, it's trivial to both um, create Lambda functions locally and import them. And so let me also show you how you could uh, create a Lambda function locally as well. So to do that, uh, what you would do is you would select this icon, uh, and if I say create a new Lambda function, uh, it'll then go through this wizard. So I can say um, uh, hello to, and it'll show us that it's gonna create that in the US East Region 1. And then again, I can go through and I can select from runtimes. I'll say Python 3.6 runtime here. Uh, and then I could choose anything I want here as a template. And the, and the real key um, item here is that you can decide what trigger. We've gone through this earlier. There's lots of different triggers. Uh, I'm going to say by default none. And then uh, here as well is where you would uh, provision a, a role that would give it access to some other resource. Since we're not triggering on anything else, we're just creating a, a simple function locally, uh, I can go through here and leave the defaults. Once you do that, then it'll populate uh, a local uh, environment here for us, and it'll create a virtual environment, so you can install packages, uh, and it'll, it'll create a, a basic scaffolding for us. And, and this is really uh, the power of this development environment, is it, is it creates the whole um, skeleton for us and allows us to easily go through and, and make modifications. So again, if I want to uh, go through here and add some change, uh, it's very simple. I can add some doc strings. This is a function. And, and now I have a full uh, development environment that uh, 
I can actually use to do Lambda development. And also, uh, I can actually uh, install packages locally as well. So that's really the power of both creating functions inside of Cloud9 and also importing existing functions so that you can work with your team and develop serverless applications. Now that we've gone through, we've set up Cloud9, we've imported lambdas that used to live in AWS and we want to develop them locally in our, our de development environment, we can actually um, start writing code against it. So step one is uh, you can just look over here at this panel uh, and make sure that you've selected the lambda that was imported. So this again was the lambda we imported earlier. Uh, if I look on the left here, uh, it'll match this file structure. So you can see there's a Lambda payloads JSON, uh, and this is actually a test payload, uh, and this is actually the Lambda function uh, that we imported. And this is a really, really important step here, is that this is actually the, a YAML file that describes the properties of this Lambda function. Now, one problem we're gonna have to uh, solve here is that this runtime that we selected is Python 3.7, uh, but we know that on this machine, if we go to Python, 3-version uh, that actually it's it's only able to run Python 3.6. So one of the things that we're going to need to do initially is actually change this runtime so that it matches the same runtime that we're using locally. So if I go here and I say Python 3.6 and I save that, now that's going to allow me to test it against the Python I've got installed locally. Uh, so next I can go to this Lambda function here and I can make some uh, modification in addition to the runtime modification. So let's say uh, I want to say, um, uh, you know, there's another uh, event I want to add. So we'll add a, a Z here. We'll call event uh, Z. Uh, now I, I can change this to say X plus Y plus Z. Uh, and then I can add this and extend it and say and Z colon and we'll do Z. And then what I'll do is um, uh, I'll, I'll now return the value of X, Y, and Z. So we've made a pretty significant change to the logic of our application. Now, how do I actually test this? Uh, it's a little different because we're not in the console where I can you know, use that wizard that allows us to create a, a test uh, payload. So how do I test that out? Well, what you do is you go to this section here on the right and you select the function that was imported. I'm going to select Control, right-click on it, and I'm going to select Run. Now I have several options here. I can run locally, I can run remote, so I can actually execute it remotely, or I can run uh, an API gateway local, which is a, a REST-based API, uh, or an API gateway remote, uh, also a, a serverless REST-based API. I'm going to choose Run Local, and now I can actually go through here and create a payload. And I'm going to go and put uh, Z here, and then we'll add Z and we'll make that also two. And then we'll add a comma. So now I have a, a dictionary that I'm gonna pass in and I'm going to click on this run button here and it'll actually execute my uh, Lambda function. There we go. And now you can see that in fact it is incorporating our new code, right? So it says response total. Uh, I can see that the log message is also uh, able to print that. And so this again is all locally run and testable. And if I break it, Let's say I, I put um, the wrong variable in here. You also can see how that works. If I say run, this will give us a traceback, and you can see that it says there's a uh, key error. This key actually didn't get passed in. It's expecting that key, uh, and, and we can see exactly the output. So uh, the, really a, a powerful interface to test uh, Lambda functions locally here, uh, and also you know completely use the natural tools that you're most likely familiar with, um, you know, uh, an IDE, uh, uh, like an interpreter. Uh, that's really the power of this Cloud9 environment is that, you know, that workflow where you can go back and forth, import a Lambda function, change the source code, and then test it out, see the local errors, uh, and then fix it. And then once you're done, uh, ultimately uh, go ahead and deploy it. So from an earlier uh, lesson, we went through and we looked at how you could invoke a Lambda, test it locally, and that is really powerful, especially one that you've imported. Another way to test Lambda functions, though, inside of Cloud9 is you can actually create one that talks 
to an API gateway, and you could test that locally. So you could test a serverless API uh, using our Cloud9 environment. So to do that, we're going to go to this tab on the right, and we're going to select AWS Resources. Once I'm there, I can select new Lambda function, and it'll go through the wizard that allows us to create a new Lambda function locally. Uh, inside of here, I'm going to call this function uh, change me demo. And now I'm going to say next, select runtime Python 3.6. Uh, I'll select an empty Python uh, function here. Uh, now for function trigger, this is really the critical component. If you do want to test a local API, you're going to have to toggle this down to API Gateway. Once I've done that, uh, now I'll need to put in the correct route, so I'll type in change. Uh, and then for security, I'm going to say no security because I want to test this workflow without having to uh, deal with, let's say, IAM roles. Uh, now, uh, I also will leave this default. I don't need to do anything. This is going to be a very simple Lambda function. Uh, once that's been all set up, now I can uh, create the structure on my local environment. Here's my change me demo uh, folder that was created for me. Uh, and inside of here, there's a very simple stub that I'm going to swap out. So I'm going to throw some source code in here. And let's walk through what the source code does. So I first import uh, a JSON library that's built into standard library of Python that allows me to handle JSON. I import the decimal library. And what this function is going to do is it's going to correctly return back change. So if I pass in a value of amount $1.37, it would first grab all the quarters that it could give me. Then it would grab all the dimes, and it would grab all the nickels, and then all the pennies. Right, so really typical process uh, as a cashier would do. Uh, so this Lambda function, it starts out with the same Lambda handler. The event is going to be, again, the payload that's going to have the change amount that we're going to change. And here is a really important section, this if body in event. Uh, what this means is that uh, I'm able to interpret that the API gateway itself was called, and the API gateway itself will show a body inside, and that's how I'm able to know that that pathway needs to be interpreted slightly different. So if I'm called from Python, I don't need to use this, but if I'm called from an API gateway, I go through this code path and I load the event in as JSON, and then I'm able to actually interpret that different route. Uh, from here, I go through and I uh, um, put that value into an amount, and then here's the logic about making a change. And really, um, uh, it's a greedy algorithm that uh, pops off uh, the remainder until eventually I can't give you any more coins. And then finally, the response uh, comes back here uh, as JSON, and it's returned back to the user. So a pretty simple and straightforward uh, application. And then to test it locally, what we can do now is I can go back over to this uh, Change Me uh, section here and right-click on it. And here's a, another key step is you right click, and there's a lot of different things you can do uh, locally here, but what we're going to select is run, and then we're going to select run uh, API gateway local. Now, it's worth pointing out that this is another really powerful feature of API gateway is you can also test functions remotely as well. In, in our case, because we've built this locally, we're going to test it locally. So I select run API gateway local, uh, and now, to test this, I'm going to have to select the correct uh, HTTP verb. So I'm going to select post. And what post does uh, that's different from get is that post will actually accept a JSON payload. Sometimes you'll, you'll see this too where, where it'll, it'll get stuck for a second. If you ever have that, just toggle between tabs. So here I have the post method. Now I need to put in my payload. And we know from the source code that it's going to be looking for an amount. Uh, and then I'm going to have to pass in a string of some value. So again, let's just do $1.37. Uh, and uh, if I select run on the left here, uh, it's going to pass that JSON payload in, uh, and then you can see that it returned back uh, some kind of a, an error. So it's going to completely show me everything that's happening inside of my application so that I can go through and, and debug it. So let's go ahead and refresh this and, and um, rerun it again. So now if I go through and I uh, again, type in amount here, pass in our payload, go here, amounts, again, and we'll do um, $2.54. Uh, I again can go in and I can run this. Okay, so we ran into a internal service error here. So 
let's go ahead and see if we can figure out what's happening. Oh, here we go. The amount actually doesn't have a closing uh, uh, quote here. So if I change that, and now you can see it's now a turquoise color. Uh, if I say run, it's now going to go through and give us the access to uh, the response. And the response here shows us a nice formatted payload that has 10 quarters, 4 pennies, uh, and it's able to correctly make the change, and it's also able to show the content type as JSON. So again, a really powerful way to test web-based services uh, uh, locally inside your Cloud9 environment. Let me also show you, though, if I toggle here and I go to API Gateway Local, I can go to um, Lambda Local as well. And so I can now test this Lambda functions two different ways. So I also can just put a payload in here that's a a basic payload, let's just call this, I don't know, $1.39, and I can pass it in without having to do uh, a post-based request. I can just uh, give it a dictionary, and it also is able to test it and give me back the result. So in summary, what you're able to do here is actually toggle through the different environments from a Lambda local environment to a API gateway uh, local environment, and it's all made available by right-clicking on the function and selecting this run icon. So uh, a great and powerful interface here for developing serverless applications uh, using Cloud9. All right, so we've been able to uh, grab functions from the console, import them. We've been able to test them locally via Python, also test them via API Gateway. So we have this you know, complete workflow that we've showed. Okay, now how do we get this back into AWS? Well. Fortunately, Cloud9 has a solution there as well. If I right-click on this Change Me uh, Lambda that we created, uh, there's a section here that says Deploy. And if I click on Deploy, what happens is that uh, it'll automatically take my packaged application and deploy that into the AWS ecosystem. And what's powerful about this is I can now test this either inside the console of AWS or I can go through and I can test it uh, within uh, a remote call as well. So if I right click on this and I say run, I can say run API Gateway remote. Uh, and, and what that will do is it'll allow me again, remote here, to test it inside of AWS. Great, so now that this is deployed, let's tap into one of the most powerful features of Cloud9. I can actually test that using API Gateway, but a remote API Gateway. So I'm gonna toggle that. And now I can do the same thing I did earlier. I can create a post function uh, method, and I can pass in a payload. In this case, let's pass in a payload of $2.59. Uh, once I select run, the difference here is that this is actually running inside of AWS itself. And so uh, you can see the endpoint request goes to uh, Amazon now. It doesn't go locally. So I'm actually executing code against that remote server. Let's go ahead and take a look at how that works now. So if I go to the console and I look inside of Lambda, it'll actually give me the ability to look through uh, the execution logs. So if I go to Lambda, uh, I should see now that there's a Cloud9 Change Me demo that's been created and automatically deployed from the Cloud9 environment. Uh, and if I scroll down here to monitoring, uh, you can see that actually it's been invoked. Uh, and I can also um, go through here and look at the logs. And if we look at the logs, we should see that $2.59 call. Uh, and in fact, we see that this was called remotely. Uh, and here's actually the, the complete pathway. And here's actually a JSON payload that shows that that was called. So again, this is an incredibly powerful workflow where I can uh, set up a, a Lambda function locally, configure it, test it locally, deploy it by right-clicking on it, then testing it in the deployed environment to make sure that it works properly, and then it completely instruments and checks out my code for me. Uh, the last thing I'll end up here with is if I go back to the Cloud9 environment, if you remember that this is where I would go through and I would configure it, well, if we scroll down, notice here that there's a different input now. This is a different trigger. So we've always had this CloudWatch trigger, but the API gateway now is configured. And I also can go through here and I can actually select uh, that endpoint if I wanted to 
and I could actually make API calls use, using, let's say, Postman or using a curl. Uh, and so I, I really quick, quickly created this complete end-to-end -end pipeline, and it all started with Cloud9. Now that we've gone through and seen some of the things you can do with both Cloud9 and Lambda, what we can do is uh, go to the next level and work at these trigger levels and these timers. So I'm gonna create a function here, and what this function is gonna do is it's going to run on a CloudWatch event. So to start with, I'll again go author from scratch, and we'll call this uh, timer hello. Inside the runtime here, I'm gonna select um, Python, Three six. Uh, I will go ahead and create this function. Wait for it, it'll take a few seconds to create. And once this is actually created, what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna go to that trigger section and actually make this run at some uh, periodic interval. Okay, now that that's running, what I can do here is I can go into this Lambda uh, and uh, add a print statement here that says uh, basically, uh, I'm run, I am running uh, in a timer like that. That looks like that works. And now I want to have a CloudWatch event actually trigger that. So I'm going to go to this trigger section here, and I'm going to look through the triggers and find CloudWatch event. Here is a CloudWatch event. And uh, from here, this is when I would set the interval that I want this Lambda function to run. When you're doing development, a lot of times a minute interval is great so that you can get that feedback loop. Once you've uh, ver verified that everything works, then you'll want to go to maybe an hour or a day, you know, something more realistic. Uh, but in development, it's great to do a one minute timer. So uh, to do that, you can either use an existing rule you've set up or create a new rule. Let me show you how to create a new rule. So if we go here and we say 10 minutes, for example, um, I could write a rule description in here, uh, and we'll call this, this, you know, this runs every 10 minutes. And then uh, I can schedule this expression, and I can, I can do rate here. I can say rate, uh, and we'll say um, 10 minutes, like this, right? And, and you can see you can put rate one day, you know, uh, you can also do schedule it at uh, periods during the week. And then next you'd say enable trigger. Uh, and then that's all you need to do to actually, uh, you know, go ahead and, and create one of these Lambda functions. Now, another thing you can do, uh, again, this is what I was um, going to use earlier, is that since I've already had one created, I'm going to go to my CloudWatch event here, and I'm going to reuse an existing one-minute timer I've got that I have set. Here you can see the rate one minute. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say add. And now what's going to happen is that uh, this timer, every minute, is going to call this function, and then it's also going to be generating logs, right, because I've actually enabled uh, those log messages. So what I can do next is go to monitoring here, and I can just uh, look inside the CloudWatch logs and uh, look for that timer that says uh, running uh, inside a timer. Here we go. We can just go through here, refresh. It'll take about 60 seconds or so for z these logs to show up. There we go. I'm running a timer. So you can see how quickly you can get that feedback loop going where this Lambda function, you're able to test it, uh, you know, get that uh, feedback loop going with a timer, and then make it do something more complex. In this case, again, we're, we're, we're doing something really simple here. Um, where uh, I, I'm just making it print something, right? I'm running a timer, but you could do many different things. It could be triggering a, you know, a Spark-based machine learning job. Uh, it could be triggering a um, prediction call to SageMaker. It could be you know, transferring data, uh, you know, kicking off an ETL job that transfers a petabyte of data. It can do many powerful things, but the, the real uh, tip here is that you have to set up that trigger and you can see it's very straightforward to set up a trigger. And if you ever want to turn off the trigger, one, one tip to know about is if you scroll down here and you go to your rule, which again is this one, and we go to uh, CloudWatch events, you can actually just select disabled uh, and then save, and then that'll just turn off that trigger. So you still get to keep your trigger that's set up for development, and you can use it 
you know, n number of times on any, any Lambda function you want, but then when you want to turn it off, you just go to disabled. So really that's the workflow to get timers working. In the next lesson, we're going to go through and, and actually put that together with a more sophisticated Lambda. Now what we're going to do is we're going to dive into a more complex scenario where we have a producer that produce a, produces events that will later go into a, a big scale uh, data engineering pipeline. So step one is we're going to make a Lambda function that will grab some events from a DynamoDB table. In this case, it'll be a bunch of companies. It'll read those events in, take those events, and place them inside of SQS. SQS is a a queuing service that can handle an infinite scale. And those events later will tie a second Lambda to, and it'll process those events in the queue. So step one, let's go ahead and set up uh, SQS queue. So I'm going to go here uh, and go to simple queue service. Next, what I'll do is I'll create a queue, and I'll call this one producer. And I'll make it a standard queue. And what a standard queue does is it has unlimited throughput. So basically, by being okay with some of these trade-offs, like uh, at least once delivery, best effort ordering, uh, what, I, what I get as a result is that I actually get an infinite scale. So I don't have to worry about you know, overwhelming this queue. So I'm going to select uh, Quick Create Queue. There we go. I have a producer. And if I want to test what it's like to send a message, I can use this interface here, Queue Actions. So I'm going to go um, send a message, and I'll just say test. I'll make uh, a very simple message here. Once you do that, uh, you'll see that those messages will, will then populate in these fields. So if I say, um, you know, refresh here, you can see that this message is now available. And I can go and I can view or delete those messages. So I'll go to that and I'll say start pulling. And here you can see that message, it, it, it appears. Uh, and now what I can do is if I wanted to, now that I've read it, uh, I can delete that message. And once I've deleted that message and I close this, you'll see it now it says zero messages available. Another thing you can do as well, if I go to Q Actions here, and I'd say test, and then let's say I make another message, um, I do test two, uh, and it'll have a couple messages. When you're testing, you, you also can uh, purge the queue. So if you have a bunch of messages that you want to get rid of, you can go to Q Actions, and you can say purge queue, and this will just get rid of the messages in there so you don't have to worry about them. But in general, this is going to be the high scale uh, queuing system that we're going to populate with uh, messages from our um, producer. So, so this producer, uh, it's going to get its data from DynamoDB. So let's go over to DynamoDB and set that up. So uh, step one is I'm going to go to uh, DynamoDB here. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create a table uh, in this case, I'll just call this uh, test, test table. And for a primary key, this is really the only thing you have to do other than make the name of the table. Uh, it needs to be some kind of globally unique identifier. You can't have the same key twice. If I say uh, GUID, globally unique ID, it goes through and it creates that test table. Now, I've already got one created called Fang here. So I can let that one uh, churn away here. And if I go to Fang, what this has in there under items is it has a bunch of companies' names. So I have uh, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Netflix, Oracle, right? These are all company names here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a Lambda function scan this entire table, pull that information out of DynamoDB, and actually send that information to SQS. And we're going to use the technique that we explored earlier where I'm going to call that function on a timer. So really, that's the first part of our serverless data engineering pipeline. Okay, so now that we know that those names exist here, and, and again, if you want to see how to create a name here, it's very simple. Let's just take this test table. If I want to create a new name here, I can say, you know, um, Google, like that, and it's that easy, right? So really straightforward to create new things in DynamoDB. So next, uh, let's see here. I've got the table. I've got the queue. Now let's go back over to Cloud9, and let's uh, set up our uh, ecosystem. So. I'm going to uh, go again to my AWS Resources button here, and I'm going to select this uh, icon, Create New Lambda, and we'll call this, uh, you know, Serverless Producer. 
And if I go next, uh, I'm going to select for runtime Python 3.6. Empty function. We'll go ahead and say next. For a trigger, I don't need any trigger. I don't need to build an API. I'm going to say no. Uh, if I go next here, I will need to set a role that has the privileges that allows me to read from DynamoDB and also put messages into SQS. Typically what I do when I'm developing Lambdas is I'll create a administrative role that gives me the privileges so I don't have to go back and forth and then later I'll go back and I'll tighten it up in production. So here's an example. I can say choose an existing role and I have a role called admin dev for Lambda, right? And so I can go through and rapidly use this to uh, talk to other services in AWS. So I'll say finish. Once I do that, then I can go over to this Lambda interface over here and create a, a new function. So what we'll do is I will go to that Lambda that I just created, and this is called serverless producer. And uh, I'm gonna pop into this serverless producer and look at this Lambda function. There it is. Close this. And I'm going to just paste in some code um, that we'll walk through. So the first step here is that I use the Boto3 library, and that's the SDK for Python for AWS. Uh, next, I import the JSON library to do some JSON handling. And then over here, I set up some global variables that give me access to different resources that I'm going to use throughout my Lambda. So I have a DynamoDB resource that I talk to via Boto3, and that allows me to read data from DynamoDB. Uh, I specify the table here. That was the FANG table we saw earlier. I also have the producer right here in this variable, and then I also create an instance to SQS. So really, I have two instances and two variables. Then what this Python JSON logger does is it sets up logging for me so I can get structured logging that will appear in CloudWatch. And this is really a, a best practice of DevOps uh, is to have uh, instrumentation and logging. Next, uh, what I do is I have a function here that scans a table. So line by line what this does is it first makes an instance of DynamoDB so I can talk to it. And then uh, what I do is I um, do a scan. And what a scan does is it just says, give me every single thing that's inside of that table um, so I can have access to it. I take those items and I then return them. Next, I create a function that allows me to send individual messages to uh, SQS. So what I do is I uh, go to SQS here and I grab the queue and then I um, send a message uh, into the queue and once I've sent the message, I'll return back the response what I get from sending the message. Finally, this uh, function here, it wraps those two things together. So I go through that DynamoDB table and for every entry in the table, a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, I send that entry into uh, SQS and it becomes a message, right? So if I have one company, there'll be one message. If I have two companies, there'll be two messages. And here's now where I get to my timed Lambda is all it needs to do is run that one line of code that says um, send emissions. It is able to talk to DynamoDB and it's able to talk to the queue. And again, this is triggered on a timer. So now that that's all set up, I can save it. And one final thing that I'm gonna need to do is I'm gonna need to set up Boto3 and also Python JSON Logger because those are third party libraries. To do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to CD into this directory and set that up. So I'm gonna CD into serverless producer, and then I'm gonna CD into the subdirectory as well. And um, actually before I CD into there, I'm gonna need to source a virtual environment. So whenever you create a new Lambda, it'll give you a, a virtual environment in Cloud9 that I can uh, develop with. So I'm gonna say source v e n v bin activate, and then I can change into that lower level directory. And, then, and now I, I, all I need to do is install these two libraries. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to, to do a um, pip uh, install, uh, and then I'm gonna do dash dash target, which allows me to specify where it's gonna install uh, the target, and I'll do um, dot dot. So, so basically install these, these uh, third party packages one layer above me inside this directory. So I'm gonna say pip install python hyphen json hyphen logger, and that should work. And again, that installs at one, one level up. And then I'm also going to install the uh, Boto3 library. So we'll, we'll go through here, we'll change that, and we'll do Boto3. 
And once that's running here, one of the things that we can do that's pretty powerful is we can tap into our ecosystem in Cloud9 to test this out, right? Because there's a lot of stuff going on. I have to scan a table, I have to take the messages out, I have to put them into SQS. So what I can do is I can go back to my AWS resources tab here, and I can find that Lambda that I set up, which uh, again here is serverless producer. If I right click on this Lambda function, I can run it. I'll say run, and I'll say run local. And what run local does is allows me to uh, run it as if it was running inside of AWS, but I can run it inside my development environment. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to now scan DynamoDB and also send messages to SQS. So these will appear in SQS and we'll be able to find them. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. If we look at these server results here, you can see that it was able to actually run that and now you can see as well, all, these are all um, server-based log files that show that it's acting on SQS uh, and it's acting on DynamoDB. So I can go back now to uh, my cloud-based environment, and if I go to, uh, let's say, SQS, there should be, let's say, eight messages or so. And in fact, I do have eight messages, and if we look at what those messages are, they should be company names. So let's go verify that. If I say view messages, let's pull those messages, in fact, they are. Name Facebook, name Google, name Netflix. Great. So we know that that's working, and if I want to test it again one more time, I can run it again, and it'll be 16 messages. So let's run it again. Okay, that looks like that's working. Let's go back again to SQS, and there should be 16 now. Great, there's 16 messages. So I know that that is working locally. Now, really, the only thing I need to do to um, get this running inside of AWS is deploy and we've already done that. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through it and, and uh, deploy. Uh, you know, we've done that previously in lessons, but I'll, I'll do it again here. So I'm gonna go down to this uh, icon here. I'm gonna right click on it, and I'm going to say deploy. And again, within just a, a few seconds or so, it's gonna take not only the source code that I just wrote, but it's gonna take those two third-party libraries I installed, package them all together as a zip file, and put them inside. Uh, and at that point, we're pretty close to being done the only thing that's going to be left is we'll probably want to test it one more time uh, inside of the Lambda environment, which we'll do. And we'll also want to verify that the CloudWatch timer that we're going to set up is going to trigger it every minute. So step one, let's go into uh, Lambda here, and let's just verify that that deployment was successful. Okay, so I go here, and uh, I type in um, serverless producer. Here we go. It, it appears, right, we see 20 seconds ago. Uh, next, what I can do is I can just test this out. So I'm going to say um, test, uh, and I, I can just say, sure, hello world, right? Because this is not going to take a payload. It, it can be any payload. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and run that. I'm going to say test, and it should do the same thing that we saw locally. It should put a bunch of messages in SQS. Let's see if that is, in fact, happening. Yep, here we go. It's putting a bunch of messages into SQS for us. Right, so now I've got it working inside of AWS as well. And if I go over to um, SQS now, and let's go here, let's go to SQS. SQS should have 32 messages, or 24 messages, right? And so it, it keeps getting bigger. And if I run it again one more time, uh, it's gonna have, now it's gonna have 32. Uh, if we go back here to SQS, right? So great, I've got a full pipeline working. The only thing I don't have working is the automation on the timer. So let's fix that. So to do that, uh, we already went through that process. I just go to add trigger, and it's trivial. I go down to CloudWatch events, and I find that one minute rule. Again, for development, I would highly recommend using one minute, but then in production, using an hour or a day or something like that. So we go to one minute timer, great. That all works. I'm gonna make sure I enable that trigger. I say add. And now it's going to run automatically. So what's going to happen is I'll wait about 60 seconds or so, and this queue, without us doing anything, is going to grow larger. So it's at 32. It's going to be at 40 once that other one hits. So I'm going to wait for a second here and go back to CloudWatch logs so you also can see in real time what's happening when this Lambda is called. So if I go to monitoring, uh, I can look at all the different events here. I can see you know, how many times it's successfully called, how many invocations there were, 
and I also can look at the logs in CloudWatch logs. Uh, here we go. If I go to this log here, we should see a bunch of messages, right, where it's talking to SQS. Uh, it's grabbing messages from uh, DynamoDB. It's sending messages, right? So I have a, a great history here of all these different uh, actions that that were um, lined up here in that Lambda function. So, uh, and, and again, what's so powerful about the way I'm logging it is I'm logging it in a key value format so I can do structured queries on those, those log messages. So it looks like probably 60 seconds has passed. So if I go back here again, this should now be a 40. Let's see. There, there we go. So we know now that this Lambda is being called on the timer automatically. And if I just leave this running, it's going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's really part one of, of getting your Lambda working in, inside of a producer-based workflow where you have something that's called on a timer. It doesn't have to be what we just did. It could be, again, many, many different things. It could be, you know, moving petabytes of data, doing machine learning, you know, calling into uh, Alexa. You know, there's a lot of different use cases, but the, the key components are serverless plus a timer. Now that we've got this complete workflow working where we have a timer that calls a Lambda, the Lambda calls into uh, DynamoDB, grabs the data, and then emits each one of those uh, companies it finds into SQS, the other thing we need to verify is that we have a, a good handle on how logging works. One of the few portions of, of um, serverless that is a little bit tricky is logging. And if you don't set up logging correctly, you can really get yourself into trouble. And so if you do set it up from the very beginning to be comprehensive, though, it, it's going to be a joy to work with. So step one is if we go here to my configuration window, you need to make sure that uh, you're able to actually um, verify that you know everything's set up the way you want. So here we go. I've got CloudWatch events. That's the timer. I've got the serverless application. Um, next, what we want to do is go to monitoring. And under monitoring, uh, what you want to do is make sure that you're aware that you know how these different dashboards work. So uh, the first part is invocations. This shows you how many times it's run. The second part is duration. This shows you how long it's run, you know, in, in aggregate. So like, is it going to take 200 milliseconds or one second to run? And then this shows the error count and also the success rate. Now to get into the specific line-by-line -line logging, what you'll do is you go to View Logs and CloudWatch. And what this does is it, it taps into the exact logs that your Lambda is, is creating. And the key takeaways here are that you'll want to select the newest log file to see the newest events. Uh, I'm gonna, I see here this is the newest log file. I go ahead and I create that. And now uh, I have a couple different options on how to search through the logs. One, I could just look through logs like this and I could drop down and I could see you know, pretty good messages. And because I used a JSON-based approach, one of the powerful things about that is you can see it breaks down the keys right into sub-keys right here. So I could then, if I wanted to, do sub-queries on that uh, as well. And that's one advantage of doing JSON-based logging, right? Where in this case, this is a text-based log, right? And there's no way to really break up the data. But because this message is a JSON-based log, you can see it, it breaks it down into these different sections here. So I can, again, do sub-queries on that. Uh, another way to look at the logs, though, that's pretty powerful, this is row-based, is I can look at text-based. If I click on this, this will actually expand all the log messages so I can really see inside of them. And that's a really powerful approach as well. And so I can, I can break down each of the log messages and see the context, like what happened before and what happened after. Another thing you can do, as I mentioned, is I can look for key events. So if I type in message, right, that's one of my key events here, it'll, it'll show me every place that message shows up. And I could even do message um, equals, and I could do, you know, um, scanning uh, table thing like this. And if I look at that, this should show me uh, the actual event. So one of the things you can do is you can actually search for um, structured parts of your log message. So you can see that I have message, I have table, I have queue. And so in order to search that, what I can do is I can put these brackets around the message and I can do dollar sign dot message. So basically, give me the, the sub component uh, of that um, log message and look for ones that equal scanning table thing. 
and we know that that's one of the messages. That's right here. So show me all of the different log messages where that occurs. And if I do this, now I can, you can see I can get every single incident that occurred. So this is a really powerful way to drill down into your code, is if you use JSON-based logging, you can break it down and do subqueries. Uh, so finally, um, the log messages are really the eyes and ears of what you're going to do in serverless. And so if you do want to have the highest level of um, you know, production coverage, you have to really take seriously uh, logging. Fortunately, on AWS, it's very straightforward. Now that we've got this producer emitting events, you know, filling up our queue with work to be done, we have to figure out a way to process the work in a serverless fashion. Uh, there's a couple different things to consider here. So if there wasn't serverless technology, how would you process this? Well, one of the things you would do is you'd probably you know, provision a server, you would tell that server to launch a few processes or threads, and then it would periodically ask for events from SQS. And that's an okay approach, but that's really a poll-based approach. It's a, a legacy or older approach to processing events. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use these cloud-native uh, concepts, and we're going to attach a Lambda uh, to SQS, and we're basically going to tell this Lambda, listen, anytime there's a message that appears in the SQS queue, as fast as you possibly can, I want you to spin up a, a Lambda function and then run it and process that message in the queue. Once you've processed it, I want you to then delete it, uh, and then that way we don't process the same message again. What we're going to actually do is we're going to go through and uh, grab the name of that company, go to Wikipedia, grab whatever page is available for that company's Wikipedia page. In the case of Google, it'll say something about, you know, that it was founded by, you know, a couple uh, PhD students at uh, Stanford, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We'll grab that, and then we'll do the, the, a transformation step where we call an AI API. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to call the um, off-the-shelf uh, AI API called AWS Comprehend, uh, and then we're going to get the sentiment analysis uh, of that um, producer. So once we've done that, then we're going to take that data and we're going to put it into S3 as an artifact. So that really gives us the full round trip uh, where we're both producing events and we're also consuming those events and doing some some things with them. So to get started here, I'm going to need to create another Lambda function, and again, that has a, a trigger that associates with SQS. So to do that, I'm going to again go over to this icon here. I'm going to say, uh, we'll call this uh, producer, uh, producer AI, and we'll go to runtimes, and we'll say Python 3.6, MT Python, uh, for function trigger, again, it's going to be triggered on an event, so we have that's going to be the trigger. We don't need to do anything special here. Uh, and for role, though, again, this is really critical. This will trip you up if you don't think ahead here, is that we're going to need to choose a role that has administrative privileges for development or specifically the privileges in production that we would use. In this case, we're going to need to be able to listen to SQS, and we're also going to need to be able to call Comprehend. That's a second privilege. And we're also going to need to write the data to S3. So we need three different uh, levels of privileges. So again, for development, to make things easy for demo, I'm just going to use this uh, administrative role. And now I go through and I say finish. Once I've uh, finished that, now I can go in and actually um, write, write, write some source code that allows this to happen. So I'm going to paste in some code here. And uh, I'll, again, I'll walk through step by step what this code does. So uh, step one, what I do is I import some JSON code, and then step two is I go through and I uh, use the Budo3 library, which is the Python SDK. I then also use pandas to do some data processing. I use a Wikipedia library that allows me to uh, pull pages from the Wikipedia website, and then I also have a string IO library, which allows me to read some data. So step one, again, logging is you know, critically important here. I use Python JSON logger and I actually have some you know, structured log messages. And th that allows me to you know, query things in a, in a structured way. Uh, step one is I write a function that allows me to query SQS. So you can see what this would look like. If you call it, you make an instance of whatever the queue is called. Uh, I then look at the queue attributes here, and then I return back the instance of that queue so I can do things for that queue. Uh, this is a SQS connection. This makes a client. 
uh, this next piece of code here, it gives me an approximate count. So if I ever wanted to do something sophisticated where I, I figure out how many messages are in the queue and maybe send a message that, you know, I need to spawn more workers in the future, you know, this would be a good way to accomplish that. And then uh, I also have a SQS message here that allows me to, or function that allows me to delete the message after I process the work. You can see here, it's pretty straightforward. I say SQS client, you give me the queue, and then I run SQS client delete message. Uh, finally, I then write a function that uh, takes the Wikipedia page that I'm gonna grab, and again, I get that from DynamoDB, and I append it into this data frame. So each one of these uh, you know, companies will generate a new data frame. Finally, I write an apply function in Pandas that allows me to apply sentiment analysis for each one of the rows that are in that data frame. And you can see here, I say comprehend detect sentiment. Just again, a couple lines of code to do sentiment analysis if you use a, an AI API. Then finally, uh, I apply that sentiment. And then uh, I also have a function here, write S3 which what it does is it takes the data frame that I've created and it writes out that whole data frame uh, into uh, Amazon S3. Finally, the, the last piece of code here is the actual handler, right? So all these serverless functions have to have a handler. And this one does, ex in fact, take an event though. What's different about this one than the producer is that this will be an SQS-based event. So again, it's listening to SQS. So I have to understand how to process that SQS event. What I do here, is I have a receipt handle here, and it looks like this, and I have an event source ARN. So these are really the structure of you know, parsing that uh, SQS event. And then what I do is I say, for every record that's in the event, and again, th these are gonna be single payloads, uh, I'm gonna capture that company name here. I'm gonna put it uh, inside this list. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to delete the message from the queue because I've now processed the thing I'm supposed to process. Next, uh, I go to pandas, I make that data frame that we talked about earlier. Uh, I take the data frame and I apply sentiment analysis to it. And then finally, I write the message to S3. So again, this is a full round trip allowing us to do sentiment analysis on data that was originally generated from another serverless function. So now that I've got all that set up, the only thing I'm gonna need to do is the same thing I did last time, which uh, I'm gonna need to go through and uh, set up all the packages. So. I'm gonna CD into this function here. Now I'm gonna go into uh, producer AI. So I'm gonna go into producer AI here. And uh, at the, I again see a virtual environment, so I'm gonna source that virtual environment. And then I'm gonna, by doing VNV bin activate, now that I have access to it, I can go one, one lower level. And I'm gonna use that same technique I used before where I'm gonna do the pip install target one level up, right, so that it'll be packaged in with my, my code. So step one, I'm gonna say pip install, uh, and then I'll put the name of the package, which will be boto3, and then I'll do dash dash target, and that will be one, le one, one directory up. Okay, that looks like that works. Uh, next, I'm gonna need to install pandas, so I'll do the same approach, install pandas. Great, that looks like that. It's gonna work. Okay. And I'm also gonna need to install this Wikipedia library. Okay, so let's go ahead and install Wikipedia. Okay, and then there's also gonna be the need to install Python JSON logger. That's that's that JSON logging library that we're using. Okay, Python JSON logger. Great, so now that that's set up, I've got all, the, all my packages installed locally. Uh, it's ready to deploy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to this producer AI function and I'm going to right click and I'm gonna say deploy. There we go. So now that that's deploying, uh, I can go back to my Lambda here uh, and I'm gonna look at other Lambda functions and see this, uh, this thing should be popping, popping up here in a second. Here we go. So we've got a, um, a producer 
AI function. And if we look at this, uh, it looks like it's all good to go. We've got, I've got all the source code installed here. Now, the only final thing that I'm gonna need to do is figure out a way to trigger this. So how do we trigger this function? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add this trigger right here. Uh, and we're gonna need to tell it to talk to SQS, right? So that's really the, the trick here is we're gonna tell it to respond to events that appear in SQS. And here we go, here's the message, SQS. Uh, it'll come up, in this case, I only have one queue, so it automatically populates. And I can decide how many messages at a time I want it to handle. I'm gonna say just one. Uh, just grab one message, and one message will then uh, be processed at a time. And then, again, this is the part where the trigger is either enabled or disabled. I could not enable the trigger, and then it would just, it would, it would not run, or I can enable the trigger, uh, and it'll run and say, you know, um, create it in a disabled state for testing, or enable the trigger now. So we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and enable that trigger. Uh, and now that it's actually enabled, what's gonna happen is if we go back to this queue here, this queue should be getting very large, is that it's going to immediately start operating on this queue and start processing all the messages. And again, what it's gonna do is it's going to go step one, uh, you know, grab the message from the queue. Step two, delete it. Step three, go through and grab a web page for that company. Step four, uh, create a data frame from that company data. Step five, go in and call AWS Comprehend. Again, that's the natural language processing library. Then once it goes in, it figures out what the sentiment is, it's gonna take that sentiment and it's gonna process it in S3. So we have a full end-to-end -end pipeline that's gonna process this. So let's go ahead and see here, look, we can see it's already processing these messages. So it's gonna quickly drain this because it's very uh, asynchronous the way these operations occur. So if I go now to um, uh, this Lambda function, I should be able to look at monitoring and see what's actually happening uh, and, and make sure that um, I can look inside of CloudWatch and verify that it's doing what I expect it to do. So here we go, I've got the, uh, this function here. And if I, if I look through here, we can see it's attempting to delete the uh, SQS receipt handle. Uh, so it's actually deleting those messages. Uh, again, I could, um, uh, go through here and do subqueries if I wanted to, but it does appear to be working, right? So it's it's grabbing those messages and uh, processing them. So next, what I can do is I can look at the final end result of this. I can go to S3, uh, and if we go to S3, I can look at the bucket that I'm using, which is called Fang, and I should see a timestamp. That's a timestamp. Here we go, Fang sentiment. This timestamp should be a new timestamp here. So let's see here. Thanks sentiment it is uh, the time of this video being produced. This is a current timestamp. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. I'm gonna download it. And then uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, go back to my Cloud9 environment and I'm going to uh, upload that file into my Cloud9 environment. So I'm gonna go here, close all these up here and say um, uh, file, upload local file, and I'm going to select a file, Fang Sentiment, here we go. And that will give me that CSV file, and then I can just look at it inside of my uh, interface here. And you can see that it did in fact create a CSV file with these columns, names is a column, there we go, there's a name, Wikipedia, that's the snippet right here, and then the sentiment is at the very end. You can see that the sentiment here is neutral. So this is the fully working end-to-end -end pipeline that used all those different steps that we talked about. Now that we've gone through and built this microservice, let's walk through the steps and individually look at the components. So step one, we have a CloudWatch event. And really, this is a key aspect of building a microservice is when do you actually schedule this microservice to run if it's a data collection job? We had a one minute interval, which in our case for development is a great interval to test because immediately we can look at the payloads, we can see what's happening in our data engineering pipeline. So this is really a good uh, knob to turn off and on uh, depending on where you're at. In a production data engineering pipeline, most likely you wouldn't leave it at a minute. You more likely would uh, move it to an hour or to let's say a day, uh, and you would schedule that CloudWatch event. 
Now, next, when that cloud watch event is triggered over uh, to the Lambda, the Lambda is then going to do the hard work of collecting the, the initial data uh, as the producer uh, function. So what this does is uh, it grabs uh, information from DynamoDB, uh, names of companies, in this case it was Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, and each one of those companies as an entity gets put into uh, Amazon SQS. Now, SQS is a really fascinating part of a serverless pipeline, and what's fascinating about it is that it can, ha it can handle infinite scale. Uh, and what that means is that if there's a one-to-one -one relationship here where uh, every time uh, a message comes in, uh, one message uh, goes into SQS and one Lambda call is actually executed, well, this is a, a highly concurrent uh, parallel pipeline that allows us to uh, use something that has infinite scale. And that's really the power of serverless is that the functions themselves uh, don't actually do all the, the heavy lifting. Uh, it's the infrastructure that you're using that allows you to do that heavy lifting. Uh, now next, uh, what happens, and this again is the producer, is we go to the consumer side. And the consumer side, uh, what we do is we call out into the AI API. Uh, in, in our case, we're using AWS Comprehend, but it could be uh, recognition, it could be translate, it could be some other uh, pre-built API. Uh, and that Lambda function is triggered also asynchronously, and this is also a one-to-one. -one. Uh, so what's uh, powerful about this event-based Lambda execution pipeline is that if you have a thousand messages in SQS, uh, a thousand lambdas will, will run concurrently. And, and again, if you had to build this yourself without the serverless technology, uh, having that level of uh, parallelism would be really difficult to obtain. So in a nutshell, by uh, leveraging SQS as the heart and soul of our uh, data pipeline, it allows our lambda function to have incredible parallelization. Finally, the last phase here is this artifact. So if we go to this S3 artifact, this consumer pipeline here, uh, is able to actually put that final artifact into S3, and that's actually the end of our chain. Now, if there was a, uh, another serverless uh, pipeline that needed to operate on that S3 file, we could have a, a second version of this. So we could then have another Lambda function that listens to an S3 event. That S3 event um, could be uh, resizing an image or you know doing additional processing on it. So that's really the other power of serverless is that by breaking each of these components uh, step by step uh, into pieces, the, the reasonably complex application that you're building uh, is, is easy, easy to debug or replace pieces uh, when you're building a second system. And, and really, in a nutshell, that's really the power of, of serverless is, is you build these small things, you connect them together, and also you uh, build these event-driven architectures which are cloud-native versus pole-based architectures, which are really a pre-cloud uh, type of architecture. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, remember when you're building your, your uh, serverless applications that you want to uh, break each component down into uh, its, its own distinct uh, function. Uh, and then once you do that, you can uh, rebuild applications very quickly uh, by using these patterns that you've learned. Now let's talk about AWS Serverless Application Model, or SAM. Uh, the AWS Service Application Model is an open-source framework that enables you to build serverless applications uh, on AWS. Now a serverless application is not just a Lambda, it's a Lambda and any other resources it uses. So a uh, SAM model might include a S3 bucket or a DynamoDB table uh, or an API gateway. The first step in installing uh, SAM, or the SAM command line tool, is to make sure that you have Docker installed. Uh, Docker uh, has installation guidelines for different types of platforms. Uh, for the OS X, there is a download the uh, DMG and once it downloads, uh, you, it's very simple just to copy it into your application directory. The next step is installing the uh, command line tools that go along with it. The first command line tool that you need to install, if you haven't done so already, is the AWS command line interface. 
or AWS CLI. Um, it can be installed. It also has a number of different installers and ways of installing uh, depending on the um, operating system you're working on. Um, in our case, we'll just install it using the pip installer. So once we've installed the AWS command line tools, then we'll want to install the uh, SAM command line tools, which are in addition to the AWS command line tools. We'll once again use pip to install these, uh, though there are installation instructions for um, other ways of installing them. So now we should have both AWS command line tool and a SAM command line tool. The next thing you'll need to do uh, if you're going to use these command line tools is set up credentials. To set up credentials for these tools, go to the go to your console in your AWS, and you want to go to your user access and encryption keys, or IAM. Go to your users and pick the user you wish to uh, act as from the command line. In this case, I'm going to pick this one. Once you've selected the user you wish to act as from the command line, select security credentials and you want to create an access key. Once you've created your access key, you can either show it at this point, this is the only time you'll be able to see it, or download it as a CSV file. Uh, I'd recommend downloading it. Uh, put the file someplace uh, safe and secure. It has the keys that will give someone access to your account if they have them, uh, and you won't have a chance to create the same key again. Once you have your credential keys, you should set them up with your command line tools. By using the AWS configure command. So here you'll enter your access key that you just generated, the secret access key that you also just generated, whatever region you wish to work in, and you can accept the default output format. Now your uh, you should be able to use the configure list to see who you're logged in as and to see that you have access keys and secret keys set up. This will enable to access uh, and interact with your AWS account from the command line. Uh, so for example, you can look at all the S3 buckets that are in your account. Um, all of the services APIs are represented uh, by the AWS command line. Um, so you should be able to interact with those and do most of the things you can do in the AWS console. Now let's talk about the setup of a SAM application project. Um, SAM command line tool has a handy um, example hello world application. That you can use to get started. Uh, let's take a look at how this is laid out. So we can see here that uh, it automatically generates a readme, um, a hello world directory, which contains the uh, Lambda application itself, and a file called template YAML. Uh, Python code is in the hello world directory. You can take a quick look at that. You can see it's a simple Lambda uh, with a Lambda handler, which accepts an event in a context from an API gateway. Uh, and then just returns a simple hello world. But let's look at the template file. This is where the SAM application is described, and, and this is what will determine how it is built and deployed. So SAM template format is an extension of the cloud formation format uh, with some extra resources. In order to use the resources that are available uh, for SAM, you need to add this transform here that tells it that it works with the uh, serverless format.
Uh, the first section is just a description. Uh, then there's a global section. These are global attributes that are set across different resources. So you can set an attribute that will work for multiple resources at once. The resources are the real heart of the file. Um, there's many different kind of resources. As I mentioned, there's uh, DynamoDB tables, uh, API gateways, um, S3 buckets. These can all be defined in here. Um, but this one defines merely a simple serverless function, which is what a Lambda is. Uh, so here's the name as it's referred to in this document, the Hello World function. Uh, and then this is the type, and this is where if it was an S3 bucket or a table, the type would be different. Um, and then it has properties. The first property is the location of the code. Uh, in this case, the code is local and it's in the directory hello world. The next is the entry point for the code. So in the app file, we saw that there was a lambda handler method and that's the entrance for, for this lambda. Uh, it has the runtime. And then the events are the events that would prompt the lambda to act. So in this case, the event type is from an API, which means there'll be an API gateway attached to it. Um, and then it has a path for that API and the method that's associated with it. You can define an API gateway as a separate resource, uh, especially if you want to use a Swagger file or do something more complicated. Uh, but if you're not doing something more complicated, you can leave that out and it will be automatically generated uh, based on the number of serverless functions in the file. Uh, down here are simply some outputs that are useful for being able to get values out later on. Let's look at a slightly more complicated one. So we can see this one under resources um, has a lambda named read dynamo db event. Uh, it has code URL and a handler and the runtime just as we did before. Uh, the event type, however, is of type DynamoDB instead of API. Um, and then down here, we see we have the DynamoDB table actually defined. Uh, the table has its own properties, including uh, its write capability, its read capability, and other things you'd use in creating a DynamoDB table. So you can see that we could add many more resources and make a very complicated uh, application just by using these definitions in the SAM file. Uh, otherwise, you can see that this um, application is very similar. Uh, similar layout, you have the application code, um, the app along with its requirements, uh, put in a separate directory that's laid out in the template file. So this should give you an idea of how a SAM application is laid out, and most importantly, to think about is the template file itself, because that's where you're really going to be defining things. Now let's look at running a local API gateway using the SAM command line tool. Uh, we have a simple application here called Shouter. If we look at its template, it looks very much like the templates we've seen before. There's a single resource named shouter function. Uh, it's a serverless function, so a lambda. Uh, the code is in a directory called shouter. The entry point is the module app and the uh, method lambda handler. It uses a Python 3.7 runtime. And it, it's uh, evoked by a API gateway event uh, from the endpoint shout. And then this is a little different. Notice that we have here shout me in brackets that indicates that it's a path parameter uh, and it's on a get method. Uh, let's look at the app itself. So it's in the shouter directory. Here it is, a simple uh, one method, lambda. Lambda handler takes an event in context. Uh, here, that path parameter, shout me, is taken from the event path parameters and uh, assigned to a variable. And then, it's simply uh, cast to uppercase and returned. And that's what this uh, whole Lambda does. Uh, to run uh, a Lambda locally using its own API gateway, we use SAM local start API. So this starts a local uh, version of the API running. And you can see it gives you the URL that the endpoint should be served from. 
So we can try to cur curl this URL. And we can see it's returned our message capitalized. Um, so this is a really useful thing for development. You can go in and um, run your code locally. And if we open our app, we can actually go in and change the code. Let's add some uh, more excla exclamation points. Now we change this code. We go back and look. Um, and we can see that if we hit the endpoint again, the endpoint responds with our changed code. So we don't need to stop the API server uh, when we change code, it's automatically picked up. This is a really great way to develop uh, your Lambdas and code locally. You can uh, iterate with and, and see the results without having to restart the server or worry about uh, deploying before you know how it works. Now let's talk about uh, testing uh, your application locally. When we ran the API Gateway locally before, the API Gateway took care of generating an event for your Lambda. Uh, in order to run a Lambda, it needs an event to accept. Now Sam um, lets us generate an event locally. So we can event uh, so you can see it allows us to make events for uh, a number of different um, services, including DynamoDB or S3. Uh, and we could do, uh, let's do one for S3. Let's see what they say. So we can do one for an S3 delete or an S3 put. Let's do one for delete. And see what this generates then is a JSON file that um, has the same parameters and shape as what an API gateway would produce. So we can then modify this and create an event that would work for our tests uh, that we can pass in directory to our Lambda um, event handler. So let's look at an event. Uh, this is an event for our shouter application. Um, you can see that it is a uh, has the API uh, HTTP method get. Um, talks about having query string parameters. Uh, so it puts a value in for that for us automatically. Um, and has the path parameter set as well. So uh, if we want to invoke our Lambda just once, we can use the invoke method. So what we can see here is it ran our Lambda once, uh, returned the result, and then stopped. This is really useful if you're trying to write uh, any kind of scripted testing for your Lambda. You can set up these invokes uh, with events of your choosing, uh, either to evoke errors or different situations, uh, script them together, and then run them automatically and test their um, results. So another interesting thing we can do is um, use PDB to debug um, a Lambda locally. So first thing we need to do is use remote PDB, which is a uh, PDB made for remote access. So we'll, we will add that. Uh, let's go and look at our application here. Let's add that to our requirements. Uh, and then also use it in our app itself. So um, to use the remote PDB, uh, we import it. We Put remote PDB here. Here I'll separate this to separate lines to make it more readable. So we import remote PDB class and then we set it up to be on the um, port 444. 
and then do set trace. Uh, and then we're going to use something called SOCAT, which is um, a Linux tool for setting up pipes. So you're going to need to install that if you don't already have it installed. And while that's installing, we can talk about the other directions. Um, we're going to use something called SAM build. Uh, what that does is if you have requirements in a requirements file, it will take a Docker container and those requirements and build your application in inside that container so you can run it in the container in an environment similar to the way it would be run out in AWS. So this command here will have SAM build, use container says build it in the Docker container, and then we're going to start the API using that same container. So we can see here it's grabbing the Docker image and it's building it. And here's where it's running. Now, if we want to invoke it, we can invoke it this way. Curl similar to what we did before. Um, but there won't be a response because it will be waiting. So what we'll do then. is use SOCAT to connect. So now you see we're in a uh, Python debugger. You can see where we are in the code. Um, we can look at values. We can step through. Uh, let's, let's look at the value of shout in here. And you can see it's set to yo, which is the uh, argument we set in on the command line. Um, this is a really powerful way of debugging uh, code, of being able to jump in and step through and see what values are and see what's going on. So you see we can step through, we can get to the message, and then we can also continue on out. And then once we've continued out, it will go ahead and return the message uh, in the tab in which we curled. and. Um, that is how you debug. So that's a really great way to debug your lambdas, uh, and I highly recommend adopting that if you're running, um, developing lambdas locally. Now let's talk about how to build and deploy uh, a SAM application using the SAM command line tools. So we're in our shouter application again. The command to package up a SAM application is SAM package. Here we're going to um, go ahead and do this. When you package it, it's going to actually zip up all the files and send them to an S3 bucket. Um, you'll have to define what that S3 bucket is. And in this case, I've got uh, the name of my S3 bucket in an environment variable called S3 bucket. So I will go ahead and put that here. Now we see we call SAM package, um, and then we're going to define a output template file. That's the file that will be produced by the packaging uh, that can be used by the deployment command. So here we go. It's packaged the artifacts and wrote a new uh, package file. So let's see. See, there's a package.yaml there. Let's take a look at that. So this looks a lot like the template.yaml we began with. Um, but notice that the code URI now is in an S3 bucket instead of locally. So when uh, the deployment is called, it's going to be called uh, referring to the code in this S3 bucket. So here's our S3 bucket, and we can see uh, this is the uh, code we just uploaded. If we take this and uh, download it, uh, we have to change the extension to do that.
we can see it actually just contains what was in our um, original application. Now, if we want to deploy the function, we use sam deploy, uh, and this is what the command's going to look like. Notice we're using the packaged file uh, YAML that we just um, produced from the package command. Um, AWS has the idea of a stack, which is uh, a group of resources that are treated as a unit. And it's really useful for not leaving dangling resources if you need to delete something or just uh, maintaining resources. Um, the capabilities argument will uh, allow the deployment to create a IAM, IAM role that the uh, Lambda will need to use. So this is how the deploy works. This is how the deploy works. So while we're waiting for this to happen, we can go ahead. Uh, stacks are in the cloud formation surface area. So you can see this is where stacks would be. So this is our stack, and you see it says create in progress. You can look over here and see resources that are being created. There's our function, and this is the role that we allowed to be created for it. So it looks like it's still creating uh, some permissions and things. So it's still in progress. Once it's created, we should be able to find it here in the applications. So now the create is complete. We can go to the Lambda Management Console, go to Applications, see our application. Uh, and we see down here that it has an API gateway and the Lambda itself. If we go to the API gateway, we can open the endpoint, which we still need to add our full route. We have an internal, internal server error, which means it probably hasn't um, deployed yet. Well, if we have an error like that, we probably want to know what happened. So let's go back and look at um, the logs. So the SAN command line tool lets you look at the logs for your uh, functions. And so you see here, SAM logs is the command. We have the name of the function and the name of the uh, stack. So it says test timed out. Oh, I see. We must have left some remote PDB code in uh, from our debugging session, and that's what's killed our app. So we could then fix our app and redeploy it, and um, we'd see it in the Lambda function section. In the concept of serverless, it means not only functions, which we've uh, done a lot of, but also services that also uh, manage all the infrastructure around uh, some kind of application. One of the ones that's really specific to data engineering is AWS Glue. Here's an example of uh, some of the things that AWS Glue will do for you. Uh, the first thing that it does is it builds out this data catalog. Uh, and what's fascinating about the data catalog uh, is that it really becomes this metadata storage system uh, for your application. So what it can do uh, is it can talk to, let's say, Postgres database, or it could talk to uh, a MySQL database, and that database doesn't necessarily even have to live uh, inside of the AWS ecosystem. It could be in a third-party provider like the Google Cloud or, or Azure Cloud, uh, or maybe even a, a private cloud that's hosted in your company. And what happens is that Glue can introspect that uh, data source, uh, build out a bunch of metadata about it, so that later you can do scheduled operations on it. So this data catalog is a fundamental piece of uh, 
what AWS Glue can do. Next, uh, it also has an ETL engine. Uh, and what's interesting about the ETL engine is that it will generate Python for you. So uh, it'll generate a transformation script for you, and it could be anything from, uh, I'm gonna change this field that says region code to zip code. Uh, because your source database has a different column name that, than your machine learning pipeline needs, for example. Uh, and so what's really powerful about this is that because it can communicate with a catalog, I don't have to go in and generate all this uh, transformation code myself. Uh, it'll auto-generate it for me, and then I can just modify it a little bit and make changes to it. Uh, so this is a very powerful, uh, again, serverless uh, ETL engine. The next step in the line is that uh, it's one thing to do this manually, but uh, in order to create a reoccurring and professional data pipeline, you need some way of scheduling the jobs. And that's really the third uh, capability of AWS Glue is it has the ability to schedule jobs for you. Uh, so how would this work in practice is, you know, part one is, let's say you have a, uh, a database here, and, and again, this could live somewhere uh, outside of AWS. Uh, next, uh, you go through and you uh, write some kind of a ETL transformation. And this again could change, let's say, the, the region code uh, to a um, zip code. Make this a little bit bigger. And then uh, after that, uh, you would, you would um, you know, have this pipeline set up that's now needs to be scheduled at a regular interval. So uh, you would go through here uh, and uh, set some kind of an interval. You could say, you know, once daily, uh, and then you're, you now have an end-to-end -end pipeline uh, that's going to be able to uh, be the heart and soul uh, of, of your uh, data engineering infrastructure. And, and really, that's the, that's the power of, of a serverless uh, you know, platform like this, is that, is that you're not provisioning machines to data catalog uh, and having to manage all the infrastructure. You're not, um, you know, provisioning machines that, that are going to be handling the ETL operation. It's done for you. And finally, you don't have to provision machines that schedule that work for you. It's all part of this um, infrastructure that is provided to you in, in able to, that allows you to do serverless data engineering. So that's really what AWS Glue is in a nutshell, is it's a uh, very powerful uh, serverless data engineering pipeline that has the three main components, data catalog, ETL engine, and schedule. Uh, if you, if you are going to be doing uh, machine learning pipelines on AWS and you do want to have a repeatable uh, you know, serverless data engineering system, AWS Glue is a great place to start. All right, now that we ha have an overview of what AWS Glue is, let's go ahead and see it in action. First, you want to go to the console and find AWS Glue. I just do a search for Glue. Uh, once I've got that set up, I can go into this uh, uh, dialog box here and look at existing tables that have been set up. And again, the first step of AWS Glue is to create this metadata. So I can point it at, uh, at an S3 data source, uh, a data source that's located in the Amazon ecosystem or a third-party one. In this case, uh, uh, I've already had a pre-existing um, record that I've set up. I can show you how you do that. You would go to Add Tables. You could say Add Tables using a crawler. Uh, we'll just call this um, test crawler. And then next here, what you want to do is you want to um, point it at a data store. Uh, and then from here, you can see how you can, you can specify S3 is one uh, data store that you can introspect and crawl and look for metadata. You can also look at a, um, a JDBC, so a database connection. Again, it could be locally or it could be externally. Or you also can um, introspect uh, DynamoDB as well. So we, we had set up uh, earlier that um, FANG database. Uh, so you can go through here and I could uh, add that in uh, and then go ahead and add some kind of a service role here. So we'll call this uh, you know, Dynamo. And then once I've set this up, I, I can actually either run it on demand. And that's usually the best choice when you first get started is to first uh, test this job and make sure it works properly. But once you do, you can then later uh, switch it over to, let's say, hourly, daily, uh, weekly, you know, whatever interval makes sense. In this case, we'll just say run on demand. And then we can be asked, uh, where do we want to put the output? Now, one of the things you can do, actually, um, inside of here is you can uh, specify an output database. Uh, 
and once you specify that, then everything is set up and it's ready to go and the schema will be introspected, the crawler will um, go through and find that data and then it'll create a catalog for you. So here we go, we can see that the crawler is attempting to run and again, it's gonna use that DynamoDB database as the, the, the database that we're gonna get the metadata uh, about. Now, once that's done, the other thing that will happen is if you go back to tables here, uh, you'll see that it'll actually show you the schema for the different tables that have been set up. So once you've set up the tables, you'll, you'll see here, if you, you can just click on any of these uh, previously um, defined metadata fields. Here's one right here. Uh, this is a CSV file that I, that I grabbed out of S3 and, and told it to find the schema. And you'll see here that it was able to get these different properties. So, you know, how many records there were, what was the average record size, uh, also, we'll show you the column names here, player, team, salary, millions, the, the data types, strings, doubles, right? So it's, again, it's able to completely introspect uh, data sources, find these data sources, put them into a catalog, and then uh, create a transformation script that allows you to modify that Python code. And then finally, uh, the last part is you can run that uh, job over and over again. So Glue is a, a great solution that really makes a lot of uh, very difficult data engineering jobs possible, uh, and it should be a part of your solution if you're going to be re running uh, reoccurring data engineering jobs on AWS. Step functions is one of the most useful and exciting technologies in the serverless ecosystem with AWS. Um, it, um, it allows you to do some things that were pretty difficult before step functions were introduced. So what is a step function? Uh, so a step function is a way to coordinate microservices or processes or steps, as the name implies, uh, that make up your overall process. Uh, now, this diagram on the screen shows a graphical representation of a step function. The AWS console actually does a great job of creating uh, these graphical representations for you. So it makes it very clear what is actually happening. So this is what a step function is. Let's, let's talk a little bit, let's go back a step and let's talk about what the problem that step functions actually solve. So as we've transitioned into serverless, microservices, lambdas in the AWS environment, uh, it's allowed us to create very concise pieces of code, and that's, that's, that's really good. We've, got, we've really gotten away from the monolith, both for application development and for data engineering, um, and there's huge advantages to that. One disadvantage is that you can have an explosion of complexity, so in this diagram, We've got seven or eight Lambda functions here. They can call each other in any order. Um, they can rely on each other for their services. They can call out to external services like S3 or DynamoDB um, to fetch data or place data. And that's great, but it can get very complicated. Um, it can become very complex. It can become very brittle, meaning that any what I mean by brittle is that any small change in any of these components can have unintended consequences on other components. So um, a break in one of these or a change to interface in one of these lambdas um, could easily have a cascading effect that's not anticipated. Uh, it's difficult, it's very difficult to debug something that looks like this, right? So, you know, you'll do things like add breadcrumbs into your logging messages so that you can try and trace um, the execution between, you know, from one lambda to another lambda. Uh, and that can be effective, um, but it's much better to have something that looks like this, if you can, where it, there's a hosted service that tells you exactly what your execution path is. So, prior to uh, step functions, um, or without, in the absence of step functions, um, there are other solutions that you can attempt, that other people attempt. Um, the first one 
that people will typically do is, is function chaining. So this one isn't really a solution. Um, it's, this, is, this is the pattern that you use without a, that does not represent a solution to this problem. So this is one lambda calls another lambda calls another lambda. And these don't necessarily even have to be lambdas. They could be um, external APIs. They could be, you know, services uh, running in, uh, in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, but the point being that each of the microservices would be calling, um, calling each other without any coordination, right? So in this case, what if the third lambda um, in this chain fails? or the fourth lambda, or the fifth lambda, how do you know? How do you handle situations like that? It's very difficult. So the next approach you might try is to uh, maintain state in a central database. So each of these lambdas is coordinated by the state in this database. So they're either polling, or there's an event mechanism where these things, um, where each lambda is operating, and the state uh, of your process is handed off, um, you know, using a database table, and this could be Dynamo or this could be relational data. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the point is that your state is maintained in the database. Uh, and again, this 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 can work, uh, but you quickly run into some of the same problems with brittleness, complexity, uh, and, and difficulty in just gaining visibility into this into this whole system. And then the other common approach uh, is to use a message bus or, or a queue like SQS, um, something like that, where, where your microservices uh, register events with an external queue. Uh, they both produce and consume um, events, um, and the process and the state moves through, um, moves through your, your larger process that way. Uh, and this, this, prior to step functions, this was probably the most, uh, most effective um, strategy for doing this. But still, when you compare to what you get out of step functions, um, this starts to look pretty unattractive. Uh, so what's the difference? So what, is, what does step functions add to this approach uh, that you wouldn't get otherwise? Uh, so step functions can enforce sequence, which you, you can get out of this. this. This will also enforce sequence. It's the only one of these things uh, that you really get out of this, is enforcing sequence. Um, step functions can run tasks in parallel. So we'll see that when we get into the demo. But you can have, if there are microservices or steps uh, that can be run in parallel, um, they, they don't, one does not depend on the other for its output, uh, then you can run those in parallel. Uh, step functions can implement branching logic. So you can have um, essentially a switch statement or an if statement within the step functions, uh, within the step function itself. You can see in, uh, in our diagram here uh, that, we actually, that we actually have that. So we have a, uh, the data format choice um, there is, is essentially a switch statement. Um, which otherwise, you know, in this case, you'd have to have a lambda that, that does just that, right? It only, it only makes that determination. Step functions give you retry functionality. So you can, with any of these tasks, you can uh, automatically configure it to, you know, have, um, you know, a retry, it has back off, it has all these kinds of things that you normally, you know, without step functions, you have to implement these things yourself. And that can be, you know, sometimes 90% of your code is defensive code, just doing things like retry, you know, retry logic, things like that, trying to figure out what to do when something goes wrong. Uh, along the same lines, um, uh, step functions has built-in try, catch, finally um, functionality. So you can handle exceptions within uh, your step function itself. So these, you don't have to implement them in lambdas or anything like that. Um, uh, these states, each of these boxes is called a state, by the way, uh, and the lines are called transitions. So each of these states or tasks can, um, can produce an error, and the error can be caught, and an action can be taken based on that error. Okay, And you can have different actions for different errors. Um, and you can decide whether to continue or whether to abort. 
Uh, and then finally, um, step functions allows for longer executions. So if you're doing, um, you know, so so for example, if you have uh, if you have a chained lambda and one lambda is has to wait for uh, another lambda return, and you have essentially embedded calls, um, so you build up a call stack with lambda. Um, there, you, you can run into timeout issues. So the maximum time for a lambda to run is uh, is 600 seconds or 10 minutes. Um, so if you have a process um, that you have to wait for, uh, a lambda is not necessarily a good a good way to do that. So if you're executing a batch job, for example, or a long um, or a long ETL job, right? So you're doing a big data transform. Um, you need something to coordinate that, and, and step functions can do it. Step functions can run for up to a year, um, which I have never seen a reason for something to run for a year, but it would be really interesting, and you certainly can't do that with something like Lambda. So let's talk about how we actually configure a step function. Uh, step functions are configured using something called uh, AWS states language. So you'll find um, we call this states language because the thing that's actually executed in a step function is called a state machine, uh, which is a concept in computer science that you really don't need to know anything about to, um, to use step functions effectively. Uh, so there seems to be some confusion from the AWS product team about whether, to, whether they wanted to call these things um, state machines or, or step functions. So the product is named step functions, but the language is called states language, and the, um, the, 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 the task nodes are called states. Okay, so the states, the states uh, represent the, the boxes in the graph and the lines represent the transition. So we'll, we'll go through how one of these things is actually structured. So the AWS states language itself is, uh, is a dialect of JSON. It's a, it's a domain specific language which uh, describes a state machine or a step function. Uh, and the structure the minimal structure looks like this figure below. Um, so we have uh, a comment, it's totally optional. S the start at field is uh, a required field. So this contains the name of a state that you'll see in the states section. Okay, so you see below start at, we see states. And then the only state in this particular function is a hello world, and the type is pass. We'll talk about types in a minute. Um, and then uh, result is an attribute of, of the pass type. And then the end is telling us that this is the last state um, in the step function. Uh, so each state has to have either an end, um, a fail, a succeed, or a next state. So the states can pass data between the states uh, using a shared JSON data structure. Um, this data structure can be referenced from within each of the states, and we'll see this in the demo in the next section. And you can use JSON path to do to select parts of the JSON for input and output. You can use the JSON path to do some simple uh, path extraction, and you can inject um, uh, JSON snippets into the data structure as it passes from one state to the next. There are a number of different states available. So these are the state types that you'll see. A pass simply passes its input to its output. Um, you would typically use these for debugging. Um, each pass state will, will log out so you can see the state 
uh, as it transitions through this. Uh, you, you can potentially do some, um, some minor transforms within a pass, uh, but typically those are done within a lambda, but occasionally they'll be done in a pass. Uh, a wait state uh, simply waits either for a fixed um, number of seconds or until uh, a certain clock time. Uh, weights um, are used for uh, polling patterns typically. Um, since they introduced, uh, since state functions introduced um, um, call the callback pattern and the synchronous pattern, wait states uh, are used much less frequently. And we'll talk about um, we'll talk about those patterns in lesson eight. Uh, succeed state is simply uh, mark the execution as successful. A fail state marks the execution as failed. Um, and then the next three are the are the bread and butter of, of step functions. So a choice state um, is, a, is a branching statement. So you can choose, um, based on the contents of the input to the state, you can choose which path to follow or which transition to make. Uh, a parallel is a grouping of tasks um, or other states. Um, that can be executed um, without dependency up on, on, on each other. Okay, and then a task is probably the main state um, that, that you'll be using. And so, it, so a task is uh, something that is actually executed, and that is typically a lambda, but it can also be, uh, there are also some other integrations. Uh, and again, we'll talk about those in lesson eight. Um, or it can also be um, executed on your own infrastructure, and we'll we'll take a look at that in in in, in lesson eight as well. And then transitions. So transitions, when we saw the the graphical representation of uh, of the step functions, the transitions are uh, the lines that that connect these things, uh, and these are defined with the next keyword in in the states language. So we'll we'll take a look at that as well. Uh, and then before we move into the demo, let's talk a little bit about um, how the pricing works. I always like to talk about pricing when we're talking about AWS services. Step functions themselves are very, very inexpensive. Uh, they're billed per transition. Um, so each time you transition from one state into the next state, um, that's, that's a billable event. Uh, you get 4,000 transitions per month in the free tier, so the first 4,000 times you transition. Um, and then after that, it's two and a half cents per 1,000 transitions. Um, but the important thing is that this is for the step function itself. This does not include your Lambda execution or your other integrations. So um, be aware of that. Any Lambda execution time is billed as Lambda execution time. So it's not included in the step function. Uh, and then one final note, uh, there are a number of limits um, on step functions uh, that are not hit very often. Um, so like I mentioned before, a step function can run for up to a year. You can define 10,000 step functions in your account. Um, there's some limit to concurrency, but I think it's 10,000 concurrent or something like that. This is the limit that you need to be aware of. The data structure that you're passing from state to state can only be 32 KB. Okay, so you'll see in the demo that we add um, we add nodes to the JSON data structure as it as it moves through all the transitions. Um, so this is something that you really need to be aware of. Um, and the advice that AWS gives is to use uh, is to use S3 for larger data structures. So rather than Rather than passing, you know, a very large data blob um, between your states, um, you just pass the S3 path and then uh, and then and then fetch that uh, in each of your lambdas along the way. Now we're going to walk through setting up um, a step function. Uh, to process data uh, entered into an S3 bucket. 
using step functions and lambdas. So uh, this is um, an overview of very simple architecture. So um, on the left-hand side, you have an input bucket. This would be where data files are placed, and we're going to handle uh, JSON, XML, and CSV data files. Um, and then we have CloudWatch. So we need CloudWatch here because um, it's currently not possible to directly invoke a step function from, uh, from a, an S3 event. So either we need CloudWatch here or we would need a Lambda before the step function. Um, it's easier to set up CloudWatch to do this, so we're going to do that. And then we'll, that'll forward the event to the step function, which in turn will forward events to um, the various Lambdas. So we'll start with CloudWatch. Um, so CloudWatch allows us to create um, event handlers or rules for things that take place in the AWS platform. Um, we can either use an event pattern or a schedule, which is like a cron job. And we're looking for S3 events. We want object level operations. So we're looking for new objects being created, specific operations, uh, complete multi-part upload is what um, the CLI or the web interface uses. Um, so we'll use that one, and then we'll use put object. So this should detect any time a new object uh, arrives. Um, we only want to scope this to our single bucket. So this is... Step examples, and then we add a target, okay? So we don't want a lambda function. We want step function state machine. And we're calling our state machine process data. Um, we're going to take the input as the matched event. So this is going to send the entire JSON payload uh, from S3, from the S3 event, right into our step function. Um, if we wanted to, we could uh, match on JSON path, or we could um, we can use a, a template to do some inline transformation of the data. But we're just going to take the entire event. So we can create a role for this. Um, it's basically going to give um, the CloudWatch service permissions to to invoke our step function. Um, and if we wanted to, we could add another target. Um, so that you can have multiple events, you can have multiple targets for a single event. We just want our state machine. We'll configure details, um, and we just give this a name. Okay, um, it can be anything that is meaningful to you, and then um, it's good to give them a meaningful description. So. and we create the rule. Okay. Um, so now we've done that, so we're going to want to go to our, okay, so we'll go to the step functions console and we'll select create new state machine. And remember, sometimes these are called state machines, sometimes they're called step functions. Um, and we can select author with code snippets. Uh, they also have sample projects or templates that you can start with. Um, and we're calling this process data, and you can see that they have a hello world for us, but we're going to put our own code in here, okay? And so you can see that this has, um, this is a, a little bit more robust than just hello world. This represents, um, this represents an ETL process. Um, a very simple ETL process where we are detecting the format of our data and then we're choosing a branch based on that data and then we're processing the data. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the ASL or Amazon States language that makes this up. So we have our, we have our start at, so we, this is a required field. It tells, it tells the state machine what its entry point is. So we have um, extract format. So basically what we're doing here is we're taking the S3 event and we're reading the JSON data structure and we're going to figure out whether it's XML or JSON or CSV or something else. 
So this, so the type is a task, and a task can be, it's, it's very often a lambda, but it can also be um, some of the other integrations that we're going to talk about uh, in the next lesson. Um, so we're invoking a lambda, and we tell it the function name and a payload, um, and then we're going to give it an input. Okay, these parameters show up as the in the event of the lambda. So the input and the state. Um, the input, we're giving an adjacent path of just dollar sign, which means take, uh, take the entire input and, send, and put it in this input field and send it to the lambda. And then the state, so this double dollar sign indicates the context object, okay? In state machines, the context object is information that's passed to your state machine about the state machine itself, okay? So you get things like execution ID, name of the state machine, um, uh, the, the, there's a token that gets passed in there to identify uh, the execution that, that we'll use in some of the integrations in the next lesson. Um, and it gives you the name of the currently executing state. So we're passing that. Um, we're passing that into our lambda, and uh, when we look at the lambda, you'll see you'll see why we need that. Um, the the result path. So what this this is telling step functions to take the result of this lambda and append it to the input at this point. So this is going to add a node to the JSON called data format, and it's going to stick the output of this lambda function into that. Um, and then uh, there's optional timeout information. Um, this, if you have a good idea how long your, your, your function will normally take, it's a good idea to put this in there just in case there's something wrong. And then we have a next field. So tasks always have to define a next field. And so um, this defines the transition. So these arrows represent transitions. So there's only one possible next for this, which is uh, data format choice. Uh, so the data format choice is a type. Remember we talked about the different types of, uh, of states? So uh, the choice is um, it's, it's similar to a, um, a switch statement or it's a, it's a branching function. So uh, it, it can decide which path to take based on the data in the input. So in, the, in, a, in a choice type, you define an array of choices. So this, this defines all the next possible steps. So we have, each one has a variable. So this is, gonna, this is going to use the data at this path of the input. Now you remember data format is where we stuck the output of this lambda. So we're actually looking at the output of the previous lambda to decide what to do here, okay? And then this, so it's got a variable, and then it's got an operator. We're using the strings equals operator. Um, there are a number of operators. Um, there's some numeric operators, and there are some, a few string operators. String equals, string not equals, string greater than. Um, uh, so basically, what this is saying is that if the data at this node in the JSON equals .xml, then our next step is going to be convert XML. So that's here. Okay, same thing for JSON. If it's if that if that variable is JSON, then we're going to go to the convert JSON. Uh, and if it's CSV, then we're going to skip the conversion step because we want our data in CSV format. Okay, and then a choice can also have a default. So if none of these things match, then we're going to go to unknown data format, which you can see over here. Okay? Now, each of these convert steps is represented by, um, by a lambda. Okay? So you can see we have the same signature here. Input equals dollar sign, state equals double dollar sign state dot name. Okay? So we're passing the same information into all of these lambdas. Okay? Convert Convert JSON, same thing. Okay, process data, same thing. It's a lambda. And then unknown data format is of type fail. Okay, so this represents an error. So we got a data 
we got a we got a file into S3, and it's not one of the file types that we know what to do with. So what are we going to do? We're going to we're going to follow this execution path, and we're going to see that you know we we don't know what this file is. Okay, and so we're not going to proceed. We're not going to process the data because we don't know how. Okay. So that's our step function, and then um, we're going to just allow it to create an IAM role. Um, and uh, it's the easiest way to do it. It will detect what, um, what permissions it's, it needs. So we'll just call this the process data IAM role, OK? And uh, it's going to tell you what it's going to do. Uh, it's going to give invoke permissions on Lambda because um, it saw in our um, description that that's what we were going to be doing. So we'll create the state machine. And then now that's done, we can upload some data. OK, so we're putting data into the S3 bucket. This is going to be an XML file. And OK, now we can see that we have one successful execution. So if we go in to examine our machine, we'll see a list of all the executions. And we have a successful execution. And now if you keep drilling into this, OK, you can see exactly what this thing has done. OK, so these are the execution details. It succeeded. You know, it gives you some timing information. It lets you see the exact payload that was passed to this, OK? So if things are, sometimes it's hard to tell what data is being passed around. This makes it super easy. So we can see that this was what it started with, OK? Started with this. This is an S3, um, this is an S3 event. Um, we can see uh, the key is data.xml, OK? That's the file that we just uploaded. Uh, it was a put object, okay, was the um, type of event, which is one of the ones that we were that we were looking for. And then you can see the output. So this is the this is the this is the state of um, the data structure after it's been processed. So we can look at this, we can see that um, it's the same S3 event, okay, but then we're appending the data format information here, right? So this this part is actually the output from that lambda where we're where we're detecting the data. Um, okay, so that's the overview. So you can take a look at that, but it makes it even easier to debug because it gives you a graphical representation of exactly what it did, which path it followed. Um, this, this is really difficult if, you're, if you have a bunch of lambdas strung together without a, without a coordination. And then you can examine each step along the way, and you can see what each step got. So this one gets the input that we saw above, um, and it creates this, this output. But if you keep drilling down, the data structure mutates um, as, it, as it moves through the system. Okay, so you can, you can go here, you can see what your data format choice received as input. Um, you can see that it chose XML correctly. So it, it, it correctly identified that as XML, and then we went to our process data step. Okay? So this is a successful execution. Um, we can also um, see what a failure looks like. So we don't know how to handle files that are end with dot bin. So let's look at that. OK, so now we gave it garbage data. It doesn't know what to do with it. So let's look. Let's see, how it, see what it did. OK, so it extracted the format. That was successful. Um, it made a decision, right? So we chose our default path here, which is unknown data format. Uh, so we have an error, right? And this is the error that we specified in our, um, in our definition. So this is a really great, um, really great tool for visualizing what's happening in your state function. It's really, really valuable. 
um, both in debugging while you're developing and also in, in operational conditions. So it's, it's really, really handy to be able to go in here and, and, and see um, exactly what happened on any given execution. Uh, it also shows step by step um, each of the transitions, so entering, um, entering and exiting all of the states. Now let's take a look at what we're actually doing in, um, in our Lambda here. Uh, there's a couple tricks um, that I want to show you. So this, as you can see, this is, uh, this extract format is, it, it's, it's totally trivial, right? It's just looking, um, it's just looking at a key in the JSON. Um, it's essentially a one-liner. Uh, so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll create a, um, I'll create a Lambda for things like this and just call it a, a step task handler and, um, and then in the entry point, we'll just define a jump table. Okay, so this one, uh, we're working in, in, in Python here. So we just, have, um, we just have a dictionary defined that maps the state. And by state, we mean, we mean which of these boxes is currently executing, right? So when it executes this, it'll actually pass us the extract um, it'll actually pass the string extract format um, because of this. So it will pass this into the payload as the state. Okay, so now we see um, we have a little table here and this maps the strings, right? So all of these states, extract format, convert XML, convert JSON, process data, uh, these all represent these states that, that are mapped to lambdas. And then in there, we can map these to, to functions. So basically, what we're creating is a lambda with multiple entry points um, and a jump table here. And you can see that all our entry point does is it calls the function, okay, from here, from this state's data structure um, that is passed into the event um, state field, okay? and then it passes the entire event to it. So this is a, this is a task handler. So this is our, this is our extract format. Um, all we're doing is we're splitting the extension off of this thing and we're returning it in, in, in the file type. Um, and then all of our other things, all of our other tasks are mapped to this function do nothing. So this is just a no op, this is just a, a pass and we're just returning an empty data structure. Um, so you can stub these out um, like this when you're, when you're developing so that you get the interface in and then you can go through um, and proceed with, with your development. So that's just a little trick that I like to use when, you know, when you have some trivial functionality um, that needs to be handled. Um, it can be quite messy if you have, you know, dozens and dozens of lambdas. Sometimes these step functions have hundreds of nodes. Um, so being able to use a library approach like this can be, can be handy. In the last lesson, we saw the basics of AWS step functions, which is a great way to coordinate services, uh, coordinate microservices um, using Lambda. Now, since 2018, um, AWS has enabled a whole bunch of additional integrations with step functions. So Lambda is still probably the most common and most flexible, but it's great that now we can call a bunch of other services directly from step function tasks. Um, so of course we have uh, Lambda, but now we can also call batch, so AWS batch jobs, DynamoDB, we can set and get uh, database records directly from our step function. Um, uh, container services, ECS and Fargate, so we can run Docker containers directly as uh, steps in our step function. And uh, SNS and SQS, we can send messaging, we can signal other applications or we can trigger other actions um, from our step function. 
And then there's uh, the data processing and uh, ML components. Glue, which is a, an ETL service, and SageMaker, which is a managed machine learning service. So as data engineers, Glue might be particularly interesting to you. Um, glue in combination with step functions is a, is a powerful combination. Uh, probably the most powerful combination is the ECS um, and Fargate uh, type um, after, after Lambda, of course. Um, so we're going to take a look uh, in a minute here. We're going to have a demo. We're going to look at uh, a Fargate integration and a DynamoDB integration. But we need to talk a little bit about integration patterns. So each of these integrated services can support one or more of these three integration patterns. So request response is your classic API call where a step function calls into your service and expects a result uh, within a short period of time. Then uh, the other two, job and callback. So job um, will start something, will start a process that, that you're expecting to take you know, from a minute to several minutes to several hours, um, and your step function is just going to pause while it waits for that to happen. And then the third pattern is is the callback. And in that case, uh, step functions uh, invokes your service and um, sends a uh, a task token uh, along with the job specification, and then it waits until it receives that task token back. Um, in a call from, from the service. And different um, the different services that we just saw all support different integration patterns. Um, so Lambda supports request response and callback. Uh, batch report, uh, supports request response and uh, a job or synchronous execution. Uh, DynamoDB only supports request response. Um, ECS supports all three, so you can you can launch a container in any one of these modes. Uh, SNS and SQS uh, both support request response and callback types. Um, and Glue and SageMaker both support request response and job types. So you can start a you can start a Glue job and wait for it to finish and then continue, or you can start a Glue job and then just move on in the execution of your step function. And the same thing. Um, the state, same thing for SageMaker. So we're going to be um, taking a look in the next section at, uh, at demos of DynamoDB and Fargate. We saw in the previous section that AWS supports multiple integrations for step functions. So now we're going to take a look at setting up DynamoDB integration with step functions. So the easiest way to get started with a DynamoDB integration is to start with a sample project. If you haven't worked with it before, um, this is the easiest way to kind of see how all this stuff fits together. Um, so this one, Transfer Data Records, is uh, an example that uses the DynamoDB integration. We can see that it's going to create um, this, this state machine. Okay, so it's going to create a lambda to seed the table, and then it's going to loop through all these records and send SQS messages uh, for each one until it's done, and then it's going to exit on the exit condition. And we can see how that's done here. It's looking at each iteration through this table, it's looking at to see if um, the data field contains the string done. So we will just, this is going to use um, CloudFormation to deploy uh, the resources, which is going to be Lambda and a step function and an SQS queue um, and a DynamoDB table. Okay. And then we can see the state machine that it's created. You can look at the definition, and you can see that it has populated some of the dynamic fields that were present in the, in the template. 
So this has gone and created all of these resources. It, uh, it takes a few minutes when it does this. Um, and we can go and let's run through this. Let's run this, we'll execute this. Okay, we'll start an execution. This doesn't take any input, so we can just remove that. Well, it needs some input, but it doesn't do anything with it. Okay, so now this one's a little bit longer running than our other examples, so we actually see things in the in-progress state. Okay, and then you saw that all fill in. Um, let's look here. See, because we have that loop in there, this actually has uh, a lot more a lot more steps than what we see defined um, in here because it's run it's run these steps all of these steps it's run these multiple times it runs these once for every item in the database so let's look at the techniques um, let's look at how it does that okay so here is the DynamoDB get item okay so this is the table that it's getting Okay, and the message ID is it's going to get the list and it's going to get the first item from the list. Each time through, it's always going to get the first item from the list. Okay, so that's updating each time this thing changes. So each time through, it reads the next message and it sends it to SQS. Okay, you can see an example here of using a JSON path. So this is getting the list in the results and getting the first item. Okay, and then here we are putting this onto um, an SQS message queue. So uh, this can be processed by another application. And here's another example of using JSON path. This is a, um, a, an array slice. So this is getting uh, the first element of this, the first through the, actually the second through the last element of this array. Okay, so this is, a really, um, I like this example because it's 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 really it's really concise, um, and it shows uh, a really powerful mechanism. So, and you can take this, and you can you can take this pattern and use this in your own um, in your own state machines. You don't have to you don't have to use um, the template, right? You can use this as a starting point, or you can copy and paste out of this. Um, Whatever you want to do, but this is a great um, this is a great example of of using this um, this iteration technique. In this demo, we're going to take a look at the uh, Fargate ECS um, integration for step functions. This is one of the more powerful um, integrations, in my opinion, because now it allows you to run any workload um, using using containerized um, applications uh, through the ECS mechanism. So uh, this is a huge addition to the product. So let's take a look at how this works. Um, so I've updated uh, from lesson seven. We were working on an ETL process um, that was all. Uh, that was all Lambda based. Um, so I've taken that and I've updated that to be a combination of Lambdas and Fargate tasks. So now we have our, this is the same. If you haven't, if you haven't watched Lesson 7, you might want to go back and do that. But this is, this is the, the ETL pipeline that we were working on. And we've got, you know, a few Lambdas in here to, um, to do, to convert our data into, into CSV format, but then we have this process data. And so maybe that's a little bit more of a heavy process, or maybe that's written in Erlang or some, some language that's not supported in, in Lambda, or maybe it's, maybe it, maybe it takes much longer to run than a Lambda would, would run. Um, for whatever reason, you want to run this in a containerized environment. We can do that with, uh, with, with Fargate. So this is how we define that. Okay, so we've replaced our task. We had a task here before that was a Lambda. Now we have a task here that is uh, an ECS uh, run task. Okay, so that's, to do this, we, we change the resource to ECS run task. 
And we're going to run this synchronously, which means that step functions is just going to wait around until this is done. So there are a lot of parameters that you can use in a Fargate configuration. Um, this, is, uh, this is sort of a, a, a simplified version of what you may see. Um, but the required ones are uh, the launch type, uh, we're using Fargate. Uh, the cluster, we have a cluster already configured that we um, created. It takes a few minutes to create a cluster, so I did this off screen. So the cluster is, we have the ARN for the cluster, um, and then we have a task definition. Okay, so in, in the ECS console, you create these task definitions. So we're going to be using this one. Um, so we specify that in our configuration with this big, long, ugly string here. Uh, this, this big, long, ugly string, actually. Uh, and then you're required to, um, to give this a, um, a network configuration. Um, so you have to specify this subnet. So um, we have um, this subnet is configured in, in the default VPC. So we're just going to be launching this in the default VPC. And then uh, in order to pull Docker containers, you have to allow access to the internet. So either you have to enable public IP or you have to set up a NAT gateway um, or make some other accommodation. Uh, you can put an endpoint um, within your VPC. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and assign public IP for this. So we can take a look a little bit at how we set up this cluster, or how we set up the task, rather. So the task, we can set, we can give this parameters for the amount of memory, the amount of CPU, and all these parameters we can actually override within the configuration. Um, and then this, this uh, defines the, this defines the container. So we've got an entry point, um, we've got a command, Right? All of these things can be, again, these can be overridden in your configuration. You can pass in environment variables. Um, you can do a lot of stuff right from, uh, right from within the step functions definition of this. So now what we're doing is we're, we have the same pipeline. Uh, this pipeline actually starts with an S3 event. So we have an S3, we get a, an object into the bucket, we figure out what type of data we're looking at, whether it's XML or JSON or CSV or some unknown format, and we, we branch off these paths. And then we come down and we launch a, uh, a task into our ECS cluster here. So this is a pretty powerful pattern, and this can do, this can do anything. So we can just upload a file again. And now we have an execution. Okay, so it's made it all the way through and it's at our process data step. And we can go over here and we can see now that we have a task pending. And that task completed. So let's see if it succeeded or failed. Okay. See that update? Updated itself. Okay, the task succeeded, and the output from a Fargate task is this um, big data structure with uh, a lot of information about um, the container and what, um, what the ECS service itself uh, was doing. A long, awkward silence. All right, I guess it's not in there. All right, well, let's just back up a second. And we can see the output of our task is this big data structure with a whole bunch of information about what uh, the ECS service actually did for us. So uh, again, this is a super powerful integration. This is um, 
today probably the most common integration outside of Lambda that I see people using. In addition to running tasks uh, synchronously, you can also run them asynchronously by setting the, um, the task token. That, that prevents your state machine from waiting around. Um, it's, uh, it, it keeps your, your event-based architecture. So again, this is probably, uh, outside of Lambda, this is probably the most powerful uh, integration for step functions. You can add, you can give yourself a whole lot of flexibility in what you can do. Uh, the whole world seems to be moving to containers, so you can take advantage of the Docker registry, your own private registry, you can create your own Docker images, and you can execute them um, using Fargate and coordinated with, with step functions. It's a very powerful, uh, it's a very powerful pattern for, um, for data engineering. Um, you can use it to, you can run processes in R, which, you know, there's no Lambda um, runtime for R. So uh, I recommend that you take, um, take a good look at, at using Fargate with step functions. In this demo, we're going to look at using the callback pattern in AWS step functions. Uh, one of the other examples, we showed you the job or synchronous pattern. Um, callback pattern is similar. Uh, step functions will wait to receive a, a callback from a service. Um, some services only support um, the sync method, some only support the callback method and some support all three. Um, some of the services that only support the callback method are um, uh, SQS and SNS. So when you're using, when you're putting a message on a queue and you want to wait for that message to be processed and then continue your step function, um, this is how you set that up. So you create a, um, a, a task, um, and in the resource, you would do SQS send message, and then you want to put wait for the wait for task token in here, okay? And then um, you're sending your message. This is the, the parameters are the queue that you send to, uh, and the message body. So we're going to send a title, and then we're also going to send this task token, okay? So this task token is provided by the step function, and if you'll remember from lesson seven, this the double dollar sign means that this is in the context object. So this is unique to this particular execution. So each time this step function is executed, it's going to make another task token. Okay. So we're going to fire this off um, when we uh, when we get to this step. We're going to we're going to fire off a a message into a queue, and that queue um, in turn will, um, will invoke a Lambda function, and then it's the responsibility of that Lambda function for updating um, the step function service when it's done. So we can take a look at, um, at the queue that we're sending to. Okay, so this is our callback queue, uh, and we have a Lambda trigger set up for this. So all the messages coming into this um, are going to go ahead and trigger our upstream Lambda. And then we can see in our Lambda, this, this Lambda happened to, uh, happens to be in Node.js um, rather than Python. Um, but we can see that what we're getting here is we're getting the task token passed in as part of the event, okay? So um, the event, we get that task token, so now it's been passed from uh, step functions to SQS, and now we have it in our Lambda function. So we're going to do our processing in here, okay? So this, this represents some, some processing. We're just returning a string. Um, but then we send this <coughs> step functions send task success message, okay? So we're going to tell step functions that the... Um, that the task was successful. And you can see our, our, we're sending this params data structure. It's got an output and it's got a task token. The task token is what uh, step functions is gonna care about. So when it sees this, uh, it's going to call 
uh, send task success. Okay, so we're telling step functions that this task is successful from our Lambda. Okay, so we can go ahead and run this. And just give it some garbage data. Okay, and so we can see that went um, that went all the way through SQS. Okay, we have no exceptions. Okay, completed successfully. Okay, and we have our notify success. So this is the the output from that lambda, uh, and that's it. It's pretty simple. Um, again, that's a it's a it's a pretty powerful pattern that you can wait for um, you can wait for things to happen outside of your step function um, before continuing. Okay, in this section, we're going to talk about a relational databases in the serverless world. Um, if you've ever tried to integrate a relational database into your Lambda application, you know that it can be a challenge. So, as you know, relational databases have a lot of utility, and there are a lot of relational databases out there. Um, NoSQL, document databases, all these more modern approaches lend themselves much better to the typical request response patterns that we see in the web world. But we all know that relational databases haven't gone anywhere. And up to now, using them in the serverless world has been a big challenge for a few reasons. Uh, the first reason is networking. So if you're running your lambdas and they're exposed to the internet using API gateway or through some other front end, um, you know that it can be a challenge to give them the access they need because your database is typically connected behind a firewall inside of EPC. So that networking connection uh, can be difficult to configure and maintain. Uh, also, you may have security requirements that don't allow this, so they don't allow um, your database and your lambdas to be in the same VPC. You can connect lambda to a VPC, uh, and that may also isolate it from other services, and that can be a big challenge. Uh, and then the other problem is just with the scale of your database. So Lambda is essentially an infinitely scalable uh, infrastructure, but the database traditionally isn't. So this is either hosted with the RDS server service or Aurora, or if you're running your own database uh, on, on an EC2 instance, uh, scale can be a real challenge when you're talking about using Lambda because you may you may you may scale up very very quickly and you may scale back down to no traffic very very quickly. Um, so just the load on the database can be a big challenge. And then the other challenge is connections. So relational databases are designed to have long running, persistent, stateful connections uh, from the consumer from the application. And Lambda is designed uh, to do the opposite of that. So these are very short running, uh, could be single request. And uh, so the overhead of creating and tearing down those database connections can actually add quite a lot of overhead. So these are a lot of challenges. If you've ever tried to do this, uh, you know that you're just pulling your hair out the whole time and eventually you normally decide that it's just not worth it and go with DynamoDB or uh, you know, set up an ETL process to extract your data from relational data and denormalize it and put it into some other storage medium. Um, and sometimes that works fine and sometimes you really, really wish that you could access your relational data directly. So luckily, AWS has recently released some great solutions to, um, to this. So uh, AWS has released a product called uh, Aurora Serverless. And so what Aurora Serverless does is 
it takes your database engine and it decouples it from the storage. So it allows your database to scale up based on load. So it's full auto scaling um, using either MySQL engine or uh, they just released the Postgres engine for Aurora Serverless. So this really solves the, uh, the problem of scale. Okay, so the scale problem is addressed directly by Aurora Serverless. And then in conjunction with Aurora Serverless, they've released something called the Data API. So what the Data API does is this is a REST service that sits in front of your database and accepts calls via REST, so via HTTPS, and translates those into, uh, into database calls. So you're making REST calls with your SQL statement inside the REST calls, and it fully supports transaction semantics, locking semantics, so all the stuff that you expect out of a database, but it uses a stateless uh, HTTPS connection. So now you have the best of both worlds. So you can have your relational database, you can do the types of relational queries and joins, and define views, stored procedures, all the things that you're used to being able to do with your relational database. Now you can access all that data via REST calls. And so now your lambdas just have to make simple REST calls to an API endpoint. They don't have to you know, load a MySQL library and uh, create, a, create a persistent connection, and you don't have to worry about your connection pooling and all that sort of stuff. So it's a great solution. Um, and now using relational data from Lambda finally becomes a viable option. Now we're going to take a look at how to set up uh, Aurora serverless in the, using the AWS console. Uh, this is really, really easy. Um, if you've ever set up uh, an Aurora or an RDS database before, uh, this is very simple, um, very similar. You just, you just, there are just a few additional options to select here. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so we want to select Amazon Aurora, and then we can choose either MySQL or Postgres. We're going to use MySQL, and latest version 5.6 is fine. And then we select the serverless option. So this is available for any version uh, 5.6 or greater. So we'll select that and then we fill out all the normal at, uh, attributes. Um, I usually select auto generate a password and it'll give that to us. Okay, so now because we're serverless, um, we select uh, minimum and maximum instead of instance type, okay? So this we're gonna be able to scale from one CPU up to 64 CPUs and from two gigs of RAM up to 122 gigs of RAM. Um, but if you pull this down, okay, this option here will allow you to scale down to zero. So, if you have a, a very bursty application or an infrequently used application, you'll want to select this. Now, it does incur some um, startup delay. If you scale to zero and then you have requests coming in, you'll have a cold database. Uh, but um, it's usually only a few seconds. So if you are in development or if you have um, you know, a lightly used database or application, um, you can go ahead and go ahead and select this. Okay, and then we have our VPC settings. This is the same as standard Aurora. We can add it to a subnet, or we can add, uh, add it to security groups if you need to add special access. Okay, and then you can set up your parameters just like for a regular database. Uh, it's always a good idea to enable deletion protection. Wait for that. 
And you're gonna, while you're waiting for that, you're gonna wanna take your, um, your database credentials and copy these somewhere. This copies it to the clipboard. Okay, so our database is done creating. So let's review, let's take a look at what we've created. Make sure everything is as it should be. Okay, we've created our database and everything looks normal. Now we can look in here and we can see our database capacity. And we are at eight database units, which is the the minimum, if we let this sit for five minutes, um, that should scale down to zero. Once it figures out it has nothing to do, and it's idle. And we can go and modify that or do all the normal, all the normal um, database operations that you can do on using RDS or Aurora. Um, there's, there's really nothing different about this other than that it adds the, the auto scaling feature to it. We've seen how to set up um, uh, Aurora serverless and the data API. So now let's take a look at uh, actually using that API from within a Lambda function. So we're going to be working with Python. And so the first thing we need to do is import Boto3, which is the standard AWS library. One note, um, the time when I'm making this video, uh, the Boto3 that comes with Lambda um, is not up to date. And so we had to vendor in um, the most current Boto3. By the time you watch this, um, it'll probably already have been updated. But um, we did add a section on how to vendor in libraries, and we, we went through updating Boto3. So if you get some errors about uh, the client not being available, that's why. Uh, so anyway, so we import Boto3, and then the name of the service that we're gonna be using is called RDS Data. So that's the, uh, that's the data API. And then we're just using a single call. It's execute statement, and it takes a few, um, it takes a few inputs. So you need, um, the input for the secret manager secret, you need, an, you need the ARN for that. And you can get that here in secrets manager. It will um, create this automatically when you create the database. So you just go in here and you need to retrieve the ARN for that. And then you need the name of the database. So we created a database called DemoDB and populated a little bit of data in there. Uh, and then the resource ARN is, um, is the ARN for the database itself. Um, and you get that from the RDS console. So you go to your database and you select configuration and you can get that value here. The last um, parameter for this function is just SQL and you can put in any valid SQL here and, uh, and that's what's gonna get executed. Um, and so we get the response from the data service into this variable, and then we're just going to uh, return this as the as the return value of our of our lambda function. So let's take a look at the lambda itself. Uh, we've uploaded that into lambda, and you can see here that. Um, that the resource access we've added a we've added a bunch of um, a bunch of things here, and the easiest way to do that is by um, editing the role um, that you've created for your lambda. So if you have a custom role, um, you can edit that. This one lambda created for me, but we just go in here um, and we attach a policy, and the one that we want is RDS full access, which I've already added. So you can see this RDS data full access. And this, this adds not just RDS, but also um, the secrets manager and some of the other auxiliary APIs that are required. Uh, so this gives you this sort of, that, that 
that one policy sort of packages up um, all the permissions that are required here. Um, so you can see in here everything that it does. So um, data API, secrets manager, resource group tagging. Okay. So now we can see that our um, our Lambda has access permissions, and then we can just give this some test data. Successful. And let's see what it returns. Okay, so this is the body. This response, this section here, is everything that comes back from the data API. Okay, so here's the records. So we've got uh, two records. Um, this is the ID, the long value ID 1, the names Pragmatic AI Labs, ID of 2, string value of Acme Labs. So that's it. Really simple. Um, you can call, now you can call um, into your MySQL server using uh, this um, simple to use REST API. Okay, so there's one other important integration between uh, Amazon's relational database services and their serverless services uh, like, like Lambda. We already took a look at their uh, Aurora serverless offering, which is a great option for calling into your relational data from uh, Lambda or other serverless services. But there's another scenario that you might want to think about, which is that your database um, can also create events, and those events can call Lambdas. So for example, when you insert a row uh, into a relational database, you can uh, attach a trigger to that, and uh, Aurora allows you to uh, attach those triggers to Lambda functions. So in other words, if you, if you had a workflow where every time a new customer was added to a database, uh, to the customer's table in the database, then you want to uh, invoke a Lambda that maybe then invokes a step function to run through the onboarding process for a new customer. You can do that using um, Aurora database as a as an event source. Now, unfortunately, um, I just told you about how great Aurora serverless is, uh, and it is. But right now, this functionality is not available in the serverless flavor of Aurora. So you have to use uh, the standard uh, Aurora database if you need this functionality. Uh, but let's run through and see um, and see how this works. It's it's pretty powerful. So the first thing you want to do is to actually create your your lambda because you're going to need um, you're going to need the ARN for this lambda in a couple of places. So let's take a look at what we're doing here. So we just have a very simple lambda. It doesn't do anything except uh, log out uh, the event that we're sending in. So. Basically, our database is going to send in an event, and uh, we're just going to log that out so that we can so that we can look at it. Um, we have no trigger configured, and the only permission is for integration permissions is um, is to logs. But of course, you could you could put um, you could give this this lambda permission to call a step function or to write data to uh, another database or to put things in S3 or whatever you want. But we need this um, we need this this ARN to get started. So get the ARN and then the next thing you need to do is to create a um, IAM role for your database. Okay. So this role we're going to allow RDS to invoke Lambda. Okay. And we're going to allow it. This, this is allowing it to invoke any Lambda. We can limit that. Um, we can use the visual editor if we want. OK. So right now we have this um, set to all Lambda functions. Uh, but let's set it to a specific resource. Okay, so this is our SQL change handler. Okay. Okay, now if we look at
Okay, and the resource is just this one function. Okay, now we can create our database. Uh, actually, before we create a database, we need to go into the parameter groups. Okay? And you need to create a DB cluster parameter group. We've already created this. It's called custom. And you need to change one parameter. Okay? AWS default Lambda role. We need to edit this. And we need to give it the ARN of the role that we just created. Okay, so we just copy this. And we paste that in there. And we save it. Nothing has changed. I already had it in there. Um, and then we go to our, our database. Okay, so we've just created uh, a very simple. Uh, Aurora database, MySQL 5.6. Okay, database was stopped, so I need to start it. Okay, so now uh, we need to modify the database. We need to modify two parameters. Okay, so now we need to make some modifications to the database. So first, we go into the cluster setting here, and we add the I am role that we created in the previous step. So this is our invoke SQL handler. And we just add that there. Okay. And while that is modifying, we also need to go in here to the instance. And if you have more than one instance, you would have to do this to each of those. And we need to modify the instance. OK. And we need to change the DB cluster parameter group. OK. And if you remember in the previous step, we created a custom uh, with our Lambda role. So we need to enable that here. And then um, if this is set to disable, you should set this to enable IMDB authentication. and modify. OK. So all these settings, these are all the settings that are required. So now let's um, go ahead and take a look at um, enabling uh, a uh, stored procedure and a trigger in the database itself. OK, so I've already configured a connection to our database. Um, so now we're just going to go ahead and uh, create a simple customers table. So we've just got an auto increment for the ID, name, and phone fields defined. So we'll execute that. OK. Now what we want to do is create a stored procedure, okay, and we're calling this new customer event. So this is intended to fire each time a customer is entered into the database. So to do this, we create a simple stored procedure. We have one parameter in, and that's just going to be the ID of the customer. So every time we create a new customer, we're going to get the customer's ID, and then we're going to use this built-in stored procedure uh, MySQL Lambda async. And this takes two parameters. Uh, the first parameter is the ARN. So if you remember, we got the ARN. 
from our Lambda console here. And then we can just paste that in here. And then the second parameter is a payload. So we're just sending in uh, a little JSON blob here that we're creating on the fly uh, that only sends the customer ID. So the idea is that Lambda is um, notified that a new customer exists and it gets the ID of the customer and then it can turn around and query the database um, for any other information that it needs about this customer. So we can create that. Okay, then, so now we have a stored procedure created. So now we need a trigger. Okay, so we're going to create a trigger called TR new customer event. And we're going to hook that to the customer table after insert on customer. Okay, and so for each row that, um, that we insert, we're going to call our stored procedure and we're going to give it the ID of the new record that we receive. Okay, so once we add this to our database. Now we've got a trigger attached to the customer's table. So if we insert a record, okay, so that was a successful insert. Okay, so now we have a new now we have a new row, so we can say All right, so we've got two rows in there. We should see an event where uh, we get customer ID too. So let's go over to our Lambda. And we'll look at the logs for this. Okay, and you can see that we have a debug statement um, in which we received customer ID too. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what you can do with this. The, um, the, the possibilities are completely limitless. Uh, this is a great integration. So. Um, if you receive a new customer, you could run through um, a step function that we talked about in a previous lesson. Uh, you could um, put the data into a, a separate database. You could create an event in, um, you could put some uh, information into Redshift about this customer. You can literally do anything you want to just based on the fact that um, a, a record was entered into your uh, relational database. Another great service in the AWS serverless world is uh, the API Gateway. So uh, as the name implies, the API Gateway is a hosted serverless service um, that allows you to expose API endpoints to the internet or to uh, your private VPC. So this is a really great way to sort of build the interface to your application. So if you have um, a bunch of lambdas, or if you have uh, applications running in uh, Fargate or ECS, um, this is how we expose those um, for consumption. And this can be either uh, either a REST API or a WebSocket API. Setting this up is uh, really really simple. So we're going to use um, just an example API that comes with the API gateway. All the default settings are fine for this. So we want a, a REST API. We're not going to do a WebSocket in this demo, but you can you can choose that if you're interested in doing that. And we're going to use the example API. So this just uses the Swagger Pet Store um, API if you've ever looked at Swagger before. And um, the endpoint we're going to use is regional. So this means that it's um, going to be exposed to the internet. Uh, we could also do a private endpoint, and this would um, make this available 
uh, within our VPC, but not available to the internet. So that's a great way if you're building sort of a uh, an internal API for consumption by your own microservices, um, you can do you can do a private API. Okay, so when you start an API, this is uh, this is what you'll see. Um, these paths uh, are called resources, and these um, represent represent data items, and then you can see the methods that can operate on these data items below them. Okay, so here we have um, a pets resource, and we've got some um, some verbs described here, some methods described, um, and then this is a, um, a parameterized um, resource. So this would get passed into your API um, as a set of parameters. So let's take a look at how these things are set up. So each of these things, each of these verbs has a separate integration. So this is the integration and it's an HTTP type. What that means is that it's going to fetch uh, data from this from the URL here, uh, and then it's going to return it uh, through the client. It has a great little test feature. Okay, and we can see what happened here. Okay, so this returns some data, and that's what that looks like. Options. Okay, this is a mock. So this means that uh, the API gateway itself is responsible for returning this. There's no integration, so there's no Lambda behind this. There's no, um, it's not backed by a different kind of uh, web service or anything like that. It's just entirely handled by API gateway. So if we take a look at this, we should see it. So this is setting um, the course headers for us. Okay. so. Uh, access control allow origin. Uh, this is for uh, cross origin access. That's a pretty standard thing to put in to, um, into options. Okay, and a post. Again, this is a pass through to HTTP. So it's just going to call this demo API for us. And then here, um, this would be a query to retrieve. Um, retrieve a pet by ID. So we get a record, we, we include the ID in the URL path, um, and then it, uh, it, it would return data from this, from this API. Uh, so that's the, that's the structure of a REST API as, as seen in the, um, in the API gateway. We're going to continue going through some of these features, and we're going to come back to this and uh, see how to integrate this with Lambda. Okay, so API stages. So this is where you would see things like um, uh, dev, um, v1, production, things like that. So different stages of development. And we create these by deploying the API. Okay, so this API is not available um, for use yet until we deploy it. So we can create a stage here, and we'll call it dev. Okay, so now you can see here in stages we have one um, we have one that's called dev. Okay, and a stage represents um, the state of the API at the time that it's deployed, and you can have up to ten stages. Um, so normally you'd have uh, a dev stage, maybe staging, and then one or more production stages. Um, and a lot of times those are versioned with with a, a string like uh, like v1, v2. Um, something like that. Um, you can have up to 10 stages here. So sometimes we map these to um, Git branches, but that's it's limited because you can only have 10 of those. So um, if there's a lot of developers on the project, that can get a little bit um, tedious. And then this gives you the um, this gives you the the URL to actually invoke this API. So we should be able to do a get against this. So. This is actually returning from our, um, our our test API, so that's public. There's no restrictions on that. Anybody could get to that right now. Um, we'll talk about um, authenticating these APIs in another lesson. 
Um, so for right now, these APIs are open to the world. So you should be aware of that um, as you go through this. If you have any, um, if you're doing some development and you develop something that you need to keep secured, um, be sure and watch that section before you move forward with that. So um, there are certain per stage um, settings that we can do. We can set up logging. We can set up variables. These are are passed into the um, into the call as headers. So your handler for this, whether it's a Lambda or some other service, um, can, can tell which stage it was invoked from. And that's useful if you need to make decisions based on that. So if you if you're invoked from, um, say, a beta branch or something like that, you may enable beta features. Um, if you're invoked from, you know, production, you may only, you know, um, enable production features, something like that. Uh, SDK generation. So we saw um, you can call these APIs from various different languages, um, and this will this will create SDKs for you. So this is a this is a JavaScript SDK. Um, if we open this up, um, we can see that this has created um, SDK files. So this will have endpoints. The endpoints that we defined in our API um, for this stage will be in here and um, you can use that in your in your website or application, and uh, they provide a number of these: so Ruby, um, Java, iOS, and Android. Uh, you can export um, your API definition as Swagger. Um, Swagger is a um, is a uh, API definition language, so it's a way, it's a standard way of describing an API. Open API 3 is um, the next generation of Swagger. Uh, it's still based on the same um, basic principles which um, describe uh, an API. So it describes all the methods um, and it's a, it's a great way you can, you can actually build um, a, a web interface using this, uh, using these exports, so that um, your users or other developers can exercise your your API, and then there's the history, and uh, Canary is um, an interesting feature. So if let's say you're deploying um, some changes to your um, to your, you've you've gone through your development, you've gone through your QA and staging. And now you're and now you're moving this into prod, but you have some new features. Um, you want to test how they're doing, so you can send, you can create a branch and send, um, you know, say 10% of the requests will go into this into this canary deployment. So that allows you to do some final stage testing um, on uh, on on new features or or changes to features. Um, the authorizers is a um, really important function. We're going to talk about that in the next lesson. Um, basically, you can add uh, authentication and authorization easily to your APIs. Uh, the gateway responses, um, these are, you can configure what the gateway does when it encounters all of these different errors, okay? So it has defaults for all of these things. Um, um, you can set uh, custom headers. And you can set a um, you can set a, a, a template for this to return. So these are basically you're giving a, um, a custom responses to to errors. And this is a templating language. Um, it will replace this with uh, the message that it receives from the API gateway. Okay, so models are data objects that um, that the API knows about. So these were, in our case, these were defined um, using the JSON Swagger document that we um, that we imported. Uh, you can also create them here. You can give it a you can give it a schema, and you can have um, 
the API gateway actually enforce this schema. So this is this is really powerful because what this means is that you're using, so you use the, the, the JSON schema language. And what that does is you can define which fields are valid for, you know, which, which types of data, for example, are valid, what the constraints on the values are. And so what this, the, the reason why this is important is because if you receive a request that doesn't meet the requirements, so that violates the schema, in other words, it never gets forwarded on to your application. So that means that you can just declare ex what the acceptable parameters are here, and then you don't have to worry about them in your code. So you don't have to worry about in your Lambda making sure that when you're expecting an integer, you have an integer, expecting you know uh, the string to be encoded correctly. You'll know that if it's past the API gateway, that it's that it meets those requirements. So that saves a whole lot of defensive coding in your lambdas. Um, this is this is a really powerful feature that I don't see a lot of people taking advantage of. Um, it's it's a fair amount of effort to get this set up and working, but it's well worth it in my opinion. Okay, so usage plans um, are a uh, they're 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 actually a global resource. So these aren't. These aren't per API. You can have multiple APIs with multiple stages, uh, but you can define um, usage plans and apply these. Uh, these can be applied to, to, uh, to any API. And this allows you per user to throttle um, API requests and also assign quotas to these. So if you have, you know, developers, um, you know, maybe maybe your default basic plan only allows, you know, say 10,000 requests a day, but your advanced plan offers 100,000 requests a day, and you let them burst to 120,000, and you want to allow a million requests. Uh, per day for customers that are assigned that. So let's say that's our, okay, we're going to do that for the API. Stage is going to be dev because that's the only stage we have. Okay, and then we could do this per method if we want. We're not going to do that. Okay, and then API keys. So this is how you associate um, a developer with um, with an API usage plan. So this will be for me, and we'll let it auto-generate. So this is gonna give, give me a string, and then provide this to the developer. The developer can include this string with their API requests, and then it will be signed to uh, that developer, and it will, um, they'll be subject to the, the quotas and limits. Uh, custom domain names. So this is um, this is an important one. So it's very simple to set up your own domain here. Okay. Uh, we have to have a certificate. We haven't configured a certificate yet, so we're not going to be able to do this. Um, but basically, this allows your um, your API to reside under your own domain, which is probably something that you would want to do for your production environment. And then finally, these settings. This is actually um, a pretty important one here is uh, the CloudWatch log ARN. So if you want the API gateway to write logs to CloudWatch, which um, I highly encourage you to do, then you need to create an IAM policy um, and attach it to a role and um, put the role um, here So we can just create a, a simple role. Okay, API Gateway is gonna use it. Okay.
And then we need the ARN of that. And we'll just paste that in there. Now this will allow the API gateway itself um, to write logs to, uh, to CloudWatch. So in addition to that, um, usually you would allow your, your lambdas um, your lambdas to log as well, but it's great to be able to see the API gateway itself because sometimes there are errors between API gateway and lambda, for example. Now that we've seen how to configure the API gateway itself, let's move on to integrating uh, a Lambda with the API gateway. So how do, we, how do we attach these methods to our own Lambdas? If you remember, uh, when we imported this, it uses um, a, a, a HTTP pass-through. So this is, this is sending off to another um, API to get its data, but Usually what we want to do is we want to handle this in our own Lambda, right? So, so this is what you want, to, you want to select Lambda proxy integration. So what this does is it bundles the request into the um, event parameter that's passed to your Lambda. Okay. Select a region and is it East 2? Nope. East one, okay. And then um, we have a Lambda set up. I believe it's called API Handler. Yep, so we'll use that. Uh, default timeout is fine. Uh, 29,000 milliseconds, should be plenty of time. And we're not using any of these, um, but we can, uh, we can add path parameters and we can add query string parameters to this, okay? So this is, if you need inputs, if your API was accepting any inputs, this is a um, this is a get on sort of a root object. So usually, um, usually what this would do is return, um, would return a list of, uh, of, of objects, okay? Okay, okay, so we're giving uh, permissions on our Lambda. Okay. So that's done. So let's go back and look at the Lambda that we set up here. Okay. So you can see that we have the API gateway set as a Lambda trigger now. So API gateway, when I created that integration, it went ahead and modified our Lambda um, to add this as a trigger. Okay, so we can look at what it did here. So it's added the method get um, with that path that we just configured. Um, so this, this path now has permission to trigger um, our, uh, our API handler. Then if we look at our code, okay, we can see that we are simply receiving an event. We're not doing anything with it. Um, and, then, and then we are returning some data with a 200. So we got a status code and a body. Um, so let's see if we can invoke this. Now, we've made a change. So we have to deploy the API again. So. Okay, so I don't know if you had a chance to read that, but what that told us is that we were um, releasing this to Canary. So that means that only, uh, actually only 0% is gonna get that. So that would not be effective. So we're gonna go ahead and promote our Canary um, to this stage. And now we can See what this does. Okay. All right, that did not invoke our Lambda. So let's find out why. Okay. Okay.
Let's delete our canary. Okay, so now we can see that this has gone through to our Lambda. And we can go to CloudWatch. And we should have um, API Gateway itself creating entries. and also Lambda. Okay, API Gateway, okay. Okay, so we can see that CloudWatch logs are enabled for API Gateway. And then our API Handler, I don't know if we had any logging statements in there, but we should be able to see um, a start and end, and it just gives you a little bit of information um, about the about the actual run. Okay, so that is how to integrate a GET with um, with API Gateway and Lambda. But let's see what happens if we have other methods. Okay. Let's see what, what happens in a post. Okay, we'll do the same thing. Okay, this time we'll take some parameters. Okay. Is this? Okay, so for the post, we're going to accept a name field and we're going to pass this in to our request using the query string, and the field's going to be named name. Okay, what is wrong with that? Oh, does it not like it because it's called name? Backing up again. Okay, so um, for this post method, we're going to be creating a pet. So we will have a parameter called pet name. And this is going to be a query string parameter. And we're going to call it pet name, pet underscore name. Okay, so again, we're giving a permission to our Lambda here. It warns us about that. And let's take a look. So now we have um, two methods enabled. So we have permission for these either of these methods 
they're both going to invoke the same lambda. Now, you can map your all of your CRUD operations to separate lambdas, or you can map them to the same lambda. And it all depends on your situation and how complex these um, these the situations are. Um, and there are frameworks out there that will unwrap these things for you and, and sort of handle a lot of this stuff for you. I prefer to keep my lambdas relatively small and simple. Uh, I don't typically use a framework. Um, I use, uh, I just write Python using the Lambda API directly, which just means I get an event in a context. So I don't get, I don't get a bundled request object or anything like that. Um, so let's take a look at the payload that we're actually getting in the event, because this is what this is what allows us to make decisions on on you know which which method we're actually handling. So let's take a look at that, and we'll just use we'll just use logging to do that. Okay, so we're just going to add some simple logging here so we can um, see what, what is actually being passed in from the API gateway. So let's just log out our event and our context. Okay, so we're just logging out um, our event and context here so we can take a look, we can examine those a little bit um, using CloudWatch. Okay, so now we can uh, take a look at the actual request that came in, and we should be able to find out the 
method that we're dealing with. Okay, so this was a get, all right? So what we're going to want to look at is the HTTP method in, in, um, in the event. Okay, so now we can just do this. We can say um, we'll just call this handlers. So we're creating a little jump table here, okay? And then what we want to do is call and we want to pass the event, okay? And then now we just have to create these functions. Shift key isn't working. And then another one um, for post. And now in this event, um, in the handle post, this is where you would do, if you needed to do any verification, um, you would do that here, or you could um, you know, this is where you would, there's where you would actually persist this um, to a database um, or put it in a cache or something like that. Okay, we'll save that, and now um, okay. So what we need to do is create a test event, okay, and we'll make sure that it has this, and that it's the value that we expect. Do a quick test with it here. Nope, not green. Okay. Oh, forgot a comma. Okay, now it's green. So let's try it from the API gateway. Oops, got a 500. Let's find out um, why we got that error. I think it's because um, our response isn't formatted correctly, but let's find out. Okay, and let's see. I think. This should just be status. Still no, huh? Okay. 
Let's make sure that we have logging enabled in our stage. Okay. Uh, let's do info. Okay, so this is this is allowing us to get logs from the API gateway itself. And I suspect that what the problem is is that it doesn't like um, the format that I'm returning. So let's take a look. Okay, API gateway. Okay, so this is, um, as I suspected, um, it doesn't like our, our response. So let's see what's that supposed to look like. Ah, status code, no underscore, camel case, okay. So this is the format um, that the API gateway uh, is expecting to see uh, returned. So status code, body, and you can add um, headers in here, in here as well. Um, and now, So we hit the get endpoint. It was able to successfully determine that that was a get and not a post. Um, you can do, of course, you could do um, you could just do a generic handle request if you wanted. Map both methods onto that. And then, okay. Uh, so now in this case, um, we just have a generic request handler and inside the handler it's going to decide whether it's a um, whether it's a post or a get okay figured out that was a get and we should do the same thing okay so that shows you a little bit about how to do the lambda integration with api gateway uh, and then of course within this lambda you can do you can do anything you can, um, you know, typically you would you would persist to a database or um, fetch from a database, or you may fetch from S3 or something like that. Uh, anyway, that is uh, that's Lambda integration with the API gateway. In this lesson, we're going to look at uh, Amazon Cognito, which is Amazon's serverless hosted authentication service. So Cognito makes it dead simple to add OAuth to authentication to your application. You can tie this into API Gateway. You can call it from a iOS app, an Android app, or a web interface. It's super simple to set up. So let's get going. Okay, so to set up Cognito, we set up what's called a user pool. Um, a user pool is exactly what it sounds like. It's a pool um, of, of users that you can use to authenticate against an application. 
So all we have to do is give it a name to get started. Call it demo pool. We're just going to accept all the defaults here, and then we're going to go through and configure these. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is check our password, uh, our password requirements. Okay, uh, so these are the standard eight characters, some complexity requirements. Normally, you can leave those as they are. It's up to you if you want to change these. Uh, this section allows you to. Uh, configure whether or not users can sign themselves up. We're going to leave this um, as the default, which is yes, users can sign themselves up. Um, but depending on your application, you may have administrators that are creating accounts for your users. And then temporary password settings. Uh, you can set up MFA, okay? So MFA is, is multi-factor authentication. So basically, uh, this um, can send your users a text message with a one-time code. You've seen it on services like PayPal or Gmail, things like that. Okay, we don't need advanced security features. Um, these are the um, yeah, email messages. So when you create a new account, it sends out emails. You can customize those messages here if you want to. We're not going to do that. It's all pretty simple, straightforward to set up. Um, you can do that if you're using Cognito in production and you want to really you know, put your brand message in there. You can do that. Okay, app clients. Um, this is an important thing to set up. This is this is really where um, you start the real configuration to integrate Cognito into your application. Um, so an app client is something like a web interface would be one web web would be one uh, app client. Um, an iOS app would be another app client. An Android uh, an Android app would be another. So it's 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 sort of um, things like that. If you have a if you had a desktop, you know, um, thick client application, then that would be a, then that would be an app. Um, but we'll just call this demo app. Okay, and then we'll just leave this um, all these defaults for right now. Okay, and then we'll come down here to. App client settings. Okay, identity providers. Right now, it's just the user pool, so we're doing that. With that's all we have right now, and we'll talk uh, a little bit later about um, about other identity providers. But in this section, we're just going to use the built-in Cognito user pool. And for uh, testing and development purposes, we can set these to localhost, and it'll pop a warning up there telling us. Um, that uh, localhost should be used only for uh, testing and development. And we'll give it a log out URL. Okay, and we want to select, we're going to be using a, 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 a web interface here, so we want to select implicit grant for this. Um, and we can allow all these OAuth scopes. Okay, and then the other thing that you have to set is a domain name. Now, in a production environment, um, you would most likely be using your own domain. We don't have a domain set up right now. But in most cases, this is what you'll be using. Um, here, you can use one that, that uses um, an AWS URL. And this has to be unique among all um, uh, Cognito user pools, not just the ones in your own, um, in your own application. So we'll call this and we'll just give it some numbers there to make sure it's unique. Okay, it's available. Okay, so that is all you absolutely need to set up to get started. There's lots and lots of things in here that you can um, that you can Customize. We're not going to go through any of that right now. They're not required to get started. This is this is your basics of getting started with a Cognito user pool. Um, and now we'll show you how to actually um, authenticate a user. So you need a few pieces of information that you set up. Okay, 
you need you need this you need this URL and you need uh, the app client ID and you also need the callback URL so we can use um, a tool like um, like postman to set this up Okay, so within, within Postman, um, they've got a nice little UI for setting up um, requests to uh, authorization. So uh, in the authorization tab within a request, select OAuth 2.0, and then select Get New Access Token. And then here is where um, we put in all those settings that we just put into Cognito. So we're going to do a, an implicit flow. Okay, we've already got our URL here. Okay, this is not the correct URL yet, so we need to get that from here. And then we need the client secret, uh, app ID. Okay, so we got an error. Let's take a look at it. Okay, redirect mismatch. What does that mean? That means that this is incorrect. So let's take a look. Oh, we called it sign in in this one. Okay, that's okay. And then that brings us to um, that brings us to the the sign in screen, and so this is actually a, the AWS Cognito service, and it builds this UI for us. You can actually customize this UI, put in your your branding um, in here, um, and because we uh, allowed it, we can sign up. And you see it gives us um, a little password meter here to see if we've met our, the complexity requirements. It does all this for you. You don't have to do any of it. It's great. This is the, this is the kind of stuff that burns a lot of application development time. And uh, AWS has it in a completely serverless service here. Uh, so we sign up. Okay. And uh, we had it configured to send verification codes in email. Okay, so uh, this gave me the, uh, an access token. This is what uh, this is what you send along with a request um, to. Uh, to prove that you've authenticated yourself. And you can look at one of these. This is what's called a uh, JavaScript web token, JWT. Uh, you can decode these. Um, this site is a really handy way, jwt.io. It's a really handy way to look at these things. You can just paste them into their debugger. And it tells you um, everything that is um, 
encoded in that in that in that token and this is this token gets passed in with each each web request so you can see that it's got my my username there uh, now we can go back to our user pool and refresh this and you can see that uh, there's an account created it's enabled um, it's confirmed emails verified and this accounts uh, this accounts ready to go Okay, so now we have a user pool created. Um, so we're able to authenticate users, but now let's configure access control for our, our API that we defined in the API gateway. So now we've got users, they've got web tokens, we know who they are, so let's make sure that only authenticated users can hit some of our API, uh, API endpoints. So this is an API that we created in the um, API Gateway lesson. Now we're going to be extending its functionality to, um, to require authentication. Now, so if you'll recall, we have uh, a bunch of resources, and the resources have methods. And you can configure uh, authentication on a per-method basis. So you may want your top-level get to be um, open to the world. And you may want, um, you know, uh, certain resources protected and others not protected, uh, and we can do all that using authorizers. Okay. So to create an authorizer, so we're going to call this uh, our pets authorizer because it's for our pet store API. This is a Cognito authorizer. Sorry, and then, okay. We, the one we just created is called demo pool, so we're gonna use that. Okay, and then we tell it which header we're gonna expect um, the uh, authorization token in. The standard is to use a header called authorization. Okay, and now we can test that. So we, um, in the last section, we created this, we, we fetched this token. So we're going to grab the ID token, and we can paste it here. And the response code is 200, which means success. Um, this, is the, this is the JWT decoded, just like we saw in the last one. Um, you can simulate a failure just by changing anything in this token. And now it's 401. It's unauthorized. Somebody has tried to access this token, or author, authorize access a resource um, with a bad token. 401. Um, okay, so that's that's the authorizer, and now we apply that to methods. Okay, so here you can see the method request authorization is none. All right, and so we just go in here. Now that we have an authorizer configured. Now that we have an authorizer configured, we can edit this. And we have pets auth, which is the authorizer um, that we just created. So we'll place that there. And you have to save it right here, update that setting. And then you have to deploy your API. Okay, so now this API is going to require Okay, so that's the root level. That one we did not require authorization. And the pets endpoint, do we get? Oop, unauthorized. Okay. So what do we need to do to authorize that request? We need to go back and get our JWT. Now, unfortunately, there's a conflict between uh, the way Postman handles um, authorizing requests and what um, API Gateway is uh, expecting. So there's an open bug for Postman for this, but we can do it with uh, the curl command instead.
So let's create an environment variable. And we'll just paste that token in there. And now So what this command does is fetches this URL and sends the authorization token um, in, in the header. So the, the minus H here um, tells it to send that, that value as a header. And now we get the get response, which is uh, the full response from our API endpoint. So you can see if we remove or alter the authorization information that um, we should get that um, unauthorized error message from the gateway. Okay, so no token, unauthorized, send that token and we get a valid response. Okay, so we've already seen how to create a Cognito user pool uh, that has its own database of users. You can see in our pool that we have a user um, that was created through self sign up. Um, but there's another really powerful feature here, which is uh, which is federated identity, or also sometimes called social logon. So this is where you can allow your users to come in using their logins from other providers like Facebook, Google, Amazon, and OpenID. Um, or even from their enterprise applications like um, Active Directory using integrations like SAML. Uh, so I'm just going to go through and show you how to set up um, Google authentication. So if you have users that are, you know, Gmail users, um, they can use those accounts. So if we look in here, we can see there's a couple of settings that are required. Uh, Google App ID, an app secret and the authorized scopes. So I'll show you how to get um, these two values. Um, to get those, you have to have a Google, um, a Google Cloud account. And from within that Google Cloud account, you just go to APIs and Services, and then Credentials, and you select Create Credential. And you want an OAuth client ID. Okay, and we're going to be using um, this, this pool, this application that we're doing is a web application, but as you can see, you can also do um, iOS, Android, and Chrome apps. So we'll just call this our demo app. And um, for the origins, we use the domain name here. And then, okay, and then in the authorized uh, redirect URI, you have to put in that same URL, but with slash OAuth2 slash ID response. Got white space in here, okay. This was just an artifact from my cut and paste. Okay, and so then that produces a client ID and a client secret that we need to configure the user pool. So we give it that app ID. Secret. 
And then uh, the scopes um, are exactly what they have here, but you do have to type it in. Okay, so now we have Google enabled as an identity provider, and we have to do a couple more things. So we go into the attribute mapping, and here is where we map the data that we get from Google onto our Cognito users. So most of these translate um, just one-to-one. -one. And we are getting phone numbers, so let's do that. Okay, and then there's one more thing we need to do to enable this. So we need to go back to app client settings, and then now we have a new identity provider. Uh, so we need to go and enable that, okay? So we're just adding Google and keeping Cognito user pools. Now we should be able to request a token. And now we have Google available as a sign-in provider. Okay. So I was already signed into Google, and so it just went ahead and did that authentication silently um, and issued these tokens. Now let's talk about using DynamoDB for data engineering. DynamoDB is a key value document store. Um, it has built-in security, backup, restore, and caching, and, and can handle uh, huge amounts of requests, uh, uh, 10 trillion requests per day and peaks of more than 20 million requests per second. It's a fully managed uh, AWS service. Uh, they take care of scaling and security, so it's a really great service. Let's talk about what it means to be a key value store, though. Because it's a key value document store, the data is in a document, uh, and it can be accessed if you have a key. It's highly efficient uh, if you have the key. The lookups are um, almost immediate. So you have a key, you can get your document very quickly. Um, but where this is different from, say, a SQL database is if you don't know the exact key and you want to get some document based on the contents of the document, it loses its efficiency quickly, especially if you have a very large amount of data because it has to go through all the documents trying to figure out what to return. So you want to avoid this situation when you design a keyless, uh, or rather a NoSQL database schema. It's a different approach than with a SQL-based uh, schema. In a SQL-based schema, you model the classes or objects uh, as tables and then their connections. And you don't have to think as much about what questions are being asked beforehand. With a NoSQL database, it's really important um, and, and ideal to determine what questions you're going to ask before you design the schema, because then you can design a schema that reacts to the questions. So uh, for example, let's say that you have a company that does surveys. Uh, it has clients, and each client uh, has a number of surveys, and each survey a number of questions and each question a number of responses. The way we would model this in a SQL database would be to have a client table, a survey table, a questions table, and response table, that type of thing. Um, that's not really how you do it in DynamoDB. You could do it that way uh, and have separate tables, but it would become very efficient uh, as soon as your data became large. So we want to think about it a different way. So if our questions are uh, given a client, give me their surveys, that's question one. Given a survey, give me its questions, that's question two. And given a question, give me its responses, then we'd think about modeling it um, based on that. So let's look at what that might look like. So here we have some data modeled out. Um, the key in Dynamo can be made up of um, two subkeys, and that's what we're doing here. So we have partition and sort. Um, by using these two keys together, we can model this kind of data situation. So 
what we've done here, these are our client um, IDs, and these are our survey IDs. And what this does is allows us to, given a client, find all the surveys um, that go along with it. Notice we've also given our IDs um, prefix names. So all the clients begin with AID, all the surveys begin with SID, all the questions QID, and the responses RID. Um, the secondary key, the sort key in DynamoDB, allows you to do operations such as begins with uh, efficiently. And so using these operations, we can then create queries that question for just questions or surveys or responses based on the partition key. Let's look at what this would look like in DynamoDB. Okay, I have to find my table. Now let's look at what this would look like in a DynamoDB table. So we have a table called surveys. Uh, and we can look at the layout of the items here. And see we have our partition and sort keys. Um, the first few are these uh, ones that represent surveys. So this is the survey ID and this is the client ID. We go down and you can see this is a response to a question and it has its value as well as its ID and the question ID. So if we want to find something then using this, we can go ahead and um, grab one of the IDs. Let's, uh, why don't we look for responses to question one? So question one is QID. Um, and we want responses, so we can do all the responses that begin with RID. And start our search. And you can see we get all the responses that go to question one. So this um, enables us to do really highly efficient searches on data that's hierarchical in a um, non-SQL database, which is a really um, powerful way when you start dealing with large amounts of data to model it um, with performance in mind. Now let's talk about Amazon Athena. Amazon Athena is an interactive query service. Um, it analyzes data that's in a S3 bucket using standard SQL without having to load that data into a database or transform it. It um, uses what's called schema on read, which means that you develop a schema. Uh, the schema is not imposed on the data until you actually read the data. Um, source data formats include JSON, CSVs, and plain text, uh, and there's a number of ways you can uh, deal with it. So let's um, go to S3, and here we have an S3 bucket with uh, three CSV files. Um, of economic indicators. We can take a look at one of them. And so we can just see it has data, it has a date and data for a number of columns. So now if we go to Athena, uh, what we do is it has an idea of creating a database. Let's create a database first. So uh, using straight ahead SQL, we're calling create database on this. And so now we have our own financials database we can use. Then what we want to do is create a, a schema for the uh, schema on demand. So here's how we're creating our schema. It's a, a table. All tables are external for Athena because um, it is doing the read on demand. Uh, so here's our table name. Uh, here's the contents of the table, what it's going to do is it's going to read the CSV and assign the first column as date, second as GDPA, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on down here. We're using the Open CSV survey as the format for reading it. It has uh, other formats for JSON and plain text. Uh, we're defining that we're using a comma-separated file here, not a tab-separated, which is what it defaults to. 
Uh, and this is the location of our data in our S3 bucket. So that's the path to this bucket here. So let's go ahead and run this query. So now we have a table. Let's just peek at the top of the table. So this is straight ahead SQL again. Select from the table, and we're just going to limit to the top three. And you can see it's running these queries relatively quickly, considering that each time it runs a query, it has to analyze all the data that's there. So here's the top three rows of our table. We've got our columns, values as expected. Let's see. And also, um, we can look at our saved queries here. So there's a whole bunch of queries. Some of these are example queries that they made. Um, some of them are um, queries that uh, I've run before. So our table uh, is economic indicators. And if we wanted to know when the last year that the US had a positive um, uh, net export, um, net import exports. So the, so the exports were greater than the imports. Uh, we can do a query like this. So we're selecting everything from the table, uh, all the columns from the table, where the net export is greater than zero. Uh, we're changing the order of the date to be descending so that we'll start from the most recent and go back and limit it to 10. And here we can see that the last year that the US had a positive uh, net export was 1975, um, and before that, 73, and so forth. So, um, Athena, in terms of these queries, when you have large data, even though each query has to analyze the data, it does run them in parallel, so it can be very efficient for running multiple queries. Uh, and the cost is done by query, so it's very cost effective if you manage your queries correctly. Now let's talk about Amazon Elastic MapReduce, or EMR. Uh, EMR is a service that will run a, uh, a cluster designed for running frameworks um, for big data, such as Hadoop or Spark. Um, it, they take a lot of the management of that away from you so that you can concentrate on the problems you're trying to solve and not the cluster management. It's also very useful if you have large amounts of data and you want to move them between other Amazon services, such as DynamoDB and S3. Uh, in order to create a uh, EMR cluster, uh, you need to have a S3 bucket created. We have one provisioned already. Uh, and then you need to create a uh, EC2 key pair so that it can communicate between the nodes in the cluster uh, and the bucket and the outside world. Uh, to create an EC2 key pair, we go to the EC2 console, we go down to um, key pairs right here, and you create a key pair. Uh, we'll just call ours EMR demo. So now we have a key pair. Uh, the next step is we can actually start creating our cluster. Um, you can see, give the cluster a name. Uh, a folder where its logs will go. Now, the clusters have um, two launch modes. The first launch mode will launch a cluster that will persist until you stop it. Uh, the second launch mode, step execution, uh, will persist only while it's running the steps that you define. So it'll run through the steps, and when it's done, it will automatically terminate the cluster. Uh, and you can see here, you would select steps from some of the big uh, big data frameworks that are available, including Spark and Hive and Pig, um, or a custom jar. Uh, and this is the configuration of the uh, machines on which the cluster will run, and some security parameters. Now, if we just do a cluster that just runs, um, See, it defaults to Hadoop, but you can switch between Spark and Presto and HBase. Once again, choose the machine type. And if you want to, um, here's where we'd use our EC2 key pair, since we have one. We'll put it there. And then we can create the cluster. So it'll take a while for the cluster to start. Um, the next step, once the uh, 
cluster starts is to define its steps. So right now the step is just that it's setting itself up. Um, but you can add steps here, and once again, these are similar to the steps we saw with the self-terminating cluster, uh, different kinds of um, step types. Uh, and most of them, what they'll require you to, you to have an S3 location of the script you wish to run, the data you wish to run it on, and uh, the output location and any extra arguments you want. So that's how you set up a cluster. Um, I think if you need to run big data frameworks such as Hadoop, you're going to find that these clusters are really the way to go. They um, help you by uh, managing a lot of it and saving you some time and money. Now let's talk about Amazon EFS, or Elastic File System. Uh, EFS is a simple, scalable uh, file system for Linux-based workloads. Uh, EFS will scale up automatically or scale down as you add and delete files. Um, it can be used with Amazon Cloud Services or on-premise resources. Uh, it is secure for thousands of connections, and it supports a high throughput. Uh, EFS can support performance of over 10 gigabytes per second and up to 500,000 IOPS. Uh, with this type of capacity and performance, EFS is perfect for large data analytics jobs. Um, EFS is relatively easy to set up. Uh, in the EFS console, create an EFS file system. On your EC2 instance, install the EFS tools. Make a directory to use as a mount point. Uh, and then mount the EFS file system. Let's take a look at what this would look like. So here's the EFS console. You can see we can create a file system. We're going to go ahead and accept the uh, defaults for this. And you can see that it's creating the file system right now. And you can see here the file system ID, which we'll need for the next step. So let's go ahead and copy that. Now let's go to our EC2 instance. Here we have an EC2 instance. Uh, let's connect to it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and connect using the browser SSH. Now we're on our EC2 instance. So first we need to install the EFS tools. Oops. Actually want to install them, not uninstall them. Okay, we have the EFS tools in place. Uh, so next we want to make a directory. Oops, let's do one in the mount. We'll call it uh, EFS. And then you just mount the file system with the ID of the uh, EFS file system that you just created. And now you have access from your EC2 to use this EFS file system uh, like any normal directory uh, with all the power that it has to, um, for capacity and performance. Another serverless operation that may not be as intuitive as, as uh, uh, you would think unless you're ex it's explained to you is Amazon QuickSight. So if we go to QuickSight here, and I just uh, search for it in the console, it says that it's a fast and easy way to use uh, business analytics. And what's fascinating about QuickSight is that it is also a serverless technology and that it allows you to do business intelligence without having to uh, provision some kind of a, a dashboard server or you know, go through and um, you know, get some kind of a collection job that will build you dashboards. It's a serverless business intelligence solution. 
Uh, let's walk through step by step how you could use this in your data engineering pipeline. Uh, first, you would go to new analysis. And once you go to new analysis, you would uh, go through here and pick a data set. So you can have an existing data set, or you can go ahead and put a new data set in. We're going to select new data set. And now you can see there's many different choices. There's uh, upload a file, connect it to Salesforce. Uh, let's say you have your whole um, prospects uh, system set up there. Uh, also, we can go to S3, Athena, uh, the relational database, uh, MySQL, Redshift, Snowflake, Jira, GitHub. All right, there's a, a, a bunch of different data sources that we can uh, create automatic data visualizations on. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, upload a file here. And I can go ahead and uh, grab uh, a NBA Teams uh, data set that I've been using. Here we go. And I also can immediately see here the schema, right? So I have the team, I have the games played, the percentage, the winning total. Uh, and, and now what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to uh, put that into, uh, put that right, right into a visualization. So again, I'll, I'll fire this up here. Uh, it's able to detect the schema. Uh, now, now I'm going to uh, visualize this. And once I've visualized, once I, I select this visualization tool, um, it, it can actually immediately uh, start putting visualizations in front of me that allow me to get insights into the data. So you can see here's the sum of the clusters, but let's say I want to do a scatter plot, uh, and we are going to sc scroll through here, the fields here, and we'll have uh, medium home price will be one. Uh, and then this one on, on the other side is the, what cluster. Uh, I could take off that cluster and then maybe cha change it to medium home price and the valuation. Let's, let's see how that looks. And now I've got this great visualization that shows me that the median home price uh, is actually, you can see there's a very strong, in fact, um, it looks like you know, maybe a, a power law here of some kind where we have the valuation of uh, MBA teams and we have the home price uh, in millions. So again, this is really the power of a, of a serverless data engineering pipeline is that step by step I go through, I put some data into it, I visualize it and inspects the schema. I can then uh, go through and do my you know, ad hoc uh, exploratory data analysis. And then finally I can go in and I can share that data with other people. So I can publish a dashboard. Here we go, we'll say valuations. Uh, and once I publish this dashboard, other people inside of AWS can get access to it. So not only does the data engineering uh, pipelines in AWS uh, have serverless technology that uh, grabs the data, transforms the data, and loads it, but also it has serverless business intelligence. And you can see here uh, that uh, this is a great way to um, use that existing data pipeline that you've set up that's maybe putting data in S3 or putting it in Redshift for you, uh, and then allowing you to create these uh, business intelligence dashboards. Now that we've gone through and built all these uh, complex services, one thing that I wanted to talk about in more detail is these AI APIs and how they integrate with Lambda. Uh, so as we know, there's triggers that can initiate a Lambda function, and this is really the heart and soul of a serverless pipeline is you have a CloudWatch event, that could be a trigger. You have S3, you know, putting an item in a bucket, that could be a trigger. You have DynamoDB, uh, an insertion into a table in DynamoDB, that could be a trigger. All those things can execute Lambda, but what does that Lambda do? And that's where the AI APIs come in. Uh, if you look at uh, natural language processing operations, we have AWS Comprehend. AWS Comprehend can do sentiment analysis, entity detection. Um, it can uh, go, even go through and uh, do medical records. Uh, so it, there's all of this pre-built information that you can use without building a machine learning model yourself. Uh, recognition uh, is a computer vision API that does uh, object detection, uh, you know, filters on celebrities. Uh, it can uh, do moderation of uh, content that uh, shouldn't be shown in certain situations. So there's a lot of intelligence uh, as a serverless engineer that you can grab where you don't have to go to your data science team and, and you know, build a pre-built model yourself. You can use off-the-shelf solutions. And that's really the key takeaway with uh, using a Lambda and using it with an AI API. So let's walk through what those benefits are. So step one 
uh, is that you can set up a trigger. Uh, and that's really um, this event-based uh, architecture that we've talked about. Step two, uh, once you've triggered it, uh, you can use off-the-shelf technology. So we call that uh, democratization. Uh, and then step three uh, is that you can actually send that result anywhere else inside of AWS Pipeline. So once you're done doing your, your let's say your uh, comprehend where you, you fill out the uh, natural language processing, you could go and put that output to uh, S3. Or you could separately you know, take that output and uh, br bring it to something like Kinesis. Uh, there's, there's lots of different solutions that uh, tie into this kind of a pipeline, but the, really the, the, the main thing to uh, be aware of is that uh, you have this trigger, that's step, that's step one. You have the ability to uh, democratize AI by using these off-the-shelf uh, solutions, and then three, you can send it to any output. So really, as a, a builder, you have lots of different uh, solutions that you can capitalize on, uh, and a lot of it, again, is by simplifying what you're doing, not trying to do too much, you can build very sophisticated solutions. Now, let's talk about integrating serverless functions with Amazon SageMaker. Amazon SageMaker is a platform for uh, training and creating machine learning models, as well as hosting them, all in the context of a Jupyter Notebook interface. Uh, it runs the models uh, for you in the background, uh, so you can run things in parallel. It's very efficient, and it's a, a great way to work on machine learning problems. So if we go into Amazon SageMaker, the, the first thing we would do is uh, create a notebook. So I have a notebook here called Demo. Uh, when you open up the notebook, you'll see an interface like this. Now, uh, Amazon provides uh, quite a few examples so that you can learn how to use SageMaker and how to do different uh, machine learning functions with it. For the purpose of this um, video, we will be using this breast cancer prediction example that they give you. So that, uh, you can just press the Use button to use it. And this is what uh, a SageMaker notebook looks like. So it's a combination of text and code, just like any Jupyter notebook, or if you're familiar with Google's Colab, it's, um, the interface is very similar, though there's a lot more going on in the background here. Uh, so this notebook uh, would walk you through all the steps of importing data, um, creating a model and training it, and then hosting that model in SageMaker so that you can call it. Um, so once you've run this notebook, what you'll see in SageMaker is that you now have an endpoint for that uh, model. Now, if you were going to use this um, as a service, you wouldn't want to expose this particular endpoint. What you'd want in front of it is a uh, API gateway and probably a Lambda. So in order to make a Lambda that can call SageMaker, the first thing you have to do is go to your um, roles and make sure you have a role that has the ability to, um, the permission to call SageMaker. So I have one uh, and you can see it has the SageMaker full access policies. Um, you can limit to, to just evoking SageMaker if you want, but this will work. Once you have that role, then you want to create a Lambda which will actually call SageMaker. Um, but here we have a Lambda, and if you'll notice that the role, we're using the role we were just looking at that has permission to call SageMaker, uh, the code for the Lambda, we're going to use Bodo3 to get a hold of the SageMaker runtime, and this will allow us to invoke a SageMaker endpoint. Um, this name here is the same name we saw for the endpoint here, so it's just copied from the SageMaker endpoints. Uh, we get the name. Uh, then the uh, Lambda just takes the event and pulls data out of that and then passes it to the SageMaker endpoint as a payload, takes the result. Um, in this case, if the result is 1, it returns M, and if it's not 1, it returns B. And that's the predicted label. So once we have this Lambda, to, to really expose it, we need to put an API gateway in front of it. So let's look at doing that. So we'll create a new API. Um, let's call it We'll create 
create a resource. When that resource is created, uh, we want to add a method to it. We're going to add post in this case because we want to post some data and then get the predicted result based on that data. Uh, and then we're going to have this post method use the lambda function that we just looked at, which is, uh, that's okay. Now let's go ahead and deploy this API. Uh, we'll give it a new stage. Uh, we'll just call this one test. So here we see the URL we can use for invoking this. Let's copy that. Uh, and we're going to use um, a program called Postman to post. This is very similar to using curl, but it's an easier interface to use. So we've got our endpoint. And uh, in the body of our post, uh, we're giving it some data. And this is data that we uh, just grabbed from some of the example data that they provided uh, along with the endpoint or the, um, the notebook. So we send the data. And we see we get the result B, which is the appropriate result for this data. So you can see it's, it's relatively easy to set up uh, an API gateway in Lambda in front of your SageMaker model um, and thereby create a uh, endpoint that's client friendly and that you can use to distribute the knowledge you have in your model. Another really powerful f uh, feature of AWS is the Kinesis pipeline. And what this does is allows you to process streaming data and route it to many different locations and also to do on-the-fly transformations of that data by injecting a Lambda function inside. It's just a really flexible component to any data, data engineering pipeline in AWS. Uh, and again, because it's serverless, you don't have to manage that infrastructure. So to get started here, uh, you go to Kinesis, uh, and uh, you'll click this Get Starting uh, tab, and then you have several different options. You have uh, Kinesis Streams here, you have Kinesis Firehose Delivery, uh, and then you also have uh, Analytics Applications, and also Video Streams. In our example, we're going to use Kinesis Firehose, uh, and we're going to go ahead and create a delivery stream. Next, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to name this delivery stream something, so we'll just call this um, our stream. And then uh, you can see here that it allows you to specify how you want to have the records uh, formatted. In our case here, you can see that this uh, source data here uh, is actually going to be sent from a put operation. So what that means is that from maybe a Lambda function or some other web service in our ecosystem, we're going to be making operations to this stream and, and constantly filling it with data. Now another option is that you can have a Kinesis stream that talks to another Kinesis stream. So you can think of it as like you know, your teen, your hose, and your garden, right? You can have uh, the hose go to the left and go to the right, and you can water both parts of your garden, but you don't have to you know, get a brand new hose. It's, you're just teeing it off. Uh, same, same goes along with uh, streams. You can add mini streams and connect them all over the place. In this case, we're gonna make it really simple though and just have a direct put. Uh, and you can see how do you how do you put those puts inside of here. There's several different options. You can um, you know use the API. You also can send in data via IoT systems or uh, CloudWatch logs or CloudWatch events. We're going to go ahead and say next. Once I do that, uh, one of the things that's really powerful here is that uh, I can either leave the stream alone, or what I can do is I can enable a record transformation. And what that means is that a Lambda can sit right inside of that stream, and every single packet that comes in, it can do some kind of a transformation operation on it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and select that. Uh, and once I go here, I can either select an existing Lambda that I created, or I can go in and create a brand new one from scratch. We're going to go ahead and do uh, create a new one. And I can actually use a Lambda uh, blueprint here if I wanted to. So I can go general firehose processing, 
and you can see it says an Amazon Kinesis Firearm Stream Processor that accesses the records that are put into it and returns them with a processing status, right? So this is really more like a, a no-op here. It just looks at the record and then sends it right back again, and later you could customize it. So we'll go ahead and select that, and it pops us back into Lambda now, and we can call this um, Hello Stream Process. And we can, um, you know, use an existing role here, and we can uh, choose that admin role that we've been using throughout our lessons. Uh, and then you can see that in this case, it's giving us some Node code. Uh, node is, you know, fairly readable if you're used to Python. But basically, it's it's the event gets processed in here, uh, and then a, we just add a, a transformation that says, "Yeah, I got the data," and then we return it back out and log it. Uh, so now I can go through here and create a function. And once that's set up, uh, it's all ready to go. Uh, now, I, now all I have to do is um, get my, my Kinesis Firehose working. So we'll go ahead and close that. And again, I can now uh, feed it that uh, Lambda that I set up. Hello stream process, perfect. Uh, and also if I wanted to, I could uh, change the timeout here. And so this is one thing they're mentioning is it's probably a good idea to go down to this Lambda function uh, and change the timeout to uh, at least one minute. So we can change this to uh, one here, and we'll, we'll, it'll be one minute and three seconds. There we go. Now if I go back to our Lambda, uh, I also, if I wanted to, I could convert record formats. Uh, we're gonna leave that disabled, go next. And now I have to choose where do I wanna put the destination uh, data, right? So we're, this is gonna be a stream that's collecting data, and then there's also gonna be a Lambda that's processing the data, but then where do I wanna put it? So I could put it into S3, I could put it into Redshift, I could put it into a search engine. Let's say these are key terms that I wanna re-index, or I could put it into Splunk, it's a third-party uh, business intelligence tool that could allow me to you know, search through log files. We're gonna say S3 because that's the data lake, uh, and now I'm gonna go ahead and choose a bucket. I'll choose this uh, web scraping bucket here, uh, and once that's all set up, I can say next, and then I also can change how I um, configure the buffer settings. We can leave it at the defaults here. Uh, you can also decide uh, whether you wanna compress the data as well, so uh, uh, by default, I'll leave that off, and you also can encrypt the data in the stream. Once that's set up here, um, we'll go ahead and uh, choose a new uh, IAM role, or uh, create an existing, or, or pick an existing one, uh, we're gonna go ahead and select one that's already been created. Okay, so we'll go Firehose Delivery Rule, Policy Name, Delivery Rule, and once that's allowed, now I'm able to go to the next dialog box. It gives us a preview of everything we did, and now we can create this delivery stream. So now it's ready to go. We can, we can uh, start throwing data into this uh, Firehose delivery stream, that Lambda will get triggered every time something new comes in, and then the output will go to Amazon S3. So we have a complete serverless data engineering pipeline. The next thing to do uh, is that we can also, uh, if we want to, test this with demo data. And that's typically a great way to initially test a Lambda function. So if I go through here and I say test with demo data, uh, you can see that it'll start sending this uh, stream of data uh, to Kinesis. Now, what's fascinating about this is that uh, I'll, I'll be able to actually go back to my Lambda function because, again, it gets called repeatedly every time I'm processing the data, and I can see in action this thing actually getting called. So let's go back to that Lambda function here, uh, and let's go to monitoring. If we go to monitoring, uh, we should be able to see this thing actually being uh, processed now. There we go, we change this to one hour, refresh, and now if I go to view logs and CloudWatch, there'll be some log entries that show up that will show us that it's actually being triggered uh, from, from our Kinesis system. So this will take just a second to load up. All right, now that we've got this thing working, we can go back into the, these um, configuration menus here and look at the monitoring tab, and the monitoring tab will show us what the stream metrics are. You can see here that a bunch of data was um, sent into this, uh, and I can actually see here 
all the different processing metrics about that stream. And that's really the, the best way to get started with debugging that stream. And again, uh, now that the Lambda's in there, I also can look at the Lambda logs and I can look at that as a transformation step. So really Kinesis Firehose is, the best analogy is it's, it's literally like a hose. You plug it up to the faucet, you turn it on, data starts streaming through, and then you can route it to other parts of your, your system. So again, think of the garden hose, you, you, you um, tee it off, and you have one side that goes and gets the vegetables, you have another one that maybe goes to a sprinkler on your lawn. Same thing, you can, you can send the data any location, including another Kinesis Firehose. Now, let's talk about using lambdas with computer vision streams. Uh, Amazon Recognition is a deep learning-based visual analysis service that you can use for all sorts of data science vision problems. Uh, let's think about how we use uh, that service with lambdas uh, in a pipeline. So this is the type of pipeline we might want to set up where we have an S3 bucket. Uh, when an image is placed in that bucket, we have a lambda watching the bucket. The lambda then takes that image and gives it to recognition. Uh, recognition then analyzes the image, uh, and a, another lambda can be watching recognition and take the results and put them in a database. Let's look at just the first half of this and, and what that would look like. Uh, first, uh, I just want to note that uh, Amazon offers a bunch of code samples uh, that you can use for various services. So they have one for recognition and one for, here we have uh, detecting faces. And so we're actually going to be using this code sample in our lambda. Let's look at how our lambda is set up. So here we have a Lambda setup. It's called Face Detector. Um, it's set up with a trigger to an S3 bucket, uh, which we have here. There's nothing in the bucket at the moment. Um, so that'll trigger our Lambda. If we look at the Lambda code, this code in here is taken uh, largely from the sample in uh, AWS. So it runs. Um, detect faces uh, using recognition. Uh, up here what it's actually doing is using the event from the bucket, which is a create object event, and it's getting the name of the photo file uh, and some information about the, um, and here's the bucket name, but it's getting the name of the photo file from the event itself. So any uh, photo file we put in there, it'll automatically pick up and then pass along uh, to recognition. Let's see if we can run it. So let's upload an image. Here's an image with a face. So our image is uploading. Uh, we can actually go and look at the logs for our lambda. If we look at these logs, we can see that the um, lambda has uh, returned the results from recognition, it, it did in fact detect the face. So you can see how easy it is to connect serverless functions with uh, AWS uh, recognition. Uh, it's uh, equally easy to connect it to other um, data science as a service uh, options from AWS. Let's talk about not only AWS Lambda, which we've extensively used throughout these lessons, but GCP. Uh, a lot of times when you're using serverless operations in the cloud, you'll start to use other clouds as well. Maybe they have a new AI service that's a better AI service, or a natural language processing system, or a computer vision system, or an auto ML system. So a lot of times it's, it's important to know how to do the same things on different platforms. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first, let's just talk about the GCP cloud functions and AWS Lambda uh, functions. And what's really th the difference? Well, to start off with, they're actually very, very similar. So in the case of GCP, uh, to uh, enable a cloud function, you would go through and test it in a console that looks very similar to what we've done throughout these lessons. Uh, and we're, again, we're going to do this in a second. You put some Python code in, you test it, you can, you can um, then execute that Python function against some other part of the event pipeline in GCP. The same goes with AWS. Again, you put some Python code inside a console, you test it out, you trigger an event on the left. So if you're comfortable with AWS uh, Lambda, you should be comfortable with GCP cloud functions. 
Likewise, if you're comfortable with GCP Cloud Functions, you also should be comfortable with Lambda. Now, one thing I do want to point out, though, is that uh, one uh, big similarity as well are these uh, cloud-based uh, IDEs. Uh, so, in in the case of AWS, we had the uh, Cloud9 environment, right, which is uh, super powerful. Uh, in inside of GCP, they have something called Cloud Shell. Uh, so, in both cases, these uh, cloud-based environments really enable you to build more sophisticated. Uh, f uh, cloud function-based pipelines because they're hooked into the existing e ecosystem. The SDK keys are already set up for you, and it's really uh, the the best way to get started with building these cloud functions. So, really, in a nutshell, a cloud function and an AWS Lambda function have many, many things in common. And whatever you see one platform do, a lot of times the other one will uh, be close behind. And even uh, uh, Azure as well has uh, a cloud function. So uh, once you start to get used to these serverless functions, you'll see them everywhere and you'll also see ways you can use them on other clouds. Let's go in and look at a different cloud platform. We've spent all of our lessons looking at AWS, but it'll be very instructive to look at a different cloud platform and see if there's some similar patterns and if you can do the same things. Uh, so. We're going to log into the Google Cloud platform, which is at console.cloud.google.com. And much like AWS, you can also search for things inside of their console. So I'm going to type in functions. And once I type in functions, you'll see that Cloud Functions actually becomes available. Once I go to Cloud Functions, um, it'll allow us to use an IDE just like some of the other um, systems that were available on AWS. So I'll say create function. And now I have an option as well of selecting the runtime. So uh, I'm going to say right here, uh, this will be a demo pub. And uh, for triggers, again, just like AWS here, we can select either HTTP, cloud pub sub, cloud storage. So this would be an event where you're putting something in Google Cloud Storage, uh, Firestore, uh, which is a um, serverless database. Uh, analytics, uh, Firebase Authentication, Firebase Real-Time Database, or Firebase Remote Config. So there's a ton of different triggers here. What, what we're going to do is we're going to do PubSub, which is a lot like um, uh, some of the PubSub options on AWS. Uh, and for the topic, we're going to have one called, uh, we're going to just create our own new topic here, and we'll call this uh, topic uh, Demo, Demo Pub. There we go. And then for source code editing, uh, I can either do uh, an inline editor, just like, again, AWS. I can zip, o zip upload. I can zip from cloud storage. Or I can even point it to uh, a Git repository that Google hosts. In our case, we're going to select inline editor. And uh, again, just like AWS, I can go to runtime here, and I can select a different runtime. We've got Go. We've got Node and we've got Python. I'm going to select Python, and, and now you can see here that I've got this default uh, PubSub event. There you go. Uh, and again, uh, it's going to print out that PubSub message, and you can see that the event, j again, just like AWS, is where the action happens. It comes in, we do a base64 decode, uh, and then from there I just print out that message. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, here we go. Let's go ahead and create that. And once that's set up, in order for me to test it, uh, again, it's a very similar process. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and select this cloud function. And then I'm going to go to testing. Well, actually, it's going to take a second for de us to deploy, so we'll wait for that. So now that that function is actually deployed, I can also just send in a payload here as well. Just again, just like we did on AWS. So I'll, I'll say, um, you know, uh, demo. And we'll say test, and this will be our uh, our closing bracket here. There we go. Now we test this function, and it says details data. So it wants it wants something uh, that that we haven't passed into it. Function crashed. UTF-8. It needs some new information. Uh, so, all right. Now to test it, 
we can go to this testing interface and we can do the same thing we did with AWS, just trigger an event. I'll just leave this empty payload here and you can see that now I'm able to execute that function. Uh, I also can go and look at the logs and I, I'm able to look through and, and see different executions, again, just like uh, AWS. So what's the next thing to do is let's see if we can trigger this automatically at some interval. Now, in order to do that, what we're going to need to do uh, is make sure that we uh, schedule some kind of event to send a message through that PubSub system. So uh, first, we need to go to that PubSub system and, and make sure that we know how that operation is able to trigger a Lambda function. So here, I've set up one called Producer. Uh, and you can see here, this is where I would publish messages. And I can publish a message like this, and we'll just call this test. Uh, and when I publish that message, it should then in turn execute that Lambda function. So how would we know that? Well, I could go back again to my Lambda function here, or, or my uh, Cloud function here, and look at the logs. So if I say, hello, PubSub, we can look at the uh, last invocation, and we can see that invocation uh, occurred uh, just recently. So uh, this is actually now triggering this Lambda function. Again, just a, a, an event-based process. Uh, so the only thing left to get this data pipeline running periodically is to set up some kind of a scheduler. On AWS, we had CloudWatch events, but what we can do is we can run something called scheduler. Uh, and what Scheduler does on, on Google is it is very similar to CloudWatch event. So here we go, Cloud Scheduler. Uh, what we can do is we can set up a job that will uh, call our function uh, over and over again. So what we're going to do is look at this paused one minute function here. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. Uh, and so what this does is it says that it's going to run a, a scheduled job and it's going to be running it for one minute. And I can see all the different um, output for when this is actually run. So if I want to go back now to this, I can, I can select this and I can say resume. And what this is going to do is it's going to uh, periodically run uh, every minute and send a message to this topic producer. And again, once I send a message to that topic producer, it will in turn call that Lambda. Now let's go ahead and walk through how you would do that from scratch. Uh, one, create a job. We'll call this my job demo. This uh, sends messages through PubSub. And then again, I can go every minute if I wanted to, or more realistically in production, you know, once a week. We'll, we'll go through here and do every minute. Let's see here, it would be, every minute would be this. And then uh, for target, uh, this is where we would actually kick off the Lambda. So you could either schedule even a AWS Lambda on uh, the AWS platform, or you could use the Google Cloud function, uh, however you wanna make that trigger work. And in our case, we're going to do pub sub, which would send a message which would then trigger the Google Cloud function. So if we go down here, uh, I can see pub, pub sub. I can look at the topic. We could again say um, producer as the topic. And then I could put in some kind of a payload. And that payload could be whatever I want that uh, Google Cloud function to, to grab. So we, we could just say test here as the payload. And once I create this, now this is also going to run. So I have two jobs now that are, that are periodically sending uh, messages one by one, and you can see this one right here. It has actually um, successfully run, and I also can run it over and over again myself to test it. And how do we know this is working? Well, I can, I can again go back to my uh, functions here, and I can look and, and see if they're actually being executed. So here's my cloud pub sub function. We know that it'll execute once it gets uh, messages, and we can see the last time it was at a few minutes ago, and now it's actually being called over and over again, right? So uh, really uh, very similar pipeline using the Google Cloud functions uh, with PubSub and also with the scheduler. And it's, it's the sim similar uh, type of a workflow. Let's, so let's go in and to Sketch.io here and just draw that out. So step one uh, is we go through and we create this, um, we'll call this CF or a Cloud function. Uh, step two 
is we have to set up some kind of way to trigger this. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll set up a trigger that will be a um, pub sub message, right? So it's just a very simple message that will, that will come up and it'll become an event. So that goes through and calls that cloud function. Okay, well, we've got the trigger, but then how does that trigger actually run periodically, right? Because we want to have a data pipeline that's a repeatable data pipeline. Well, that's where cloud scheduler comes in. We'll call that CS. And then CS, we can specify every minute, every day, once a month. Uh, and then that actually sends as well um, a message with a payload um, to our pub sub system, right? So it's really a chain uh, reaction here where I have the timer, I have the actual trigger, and then I have the business logic. And uh, this serverless pipeline, this is a, a very similar pattern for any cloud that you use. So we've mostly used AWS technologies in the console with official tools, but another thing to look at is these uh, third-party uh, frameworks for serverless. So here's one called Chalice. If you go to github.com, AWS Chalice, it's a, also a fascinating way to play around with uh, serverless functions in Python. And you can see here what it looks like. It's really straightforward. I could say from Chalice, import Chalice, make an app, and then I add a decorator on top. And a decorator is basically a Python function that wraps another function. And we have uh, here a path that says hello world, and that's it. Uh, and you could go and you could set up scheduled jobs as well. So you could say app.schedule and you could schedule a job. Um, you also could connect it to an S3 event. So you, again, look how trivial that is. Uh, you can also attach it to an SQS queue like we did earlier if you use their framework. And, it, and what's fascinating about this is again, this is several lines of code is I can run Chalice Deploy and it completely handles the deployment for us. So really powerful framework and we're gonna uh, use that in action. So I'm gonna go back to my Cloud9 environment here and I'm gonna set up a Chalice app. So I'm gonna say LS and I'm gonna source this virtual environment. So we'll do VENV uh, bin activate. Uh, and now I'm gonna say pip install Chalice. And then that'll install it right here in my local uh, Cloud9 environment, and then once that's set up, I can just run chalice new project, uh, and then uh, it'll create a hello world directory here for us. There we go, and now you can see that hello world directory is here, and I can look at it, a very simple app that it'll set up. You can see it's trivial, right, to, to do a chalice application here, right? It'll also show you some more sophisticated ones. Um, in, in my case, I'm actually going to uh, copy this one, which I think this is a good this is a good demo here is uh, we'll um, get rid of these comments and this will allow us to accept parameters into our URL. So we've got a a function here now that will uh, let us pass in a name uh, and then that'll return back the name. Or we can also go to the Hello World uh, route itself. Now, what's also fascinating here is if I go to um, uh, the IDE will also show me when I'm writing errors. So it's a, a great environment to be testing out Chalice apps. Okay, so that looks like that's working. Now I can run this locally to make sure that this is actually um, running. So I'm gonna say Chalice local. Actually, let me CD into that directory first. And we'll run Chalice local. And that will set up a local web server uh, and if I, if I actually click on that, open in preview, uh, it, it'll actually go through here and, and let us look at what that would look like. In my case though, I'm gonna curl it from another bash prompt. So I'm gonna just curl that because I know that that will give me uh, back uh, hello world. So if I say curl, there we go. I've got the hello world. And then if I do that route name, and we'll call this um, Bob, we get back um, uh, that it's asking for a token. So the, the main thing though is we've got this thing working. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna now do a, a chalice deploy. So I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna say chalice deploy. There we go. Uh, and once that's set up, uh, what'll happen is now I'll, I'll be able to actually deploy that as a Lambda. So really in a nutshell, uh, what's really powerful about Chalice is that I can, um, with just a few lines of code, do some of the very similar things that I've done 
with the console, with Cloud9 environment. Uh, and the, the main thing is that I'm able to use more open source uh, you know, paradigms like adding decorators to, to um, split off operations. And if you want to see more uh, about how Chalice works, you can scroll through and, and look at these different uh, documentation steps. A really important thing to be aware of in designing these serverless applications is to be aware of this push architecture versus pull architecture. And this comes up over and over again. If you're familiar with traditional web development, uh, one of the technologies that you may have heard of is Web 2.0. And this was a, an era of web development where there's some common technologies that were used that you're probably aware of. And you know, one of them is uh, Apache, you know, this is a Web 2.0 technology, uh, JavaScript, um, you know, you have uh, Ajax, you know, these are all technologies that were built uh, in the pre-cloud era. Or another one is also CGI. Um, and what was great about all those technologies is it allowed us to, you know, build these next generation of uh, software as a service products. Uh, but what's happened currently uh, is that we're, we're in a cloud native era. And with these pull-based technologies, you have servers that run constantly. Um, you're, uh, you know, basically have threads that are that are running that are that are, you know, constantly accessing things. And so it's really a pull-based approach, right? So you you're you're constantly running things. It's a little bit like if you went to your mailbox every hour and checked to see if you had mail. Well, that will work. That's a that will work as a strategy to check your mail. But it would be a lot better to get a notification on your phone that says you have mail in your mailbox and then you go out there and pick up the mail. And that's really the difference with a push architecture. The cloud, especially this cloud native uh, approach, allows you to think more about events versus waiting around or, or doing something that's really uh, inefficient over and over again. And uh, some of the things that happen in a cloud native approach uh, are you have this concept again of uh, events, right? And so we, we use that uh, to our advantage when we are doing um, this uh, CloudWatch event uh, we also use it uh, as a trigger uh, as well, so we know that events can do a trigger. So it can be a S3 uh, operation. Uh, it can be uh, a database insert. Um, uh, it could be any kind of an operation uh, that emits an event. You can capture that event and then process it based on that. And the advantage of this uh, cloud-native or push-based approach uh, is that you don't have to pay for anything when it's not running. And in the, in the case of the pull architecture, you're paying for the money it takes uh, to run Apache, to run you know, th these uh, server processes. And even in the case where you have a fully elastic uh, architecture, so let's say you have a load balancer right here, and then you have web servers, and those web servers, uh, let's say, scale up, and then they scale down, depending on how much traffic, still you're going to have to have at least a minimum amount of servers running because they're they're pulling, right? They're constantly running. In the case of the push architecture, there's nothing running. They're, they're lying dormant, essentially. You know, they're just waiting below the surface uh, until you do something, and then they populate, and these services um, do their work. And really, uh, it's a lot like if you have a light switch in your house that is always on, you're going to be burning all the electricity for that light switch. Or you could set up a timer uh, or a sensor where you walk into a building, and, and it senses that there's motion, and then the lights turn on. Uh, and then they'll time out again after, let's say, half an hour. So it's this on-demand, um, you know, ready-to-process events uh, architecture that really describes this push architecture. And, and, and this is a really important concept to understand when you're building this next generation of technology is to, to, to be aware of this cloud, uh, you know, pre-cloud era of, you know, web frameworks, uh, you know, you know, database servers, relational databases. These are all uh, technologies that that really weren't built with this um, energy efficiency in mind. And another um, point about this as well is that forget even whether this is the best technology uh, architecture or not. There's a real uh, case to be made in terms of energy efficiency with these uh, event-driven architectures. So, um, one of the problems with technology, uh, and in particular with deep learning, is that they're very expensive uh, and uh, it, there's a very high carbon output uh, as a result of running these very expensive operations. 
Uh, but if you're designing things in an energy efficient way, you can actually uh, consume, let's say, a thousand less uh, resources, a thousand times less resources because it's all responding to events. So there's even another reason why you should consider these push-based approaches is that uh, it's a better uh, approach for conserving energy, it's a better approach for the environment, uh, and ultimately it's a more sophisticated architecture. One of the things that's taking the whole industry by storm is this concept of DevOps. Uh, and it's a pretty exciting uh, topic. And one of the things that's interesting about DevOps is it's very similar in a way to data science where uh, on, on one hand, uh, there are jobs called DevOps or, or in the case of data scientists, there's a data scientist. But a lot of times, is it that there's a job or is it that you have a skill that you can apply uh, to a pre-existing job title? And I think a lot of times with DevOps in particular, uh, it's more that you've learned some uh, type of behavior, uh, almost like you're a, a high jumper or a long jumper, you know, but those skills could apply to, let's say, uh, an NFL quarterback or an NBA basketball player, right? These are capabilities uh, more than an individual, um, you know, skill, you know, you know, individual job title. Uh, so in the case of uh, principles of DevOps here, the first one is continuous integration. This is really important uh, to talk about continuous integration and describe what it is. Uh, in a nutshell, what you're doing is every single time you make a change to source code, uh, that source code goes through some kind of uh, testing process automatically. So it could be linting, uh, unit tests, um, uh, and that whole process is able to run in any environment that you actually execute that uh, source code in. So if you have a master branch, there's testing there. If you have a staging branch, there's testing there. And that's really the, the principle of continuous integration. And this is really the first quality control check that's necessary when you have a DevOps uh, environment. Uh, second is uh, this concept of continuous delivery. And a lot of times, you know, companies will get started and they'll have testing, and they'll have QA, uh, and all that's great, but can you, at any point in time, take your software and deploy it to n number of environments? For example, uh, does it automatically, is it automatically able to go to a staging environment where you can have QA look at it? Uh, could you automatically go to production within 10 seconds, or do you have to have a very lengthy process that's manual that you go through? And this is really the concept of continuous delivery, is your software is always ready to be delivered into any environment. And this really is a cloud-native uh, construct where if you use serverless technology, it's very simple to do these continuous delivery pipelines. And really, it is a fundamental principle of DevOps. Another one is microservices. So uh, we talked earlier about this concept of Web 2.0 and CGI and you know all these web frameworks that were popular for a while. Uh, what's different though about microservices is they're they're not this um, pre-cloud technology. They're uh, little uh, applications that do one specific task, and as a result, it's really easy to reason about what it is they do and to debug what they do. And that's really the, the principle of microservices is you have some small component, uh, at, there's a very clearly defined interface to um, send data into it, it does a particular action and it returns back the result. And really, lambdas here are a perfect example of, of a microservice uh, because they fit those capabilities. Uh, a next uh, component here that's really important is infrastructure as code. Uh, so infrastructure as code, what that means is that you can describe the layout of your, of your serverless application uh, in a uh, code-based format. So let's say you have a YAML file or you have a uh, file that is a Terraform file, and then that file gets checked in with your project, and then uh, when you deploy your project, your project is able to execute in any different environment. And so this really ties back again to the continuous delivery and continuous integration is that they, they have not only the source code, not only do they have the testing, but they also have the configuration that will allow that application to, to be deployed somewhere. And it's checked right into your repo. So this is a really important concept of uh, DevOps as well. Another big one is monitoring and logging. With Lambdas, fortunately, they have a very sophisticated logging uh, and monitoring built into them. Uh, we saw that CloudWatch logs will allow you to look at the step-by-step -step interactions that your Lambda does. You can also look at in each individual Lambda and see that each one of those has its own individual log. 
You also can set up CloudWatch alerts that look for latency. You know, if, if you're getting latency timeouts, uh, you can get triggered to do some kind of operation. So really this is another best practice that uh, isn't an optional best practice for DevOps. And then finally, this is an easy one to forget about, but with DevOps, there's also a human component to it. So not only do you have to have these technical solutions, but how do you actually work with other people in your company to make sure there's communication and collaboration? Uh, and you know, I'll share a, a small story with you. When I was working at a startup, uh, there was a situation where the CTO of the startup uh, was always uh, checking code in and they, they were bypassing the continuous integration and bypassing the continuous delivery pipeline because they were the most experienced person in the company. The end result was we had some severe outages over and over again because we were respecting more the hierarchy of the position versus the teamwork that all of us could apply with these processes that we set up. So that's another thing is that hierarchy or you know how important you are is less important than the process and these are all process based approaches so that's a, another principle of devops is that it's about the team not about the individual so if you apply these principles of devops in your project you'll have the highest uh, confidence that you can build a successful serverless application The cloud is a fascinating environment because it's more than just one thing. It's a mini uh, collection of services. Uh, it's got different benefits. We're going to walk through some of those things. So let's start at the benefits of uh, cloud computing. Uh, one of the primary benefits of cloud computing is cost. Because uh, you're using this economies of scale, you don't have to pay as much for services because you're only using the services when you need them. So it's a lot like the utility company. Imagine if you had to you know, separately uh, figure out a whole infrastructure for delivering electricity to your house. You know, it would quickly get too expensive to uh, implement that. Uh, but by using the pipeline that's already been uh, created, you have the benefit of you know, using that service on demand. Also global scale. Uh, uh, all the cloud providers immediately have access to uh, networks uh, in so South America, North America, Europe, Asia, and by using the cloud, you immediately get access to global scale uh, security as well. So, uh, you know, creating an a, a ecosystem that manages uh, exactly what you're going to do in a physical data center could be uh, really complicated, right? You have to do background checks on employees, look for, um, you know, uh, you know, people that are breaking into your facility, uh, you know, data, data uh, integrity checks. There's all kinds of problems that happen in security that you don't have to worry about that are handled by the cloud provider. Additionally, uh, some of the transport layers are also handled in a very secure manner as well. Uh, performance is another one, so uh, you can use the most expensive or latest machines, but you only use them as needed, and so you can get a, a very high performance. The networking is set up so that machines are optimized on the same network, so there's all these advantages in CPU, memory, network I.O., disk I.O. that you can take advantage of. Uh, also speed, uh, because you're using a um, you know, state-of-the-art uh, you know, public cloud, you can access all the latest features of that public cloud, which in turn will uh, give you a better speed profile. Reliability as well, so you can architect things that um, are scalable, elastic. Um, these are all core principles of the cloud. And then finally, productivity, I think, is one of the ones that isn't mentioned as much, but it's really important. Uh, with things like serverless, for example, just one person can create in, let's say, a day what previously it would take, let's say, three months to, to build uh, without a, a cloud-based infrastructure. So the productivity level is really um, you know, increased to the point that a laptop user can do what maybe uh, an entire company did, uh, you know, a, a, let's say 10 years ago. Now in terms of types, uh, there are three main types of uh, cloud computing environments. Uh, one of them is on-prem or a private, private cloud, and that's probably the, the, the first type of um, you know, service that you're thinking about when you think about you know, uh, you know, a, uh, tr a traditional data center is you, you have physical machines, uh, you know, your company's managing that uh, you know, location, uh, and that actual private cloud could be uh, a really large cloud in the case of, uh, let's say, Facebook or Twitter where they're managing their own ecosystem. Um, but still, it's, it's a type of cloud, but it's a, it's a private cloud. Now, uh, a hybrid cloud would be a combination of 
you use a public cloud like AWS and you also use your own private cloud and maybe you pick some of those services that uh, you can't easily implement but you also use your own data center and so you have a, maybe uh, the best of whatever offering you can get. And then the most traditional uh, cloud offering is the public cloud and the three main uh, providers there, AWS, uh, Azure, and um, also GCP, uh, these are really the leaders in, in that public space uh, and they're, they're the ones that when you hear about uh, cloud computing often first come up. Now let's talk about services. There's uh, a few different ways to think about cloud services. Let's break down each piece. So one of them is infrastructure as a service. Uh, infrastructure as a service uh, really covers things like uh, storage, networking, compute, these low level things that if you were going to manage your own uh, private cloud, for example, you would have to figure out a way to, to um, come up with, with uh, your own provisioning around that. But with the cloud, you can, you can say, well, I want to have more storage and then you can assign that storage to a, a machine or I want to have more compute and, you, and these are all of the low level offerings that you're traditionally going to use. And, and I would say AWS is, is probably one of the best examples of you know, initial uh, infrastructure as a service. And it was in the early 2000s is when they first came out with Amazon Web Services and all the offerings were infrastructure as a service. They were compute, they were SQS, uh, and they were also S3. And those are all infrastructure related services. Now, PaaS uh, is a newer one. And a good example of that is something called uh, GAE or Google App Engine. And Google App Engine, what it does is it allows you to build a web application and not uh, worry about uh, the servers that are located uh, beneath it. So it has a, it's some similarities to serverless, but the main difference is you can use a traditional workflow, but uh, all of the deployment and the management of the application is offloaded to uh, your cloud vendor. And in the case of PaaS, another good example would be Heroku. Uh, so if we draw Heroku here, they're famous for offering, you know, really this uh, next layer of abstraction where you can focus on building your application and not focus on the infrastructure as a service, which is, is really something that requires much more skill. Uh, another one that's uh, a newer offering is something called uh, Metal as a Service. Uh, I know that uh, Canonical, the company that makes Ubuntu, uh, has an example of this, but what Metal as a Service does is allows you to treat physical hardware in the same way that you would treat the cloud-based uh, solutions. and so. The advantage there is that you could get uh, really raw uh, in performance with Metal as a service that could exceed uh, your cloud performance. Now, there's some downsides to that in that you're still going to have to worry about the cost aspects and you know running the equipment and provisioning the equipment. So there's a significant downside to it, but one of the upsides to it is that you could get greater raw performance. Uh, another one to be aware of is SaaS. So you know with SaaS, uh, this is something where you know. Pretty much everyone at this point has had experience with SaaS. It stands for software as a service. It could be Gmail, it could be Trello, Jira. You know, it could be a billing system. You know, there's so many companies now that are building these software applications that are in the cloud, and then your company can take advantage of those services and not have to build that uh, software uh, yourself. And so, this does become a, one of the cloud computing offerings that traditionally you'll bring into your app. Now, the one that's that's really related to us, though, that I've got highlighted here is this serverless. Um, and so this is also a type of offering that, again, has some sim similarities to a platform as a service, but it's unique enough in that what, what really serverless is is it's a function. You take that yet function, you deploy it to a cloud environment, and you have this event-based uh, pipeline that uses that technology. And this is really, I would say, the, the, the latest generation of uh, a cloud service is serverless. Those other ones are, are all predecessors of serverless. And you know, in the next like, several years, serverless is going to be at the forefront of some of the newest things that are happening in cloud computing. This whole series is about serverless computing. And now let's summarize what is it? What is serverless computing? And what are the trends that are supporting serverless computing? So let's start with some use cases. A uh, recent poll in 2018 talked about uh, different uh, use cases that people are using serverless for. And it turns out that 32% or about a third of the serverless applications are uh, web APIs. 
So people are building uh, you know, web applications that have front ends that are serverless or they're, they're building APIs that are the, the ecosystem uh, around you know, their SDK. Uh, so really the web and the API uh, use case are 32%. In terms of um, another, the next biggest category is data processing. Uh, so uh, there's a quite substantial uh, and upcoming category of data processing, uh, and that's about, again, 20% of the workload. And so this video covered uh, a lot of different data processing techniques, like uh, S3 events or you know uh, glue events where you're doing ETL transformations. So this is definitely one of the, the uh, you know uh, trending topics. Uh, right below that is third-party services. So let's say you're talking to Slack or you're talking to your ticket system or GitHub and you want to register an event and process it. Uh, that would be this category, 17%. Uh, internal tooling. So right behind that, uh, you know, that's 16% of, of people are using it to build, you know, really quick prototypes of things uh, to help, you know, some kind of workflow in their company. And then the last two categories are chatbots and IoT. Uh, so these are emerging categories as well that serverless computing is, is used for. And what's you know, fascinating about this is you can see that the majority of the use cases here are really emerging use cases where uh, they, they, they really come in and, and take advantage of things like chatbots and IoT and these, these uh, new categories of computing. Now let's break into uh, really what is uh, the category though and what's the level of abstraction that uh, cloud computing uh, with serverless is, is really all about. Uh, so uh, the first layer here is hardware servers. Uh, so you know if you look at a, a traditional uh, private data center or a public cloud, you know that's that hardware layer. And so so uh, serverless is not working at that layer. And then the next layer is uh, cloud computing. So you can see we've got VPC, billing, IAM. You know all these uh, things are used to in, in terms of a cloud uh, computing provider. Uh, these are uh, also uh, the next layer of abstraction, but they're also not serverless. Where serverless is, it's just built on top of that cloud platform. And you can see things like Lambda, BigQuery, messaging systems, Big ETL. Uh, these are all like higher level services that are built on these multiple layers of abstraction. And that's really um, you know, the, probably the highest layer of abstraction you can go before you get to the final layer which is if you went here, it would be into the application layer, right? So basically serverless is just uh, moving higher and higher up the food chain until it's almost at the point where it's, it's in itself an application, uh, but, it, but it really shows you how it's the most fundamental building block you can, you can pick in terms of the abstraction that allows you to do things like you know, web API, data processing, internal tooling. It, it's the closest possible abstraction to uh, application development. Okay, so sometimes when we create lambdas, we need to include um, libraries that are not part of the standard library, or uh, even uh, libraries that are standard, like Bodo 3, for example, sometimes the version that's running in the Lambda runtime is not the latest version, and you may need the latest version to take advantage of some new feature. Uh, so we're going to take a look at how to do that. This process is called vendoring, um, and it's very simple. So basically, uh, you just create your Lambda in your development environment. This could be Cloud9, or it could be local on your desktop. Um, and then you would create a requirements file that lists your requirements. And we're actually going to be upgrading to the latest Bodo and Bodo Core. It's actually Bodo 3. So we just simply create a requirements file, and you can lock these to particular versions if you want to. Um, a lot of people do that. OK. So what we need to do now is we need to pip install these, but we need to install them into this directory. So we're going to do that using the standard pip install and specify the requirements file with the minus R option. But now we're going to give it a target and that target is going to be the current directory. So we specify that with the dot. And this will, um, this will install all of these dependencies right here uh, into the local folder. 
and then we're going to zip that up just like a normal, um, a normal Lambda function and upload that into AWS. Okay, so now here you can see that this has created um, a whole bunch of directories right here in the root of this. And so now what we want to do is create our zip archive just like we normally would for a Lambda. But now we're going to be including um, all of these dependencies that we just installed with the pip. So we're creating a zip archive um, in the parent directory of this, and it's going to be called lambda.zip. And um, this period, uh, again, indicates that it's going to be zipping um, the current directory. OK. So now we can take a look at what we made. We've got this lambda.zip created. And then we can just upload that into Lambda. So we're going to update the function code. This is an existing Lambda, so we're, we're, we're updating it. Um, it's the API handler. We give it the name, and we give it the, we give it the zip file. Uh, this file B indicates that it's a binary file. So just upload that. And that's it. That's all there is to it. So just pip install into the current directory along with your um, Lambda code, zip it up, and upload it to AWS. Managing data with the serverless services on AWS. Um, but one other thing that you ought to realize and think about is that uh, using services like AWS Lambda, you can also use you can also consume services from other cloud providers. So we're seeing more and more people out in the world today with multi-cloud applications, um, where maybe they're using um, Amazon S3 from Google Cloud. So I just wanted to go through a quick example of one thing that you can do with that. Um, so Google. Cloud has a service called BigQuery, which is a serverless analytics database that we use a lot. And there's absolutely no reason why you can't query that from within a Lambda. Now, there's a few tricks to getting it set up um, because they are from different cloud providers. So we'll just go through and take a quick look at how you would do that. So we're going to use our Cloud9. Um, development environment, just like we talked about before. And we've got a little Lambda function defined in here. And you can see here that we're importing the Google Cloud BigQuery library. And so this is just, just a really simple example of, of using uh, BigQuery. Um, and you can see here we have um, client from service account. So if if you were calling this from within Google Cloud, uh, you would automatically be getting a credential. But because we're calling from AWS, uh, we need to set this credential. And I'll show you how to get this credential right now. Uh, so we go over to the Google Cloud console. And from here, we would select um, I am an admin. And then we're going to be creating a service account. Okay, so we already have a, I've already created this service account, but we can just run through what it takes to create one of these really quickly. And we'll call this uh, serverless data. Okay, and now we give this a role just like we do in AWS. And we're giving us access to BigQuery. So we're going to need probably data viewer. And job user, so we'll have to create jobs. Okay. And then we want to create a key. So this key is going to be the JSON file uh, that we use in our configuration. So over here in Cloud9, I've already uploaded this file. Um, I called it uh, credential.json. So when this Lambda executes, 
um, it's going to have access to that uh, credential file that we just that we just uploaded. So from there, you have your uh, big query client is is configured, and then you can just do a, a simple query. We're going to query um, we're going to query one of the um, big query public data sets. Um, so these are the most popular names from the USA, um, the state of Texas, and we're going to get the first 100. Um, it's real simple to use this library. You just define um, you just define a query job, um, and then you uh, you execute that, and then we just return that into our lambda. It's really simple. We can just deploy this here, and of course, Cloud9 lets you just execute your code here as well. You can see we got names from the database. And here it is deployed, and we can test it from within Lambda. And you can see that we went out. Uh, we fetched all this data from Google's cloud. Super easy to set up. Uh, BigQuery is a very, very powerful serverless, completely serverless database. Uh, there's nothing to configure there other than creating your tables in the service. And that is it. Welcome to Data Engineering with Python and AWS Lambda Live Lesson. My name is Noah Gift and I'll be your instructor for this course along with Robert and Kennedy. I'm a machine learning instructor at Northwestern, UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and USF, and I've held business roles including CTO, general manager, and chief architect. I'm the founder of Pragmatic AI Labs and I consult with startups on machine learning, AI, and cloud architecture. I'm also a Python Software Foundation Fellow, a subject matter expert for AWS on machine learning, and a cloud ambassador. I work closely with Google Education, and I'm a part of the Google Cloud Architect Certified Community. I also wrote Pragmatic AI, an introduction to cloud-based machine learning, and many technical articles and videos from Pearson. My name is Kennedy Behrman, and I am a consultant specializing in architecting and implementing cloud solutions for early stage startups. Uh, I have a background in engineering, data science, AWS, and G Cloud solutions, as well as acting as an O'Reilly author and instructor for Pearson. Hi, my name is Robert Jordan. I'm a systems architect specializing in infrastructure as code and solutions for entertainment and media companies for the last 20 years. Currently, I hold certifications from AWS and GCP. I'm excited you decided to join us and look forward to telling you about serverless data engineering applications on the AWS platform, including some real-world consulting problems we faced collectively on AI and virtual reality. It's an exciting time to be building applications on the cloud, and it often takes just a few lines of code to do something incredibly powerful. Welcome to the brave new world of 100-line applications. It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's go over the lesson plan. This course focuses on these objectives. In lesson one, you get started with AWS Lambda. In lesson two, you use Cloud9 to develop Python-based AWS applications. In lesson three, you learn to create timed Lambdas. In lesson four, we cover creating event-driven Lambdas. In lesson five, you learn AWS SAM. In lesson six, you learn about ETL operations with AWS Glue. In lesson seven, you'll create state machines with step functions. In lesson eight, you use those step functions with other AWS services. In lesson nine, you'll learn about serverless and relational databases. In lesson 10, you build APIs with API Gateway. In lesson 11, you authenticate APIs with AWS Cognito. Lesson 12 covers serverless data stores. Lesson 13 describes serverless business intelligence and in lesson 14, you learn about serverless data streaming, including Kinesis. In lesson 15, we cover case studies. These case studies cover cloud computing, DevOps, GCP versus AWS, and other applications of serverless technology. 
In Lesson 16, we wrap it all up with a course summary on the light board. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy learning the material as much as we enjoyed creating it.